It's Morbin time. Well, it doesn't it doesn't really. It's too late. It 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 was always too late, Fringy. Well, it's it always was always too, too late. late. To Morb. A, yeah, that's a meta what commentary is... on the Morbin meme because the it Morbin meme late. came in too... too late. Well, the funny thing is, it's probably true that if Morbius came out when it was supposed to come out two years ago, everything would have been fine. Like, like there would have been no problem. No, no, yeah, it just would have been like Venom. It just would have come and gone. It would have probably made a bunch of money, but not like a whole bunch of think, money. And then, do you think the additional uh, Jared Leto Joker scene in the Snyder Cut made it worse? I for think it? so. I absolutely think that it did. Wait, I think made it, it work? reminded. I think it reminded people. You know, <laughs> of, <laughs> like, of what? Wait, what are you saying exactly? I think that much <laughs> of the Morbius meme stems from Jared Leto and like how easy it is to meme on him in terms of his acting and his method of acting. And I think that Joker Jesus just like reminded Joker people. <laughs> reminded is, people. Is, is Jared Leto just a, um, cause I don't know anything about him other than he's a terrible Joker and Morbius is bad. <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. Alleged, I have like nobody. Seen allegedly. No please. Allegedly. Um, but has he, is he, has he done anything bad? Is he like a terrible person? I, I mean, so like I have no idea. I or is he just seen him him. unfortunate? I'd seen him in plenty of movies up to the up to the up to Morbid time, and like he was, <laughs> he's been just fine. I don't think I've ever seen him in a movie where I've gone like, man, that movie was made by Jared Leto, as in like he he carried well, it. But you know, Suicide Squad. Maybe it's uh, just oh, yeah, like the whole that. method acting thing. Right? No, like I think that is that. it. He's he's probably the only actor that's been this railed in terms of process of method acting. Well, he's on rails. I guess it's um, he's doing I rails. Guess, I guess it's a matter of if you're if you're method acting, there's almost an expectation that you have to be like really good as like a trade off. You know, I think so, that yeah. process. Maybe so he needs to method really act as a good actor. Do you well, see I mean, what he was doing, doing on Morbius, where he would have crutches and use them to go yep. to the bathroom? Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Why would he need to do the head? Apparently, held up production by doing this. <laughs> like, what the <laughs> How much? Are you doing wait, wait, I'm, wait, wait. How many times do you have to take a shit to where you <laughs> hold up production of a movie just because you used crutches to go to the bathroom? Hey, man, long filming hours. I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's, it's... oh, the bathroom's really far how away. How long's? How long are Jared Leto's <laughs> poops is what he I want to know. He said to put it really far away so that he could immerse himself in the struggle of crutches, oh, I guess. No. I, of crutch pooping. He identifies as disabled now? We'll see, but... He's pooped so many times in No, crutches. no, no, it's because, like, I think in Morbius, the whole idea... This is what I mean, nobody's watched the movie. But I'm <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't know what the plot of it is, except that he's sure got Jared Leto in like, it. He's got some crazy illness um, that's, like, super debilitating, and he, he walks on crutches, and <laughs> then... He's more becomes, he, well, he becomes he becomes Morb, and that's when he loses <laughs> <laughs> the character. Is Morb his, his character's name or the creature's name? I think I think his name is is Morbius. No, no his he, name yeah. is Michael Morbius. Morbius is <laughs> Michael <right>. Morb. <laughs> Michael Morbius. <laughs> Michael Morb Morbius. <laughs> now, what are what would you had alternatives? Surely, like Jordan Morbius or well, well you got Michael, a alliteration. Alliteration, yeah, that's a common a comic book thing. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's, a, yeah. it's a big Marvel thing. Man, I mean, Manny, Manny Morbius. That really is a Marvel thing, isn't it? Like, there's not many. Oh, I guess Clark Kent, like the first superhero. Lo <laughs> Lois Lane. Lois Lane. Peter What's Parker. Well, no. Batman. <laughs> so, Batman. Like, can well, you please tell me where the alliteration is in Batman, right? The A's. Bat but Bruce Batman. Batman. Bruce, Bruce Batman. That's right. His name and... isn't Bruce Batman, you're lying to me. <laughs> Rex, you are gaslighting him. You better stop. You know, there. I, I'm sure the jokes are out there, but if you live the double life of being both Bruce Wayne and Batman, spoilers, but there must be points where he, he's, he, what, he's got to slip one time. Who are you? Batman. I reign. <laughs> Bruce Wayne. I am Bruce Wayne. Bat brain. You know? <laughs> Bat Wayne, I'm Bat Wayne. <laughs> um, what? I'm Wayne Man, <laughs> dude. Bat okay, I feel like this. I feel like this would probably not happen because I have a hard time believing when he shows up in full costume, somebody would look at him and say, "Who are you?" When he clearly looks like Batman. So I'm sure he's probably only asked, "Who are you?" I am gonna yeah, stop. Who you right are you? Well, he's actually in the Bruce Wayne outfit now. 
ridiculous because if I was out and about doing <laughs> ne'er do well deeds, and I like the a idea man shows up in front of me in a bat costume, the first fucking thing I'm asking is, "Who are you?" You, you know, know how it's like a, a, it's it's sort of like a known thing that ah uh, Bruce Wayne is a costume. Could you imagine if he had like the Wayne Cave that was just filled with all the of his suits? He does. He <laughs> pretends every, to be everything, a all day. everything that he uses to immerse himself. So he has like a little Iron Man assembly thing for his suit just to get into <laughs> so costume. unnecessary. It's he's actually Fun. Batman. Like the the Batman suit is him biologically. Well, it's hey, like, that was, in uh, the him, multiverse, well, that may very well be the case. Possible. It's acceptable. Everybody's a vigilante in this world, and then there's some heroes who dress up as businessmen walking around helping people out. So, see, now wait, is there a DC the... multiverse yet, or is it just Marvel? Uh, I think they're about to <laughs> we have it up seen... the Flash. The Flash uh, like, is about that, yeah. Because they're bringing back Michael Keaton as Batman for that one. That'll be neat. So sad. It'll be. It'll be well, unless the film's good. But <laughs> it was important that you clarified they brought back Michael Keaton to be Batman, because in this crazy <laughs> topsy turvy world, they could bring him back. Him back to be Vulture. And, I mean, totally we know different. That's possible. Yeah. Remember in um, Ghostbusters twenty sixteen, they brought back Bill Murray to be asshole who gets killed. Like, yeah, they of, did. He like, was oh, okay. he was asshole who gets killed. He just wanted to sit down in his chair and do his two scenes and then die. We never, none of us saw the uh, the new. I haven't seen Afterlife. I no. have not seen that one. I I care so little. Wow, that one Waller? just sort of came and went, which is interesting considering it was meant to be like uh, the direct sequel to Ghostbusters Two. It's like yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard mixed things about it. it. I um, all I watched was Red Letter Media's video on it, and um, that's enough for me. It's enough for me. Oh, Rags, did you see they did a review of Rom? Did you catch that? No, I didn't. Did they? Do we do we oh, reveal no. Did to they that say poor, it was good? Poor super chat no. the, the truth. Of... Oh god. Okay. So oh, let's no. let him down gently. Alright. How do we do this? Alright. So sorry. Gentle, gentle dear viewer. Oh, sweet, sweet patron, audience member, love of my life, my sunrise, <laughs> the water that groweth my crops, sweet, sweet you, who recommended that we see um from oh. Because From is produced by the Russo brothers, mm -hmm. and it has an interesting horror premise. Yes. How very exciting. How mm -hmm. very excited we were. Yeah. Um, we watched the first and the second episode of From, and it's horseshit, unfortunately. The um, only thing they had to get right was characters acting reasonably, and they did not have that even close whatsoever. I told Fringy a whole bunch of the things that happened, but Fringy, did you feel yeah. convinced from what I told you? What, like, that I would want to watch it? Or... Yeah. Well, or did, no. did it sound like... Because it's kind of like... I was supposed to it say we're on like a clock, a great... so I shouldn't go through all of how From is bad, but... <laughs> From like... is... Well, go for it. it. It's It will be probably for a while my go-to example for characters not behaving like a person would behave given, given what they know and, and how a human story would act. Completely. Yeah, how, how do you take a really potentially interesting premise and absolutely ruin it by having every character be just insanely stupid? I'll do a quick example, just, I guess, to get, to get people to understand. Um, let's just, I'm, I'm, Rag is going to hear me say this and be like, why aren't you talking about how stupid that is? And I'm like, look, I'm getting to the big stupid, okay? So, no, it's because I know that you, you know have seven million things yeah. to pick from. You can't possibly elaborate on them all. So an RV crashes in the woods, big, big old log goes through it, traps uh, the dad, and the, there's someone in there who's been impaled, and, and, you know, they need help. So they call people in from the local town. This is like a mystical place where you get trapped in this town if you ever enter it. So they take a car, and they're about to go out, but, but they also lay down a spike strip in order to blow the wheels on that RV when it comes back in. Uh, for the reason, as stated, you don't want an RV barreling through town. I don't mean rags to this day, don't understand what the fuck... I, was, I don't understand at all what... Like, why wouldn't you don't ask them to slow that. down? They even need vehicles there. I just, you risk a lot of why things. Why would you assume the that they would open. kill themselves in an RV with the family? It's, there's so many, there's so many things reasons. that we couldn't even begin to elaborate on. But, you know, going forward, they put that spike strip down, and then they get told, like, oh, they've crashed out there. They're going to need help. And they're like, oh, shit. So um, the sheriff and the deputy were putting down that spike strip. And then the sheriff goes out there, so does the deputy, 
The deputy grabs as many people who can walk and run to go back, because they have to get to shelter before dark, because that's when all the spooky monsters come out. And uh, on their way back, they accidentally drive over the spike strip, because he forgot he put it down. The <laughs> spike strip that they shouldn't have put down in the first place is the spike strip that critically, that, that cripples, quote unquote, because this show thinks that if... In a life or death situation, this show thinks that if you run over a spike strip and you have flat tires, your car is now rendered immobile. Which is and not I've even close enough, to true. <laughs> oh, no. I've seen enough cops to know that a vehicle I've can absolutely move. I've played enough Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. <laughs> I've played enough video games to know. come out and it goes a bit floopy. You can still drive. Yeah, you can drive that bitch on, a, on rims if you need to. And it will not be pleasant, and it will not be pretty. Well, at night it's, it might be pretty because all the sparks, but uh, it'll right. go. It'll not be pleasant, pleasant, but it would be preferable to getting your rib cage torn open by vampires, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is not the yeah. There's a but, lot yeah, of I, that, and me and Rags reached our limit. At, I think episode one, but we gave it another one just in case, and it was just as bad. So yes. Like, oh, we're out. It was purely the premise. We were still just enough interested in the premise and what they would do with it that we said, you know what? We'll watch episode two. We'll watch the second episode. We watched the second episode it and it was pain. Finished you, it. No more. No more. Which, you know what? That's good enough as an intro. <laughs> there you go. Good enough intro. Uh, hello. Welcome to EFAP 188. Um, we're here today because we watched a movie that was also recommended by a lot of people, and it turned out it was actually pretty good, which is nice. It uh, was. It was very we've, good. We've gathered uh, a prior guest of many episodes, Mr. Mr. John here, who you, you apparently hated it. You said it was the worst film that ever existed, right? Oh, what a piece of shit. Oh Doctor my Strange. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> Doctor Strange is how it's done. We wanted to get a variety of perspectives. <laughs> The Marvel. gold standard of multiverse movies is Doctor Strange. So. Marvel leading the industry, I think. That's, that's what's happening. Thank goodness gold cinema's standard dying for everywhere something. else. <laughs> um, and yeah, and, uh, and our other guest today is, is good old Destiny, who some of you may know. I, I don't know. You also uh, like this film a little bit, right? It's a bit of a... It's all right? Yeah, it's an okay movie, I'd say, for sure. Mm -hmm, okay. So, that means that we've gathered like the fucking Avengers, to talk about like the fellowship, yeah. all the different things that happened in this movie, and why they're, uh, they're anything from neat to, to amazing, possibly. I wouldn't want to spoil. I was thinking about, like, we could do the usual thing, where we do, like, a, a blib about what we thought of it overall, but I, I wonder if how much point there is, because I imagine all five of us are going to have the exact same things to say. Um, I figure it's still worthwhile, maybe. Sure. Why don't we go, I was about to say with the guest first, but then I was thinking, like, what if he has no clue what I even mean by it? And so maybe we should go with... By what? Give your impressions first. on a movie? Yeah. You know, sometimes people can just... Crack the bar is real low for a guess here, huh? I don't know. <laughs> like, you would be the people we... Let me, look, it, let me look at that word real quick. Impressions. <laughs> hey, gotta get it right. You know what? Fine. Off you go then. What did you think of the movie overall as as kind of a brief, brief overview? Of, and maybe even why you saw it. <clears throat> Um, I don't even remember why I saw it. I think I just heard, I guess, the infamous A24 word of mouth since they refused to advertise the movies appropriately. I heard it was good. Uh, one with my wife, we saw it. And yeah, it was. I thought it was a really amazing movie. I think it is. I, 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 I like it because it's incredibly simple. It is incredibly accessible. It's kind of like wrapped up in a lot of stuff. But at the end of the day, I think it's a really basic story told almost perfectly. And then all the different parts of the movie that it tries to do, I think it does exceedingly well. The humor, the music, the genre bending, and everything. Wow. Beautiful. There we go. All right, Fringy, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, everything Everywhere All at Once is great. Um, it's, it's kind of similar to what was just said. It's, it is a pretty straightforward story in terms of it's got like a really well-defined uh, small-scale core and set, you know, basically focusing on a few characters um, and essentially like plights and um, feelings that are pretty universal um, and and in a sense, I guess you could say mundane or normal, but then sort of couched within the context of this really insane, wacky um, like story that's leveraging the multiverse to say something meaningful about the human experience. Um, 
I think it's like probably one of the strongest examples of blending comedy and drama. Um, fantastic character writing. Um, yeah, lots of great humor. I really enjoyed it. Sweet. John, what have you got to say? It's funny because uh, I saw this in Doctor Strange on the same day, right? I decided to make a day of it at the theater. <laughs> really? really? <laughs> and uh, I had higher Which one expectations. Did you see first? I saw everything everywhere first. Oh. And, but I was expecting more from uh multiverse of madness because i hadn't even heard of everything everywhere all at once i just saw i saw the poster and then i looked up a little bit about it and i saw it was a martial arts thing i'm like i'll probably dig this went in blown away i could not believe how good it was and like multiple times in the theater i'm like i cannot believe what i'm watching like this is one of the funniest fucking things i've ever seen but like in addition to being funny also like like destiny was saying simple yet profound at the same time and what it has to say is so relent relentlessly positive and true and it's like my new favorite thing movie to throw on if i'm like sad you know it used to be office space was my go-to movie for, to, for throwing on and i think there's some overlap with that premise in some way like a guy who wants to do nothing and then finds out that that's really unfulfilling um but yeah i uh and then I saw Doctor Strange. I was like, good lord, this, what a piece of shit this is. And, uh, yeah, great movie. Amazing. All right, you. Well, uh, I think I saw the trailer, and the second in the trailer it gets to uh, the first, like, splintering of universes, I turned it off, so I was like, all right, I'll watch this. I will, just because of the, I'm a fan of this craziness. This should be fun. And, uh, and everyone's recommending it. And we finally got around to it. Man, uh, did not expect to enjoy it so thoroughly. Um, and I think even when, um, because me, Rags, and Franny watched it together for the first time, and, uh, even in the first ten minutes, the, the movie, by comparison to a lot of films you'll watch these days, just feels so fucking alive. Like, uh, everything has purpose. All the, dare I say, shots, the, the choices for sound effects, the music, all the pieces of dialogue, they're so, um, uh, expeditious slash efficient, and uh, I was already impressed in terms of it simply being about a, a family drama. Is what I th could have been convinced we were actually getting in full. Um, and, and technically speaking, we did. But what I mean is, like, I, when the multiverse stuff came back in, because I knew that was there, but I'd kind of forgotten. I was like, all right, yeah, let's do this. Whatever this is going to be. And um, man, they didn't waste their premise or their uh, their options. And I feel that. Uh, uh, I've seen sentiment against this, but I feel like they leveraged the fact that it was a multiverse story very hardcore to, to, to talk about some fundamental human nature issues that I found to be very meaningful and can't wait to talk about. Um, yes, very good. Rags, what do you think? Oh my goodness. Uh, pretty much, uh, I'm just going to be echoing the things that people before me have said. I have... Nothing but praise for this film. I was thoroughly absorbed into the this cast of characters in the first 10 minutes. It is excellently acted. It is a great mixture of different tones. It made me laugh. It made me cry. It made me do all the things that a film ideally should do. It told a story. It had a message. It was artistic all the way through. It's just, it just drips with personality and character. It is, it's, it's a, it's an excellent experience. I would recommend it thoroughly. And I am, I, I only hope that this movie's greatness will help encourage for similar things to be made. Um, and as we talk about the movie and what happens and, all the different layers because this is a this is a movie that anyone could watch i think and enjoy but the more observant and the more i guess uh what's the word the more uh, film savvy you are the more you will pick up there's a lot of good subtextual stuff happening here um and i'm thoroughly impressed with this movie sweet well <clears throat> with no time to waste we're probably just gonna get right into the movie why not um, I know that there's, there's already several people in chat who are like, wow, you actually loved this? It's like, fine, let's get some arguments done, yeah. shall we? So, the film opens with, uh, we, we, we're looking at a mirror and they're, uh, the family, uh, main characters, all three of them, uh, doing some karaoke. 
it's uh, the kind of thing where I've talked about before, especially when we covered Arcane. But like the opening shot is for movies is oftentimes going to be some kind of major point, and it'll come back uh, once you finish the film to be a lot more meaningful potentially. Um, but the cool thing I think to draw from this when you first go through is just the common sentiment about stories, about fiction, which is that there's that there's that saying where it's like a window into another world when. I think it's more common, or at least more accurate to say, it's like a mirror. And the way it works with this is the mirror um, is knocked down as she enters her room, and then we move into the mirror to watch the film. Like, I, I just think that's a neat flourish for setting up the fact that it's a it's great, like, like, choice of camera, you know, camera movement. Yeah, and, and it's uh, just framing. the beginning of loads of direction in this film that uh, is, I think, impressive. Inspired? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I it doesn't well. give you that. Hmm. Aren't we artsy? Look at what I can do. It doesn't ever give that vibe. Everything so seems think, like it's kind think, of deliberate um, and purposeful. I was about to say. I think that's something that will become sort of more apparent as you go through the film. Is like, yeah, you you thought about like pretty much every facet of this, didn't you? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, but that alone, as a start, you're already like, huh? Okay. Because that's, that's mm. just it, it grabs my attention more when you do stuff like that. Because I'm just like, oh, sweet. Um, and yeah, we just start with our main character doing some taxes. But I really like the shot they've got because when uh, her husband Wayman shows up, he stands in just the right place. So there's a there's a mirror in the background that can show his face. Um, but you can't see his face in like the main frame. No, and he takes the form she's looking at and just slaps it down. He has like a big old smile, and she's just like. I think she says, uh, stop playing, we don't have the time. Which again, the first line of any story to me is often very important. I feel like the whole film is going to be making a counter-argument to that uh, idea. It's a, it's a lack of, it's not a grandiose opening for a movie. It's very, very down-to-earth. It's very mundane. Uh, it's not like it opens with some crazy action sequence or some wild grab you with the the spectacle it's very just relatable people talking storytelling through the environment how people behave how they talk very 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 relatable and we talk about like a, in its place. a house that feels lived in it doesn't feel yeah. like a set this is one of the strongest examples yeah, yeah this totally. doesn't feel like a set none of the when you, none when you, of these places feel like sets when you guys do this, do you ever are you allowed to reference other movies, or do you try not to? Do oh, that? go for it, yeah. Verboten, forbidden. <laughs> the um, so when when I engage with media, one of the things that I enjoy engaging with media for is seeing like what is something that this like um that this medium does exceedingly well that doesn't translate to other mediums. So like a really good example is like anime. If you watch anime, it has like a certain look. It doesn't really translate to like live action well because it's just like a different type of thing. Um, I think when, when it comes to film, you can show so much and I give really big props to anything. You can tell the beginning of this. It, it almost reminds me of Uncut Gems. It's so tempting, I guess, when you're making a film that like the first like 30 seconds are here is a narrator, you know, huge shot to give you an idea of where you are. They introduce the characters. They introduce what's going on. Um, I hate that. I hate, hate, hate films. Not all the time, but like when you have a narrator or when you're doing narration, it's so much worse than if you can just give us a bunch of shots to give us an example of like what kind of world we're in and who the people are. So I think I think back to the, the be not to get too far ahead of this, but like the beginning of this movie and this this part of then going forward reminds me a lot of the beginning of Uncut Gems, where there's no narration. You're not really they, they don't really hold your hand through, but you can get a really good idea of the world that they live in and everything going on around them in a way that's really unique to the medium of film. You know, like it's really hard to get this across in in text or something else. Yeah, no, I think leveraging it as a visual medium to convey stuff that would otherwise you'd have to convey through prose or. Yeah, mm -hmm. through like narration in like an audio audible form. It's yeah, it's like taking advantage of the of of the tools that you have. Though I guess in this case, I think it's um you think about like framing in terms of what is our focus right now when we know that this film later on is gonna blow the doors wide open. It's like we are focusing on, on a very specific, you know, group of characters with a handful of, you know, pretty normal tasks ahead of them. Feels like a lot of it is just trying to ground us right now to learn as much information as we can about like their their life and like their history before we jump into you know the crazy stuff yeah and, and what i think is neat is that every sentence is going to tell you a lot where i think in a more feeble script it, they don't take advantage of 
understanding that's what it means. Like one of the first things Wayman Wayman says to her is, "I know better than to ask to help you," which is interesting. Mm. It's uh, it's not the most normal thing you'd expect a husband to say to a wife. Um, but that's the thing. Uh, this this opening is going to establish the issues in all of the main character being Evelyn's uh, relationships, be it with her husband, her father, or her daughter. Um. And they're going to have to do it real quickly, because we've got a whole crazy story they want to tell. Um, but they need to get this stuff foundationally set, so that we can understand why other things are going to be much more meaningful as they happen. Um, the end in the I like background. The sorry, uh, the family being encapsulated in the mirror, like that's the first shot, right? And they're, they're yeah, yeah. singing karaoke together, and that kind of like that's everything that will end up being everything to them, right? It's just like that family togetherness. And then that does that uh, jump cut, I suppose, where they're gone from the reflection. Like, it's just not necessarily obvious what that means yet if, like, you're watching it for the first time, but on subsequent viewings, it's just like, oh, that's what they were doing. Like, oh, Is that, that how you say that? Great. Subsequent? I think so. I think I'm using that right. Well, there's subsequent. Like any, something that follows something else there's way too many bongers here for me to correct any pronunciation because you guys say that <laughs> shit incorrectly. you say that as if there's more than one what the fuck are you talking or is that way too many already it's already too many oh my god i'm fucking outraged anyway sorry for that sagui yes um so he he almost hands her a form and she grabs it very casually and he looks panicked when she does and it's just like he's still pretty happy disposition though because it's interesting to find out what that form's about but uh yeah, he really wants to talk to her about it. Um, the we're going to be spending time, obviously. Uh, just, just she's in a mountain of taxes, uh, basically, which is going to be an important, I guess, foundational argument for why uh, life can be pretty painful. Um, but we're going to it's going to be like a constant motif, I suppose I should say. But uh, she immediately just like rolls out all the things she's got to do before her dad wakes up, which is like. We need to get the ceiling painted in the in the lower floor. We need to get food ready for uh, all three of us, and uh, we got to get everything ready for seeing the um, the IRS agent and stuff like that. And she's asking him for help when he's desperately just trying to show her this form. Um, and he tells her that they've set up a fun surprise for the dad tonight, which is going to be regarding a party and stuff. It's all just very normal stuff. But the thing you notice straight away, and I thought it was interesting, and it'll be interesting to compare with Doctor Strange. Actually, that's going to come up a couple of times. They switch languages in the middle of sentences to sometimes say as many as one, two, three, or four words. They'll go into a, they'll be speaking like Mandarin or Cantonese, and then they'll move into English temporarily, and they'll move back. Now, yeah, sometimes it's just a couple words. It just it 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 really is a because we this was one of my complaints about uh, Doctor Who. Strange. Sorry, why did I even say that? <laughs> this is what I fuck Doctor Who, Doctor Strange. One of my biggest problems with Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness. See, you can't even say the name. But uh, but how they would go from one language to another in a way that just didn't feel like that's actually how it would happen. It felt too jarring and unnatural. But this film, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about the, the similarities and differences between this and Doctor Strange. It's, it's hard not to... We were already making comparisons when we were watching it. But the way that our characters, our, our bilingual characters speak to one another, they will, they, there's just this natural flow of sometimes a word in another language slips out, or they will, it, it just, it's hard to, it's hard to explain, but it feels very natural. Well, the way I would argue Everything it that they say to each other. Is in Doctor Strange, she'll complete English, and then she'll just do a sentence fully in, like, Spanish or whatever, and the character in, in Universe has no reason to do it any, for any reason other than to prompt the fact that Doctor Strange does not know Spanish, which is, like, yeah. a comparison to his alter self. It's just like, okay, that was... that felt just annoying and rude. In this, they keep slipping just into different parts of it with specific words or portions of sentences. Yeah. It, it feels... Almost that accidental. Is, yeah, because it's hard to force that. That's something that they would have had to get right probably on a couple of takes. You have to learn, to, like, your character needs to switch to English in the middle of your sentence in a way that makes the structure uh, maintain, if you were to translate. That's difficult. Yes. And, um, yeah, to me it feels like a much more natural representation of how uh, being aware of multiple languages... like Because Metal does it every once in a while. He's, he's a guy who pops on the stream every once in a while. Um, he can 
get English confused as well as um, possibly wonder what the correct word is because he's not aware of a particular translation. So he'll just resort to the his primary language's version, which I think is what happens with these guys, is that they speak English to all of their customers constantly, but then they speak different languages to, to each other because that's their Yeah, uh, the one they're more ones. familiar with, the ones that they know best, yeah. And we'll talk more about that very For soon. The, here's like an interesting piece of criticism. Have you guys seen John Wick? Yes. Yeah. The first so, one? Any of them, I think. John yes. Wick does something that I super love, and I want to see more people do this in film, but it never happens, is a creative uh, display of subtitles. I don't know if you remember in John yeah. Wick. Yeah. yeah, they do that like really. Like a comic like, book. Kind of, yeah. Like the colored words, the rolling mm -hmm. them over the screen slowly. Maybe it's not appropriate in all cases, but um, this film, as we'll see as we go through, is like a very... I don't want to say artsy film, but they do a lot with what's on the screen. Um, I wonder if there would have been a more entertaining way to display the subtitles. Or maybe they just thought, you know, like, screw it, we'll just put the subtitles here. We don't want to distract from everything else going on the screen. But I do remember when I watched the first John Wick, it was the only, it was the first time in my life, um, aside from shows doing, like, texting kind of on screen, it was the first time I'd seen mm -hmm. subtitles, um, like, elevated to some kind of artistic form. And I was like, oh, that's actually really cool. It would be interesting to see something more like that, but yeah. I I think one of the reasons why they probably went with a more typical subtitle display is because especially the first 25 or so minutes, but it's, yeah, it's probably about 20 minutes of this. It's a totally normal movie. It's just people running the laundromat. It's very mundane. It's very down to earth. There's nothing artistic, quote unquote, about it in that sense. It's very just matter of fact. And this is just a, a slice of life. This is these people's lives with each other. And maybe just the fact that the subtitles are so plain is, I don't know, maybe that's just appropriate the way it is. Now, if, if in each of the multiverses, maybe the subtitles were different, that would have been something. Yeah. They, well, I mean, we do but, see a lighter instance of a uh, different use of text in a certain universe, but I guess we'll get to that one lighter. Um, it's also another part. I don't know. <laughs> this is a really controversial take. So I don't speak Japanese, obviously. I'm guessing you guys watch that's anime, that controversial. Right? Well, Did you yeah, just say okay. I'm guessing you guys watch anime? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so, something. So I appreciate I, what I perceive to be as the authenticity of this, uh, the language in the film. Um, when I, I shouldn't say growing up, I guess when I was in like 19, 20, 21, I worked at a casino that had a lot of Vietnamese customers and um, people would mix in a lot of just English sentences and then back to Vietnamese and they would do it like very seamlessly. Sometimes you didn't even know what was happening. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing this happens somewhat commonly in Asian households. I appreciate that. Um, when I talk about anime sometimes, there's this there's a, this tension between subs and dubs where you want subs because <laughs> because usually the dubs are absolutely horrible. Um, but like I, I think you want subs because it maybe feels a little more authentic. The original voice actors can convey more emotions better because they take it more serious over there. But there's this agony that I hate the idea of watching a film that's doing so much on the screen and your eyes are glued to the subtitles. It actually drives me crazy. And sometimes I feel like I get more. I watch this movie a second time. You can get more out of the film a second time. And there are people that are coping right now. It's like, oh, no, it doesn't affect me. But it, but it absolutely does. There is a different experience between watching a movie and taking in everything that, like, you have to consider, like, every single shot you're seeing, the director wants you to see. It's all intentional. It's all purposeful. But when your eyes are locked at the bottom of the screen reading the subtitles, it is like a fundamentally altered experience and actually paying attention to what's going on on screen. Would, so, would you I say that your eyes it. are locked on the subtitles when you're watching it, for, like, for the first time? Like, locked on them. Maybe not locked, but th there's a different feeling between, like, just looking at what's going on versus, like, reading the subtitles, looking back, reading the subtitles, looking back, reading the subtitles, looking back. Like, it's, I, I think the attention that you have is a little bit different for the film. Like, I felt like I saw a lot more the second time I watched it, because I didn't really have to pay as much attention to the subtitles. I know what's going on, I know what they're talking about. And then, the, like, the shots are so dense sometimes. And like, even one of the things we just skipped was, like, a picture of, like, uh, you know, like, her as a, uh, like, a little baby with her father. And stuff. There's like so much stuff you miss when you're even if you're even if you read quickly um, when you're glancing at subtitles. Well, so I what I would say is that I think that no matter what film you watch, the second time around, you're always going to, especially when a film is deliberately crafted, you're always going to notice new things anyway. Yeah. So, like, I, I guess I'm not sure how much the subtitles are going to detract from your experience mm -hmm. the first time around. So much that like the second time around, you're not going to get as much yeah, as you would with the ever know. subtitles. Here's a question. Have you ever actually been immersed enough in like a foreign language film that you forget you're reading the subtitles? As in, you're that, you're like engaging with it on that level that you scan down and back up so quickly that it's like being consumed. Because it's happened everyone. Not brutally reminded. 
brutally I, I, reminded every time I have to read subtitles, especially because it ruins like the. Uh, it's funny because in some ways we listen to the, we want the subtitles; it's more authentic, but it also kind of ruins the flow of the conversation as well because you're getting like huge blocks of text every time that's not being delivered as the people are speaking and everything too. It um, changes it a little bit. I'm not saying it's bad; just like something <clears throat> I have in mind sometimes when I watch things. I guess it depends on how the subtitles are displayed. Some stories will not just bombard you with the entire line; they will stagger them. I think Spirited Away did because I watched Spirited Away with the sub uh, the Sub, oh, yeah. yeah, and um, like I don't, I don't feel like I missed out on anything by doing that. Um, at least not so much. Like, especially when the trade off with a lot of anime is going to be like, do you really want to listen to the dub over like the original well, lines the way it was intended? You know, it'll always be dependent um, on because, like, I know the response to this is like, it's just uh, what you know. If the dub is bad, that's the problem. If the dub is good, then it's fine. Um, which to to a degree is okay, but like getting the original. Because when you read the text and you listen to the way that they're delivering the line, even if you don't understand the language, you pick up the emotion. Um, which is seriously like why I have not been a fan of watching dubs for a really, really, really long time. And it's I would argue it is mainly because I can't trust them. Uh, I feel like I can trust subs more. They have a more uh, reliable result. And I really don't mind watching a great movie more than once. Um, Especially if it means I can, because I, I always end up picking up more stuff if it's a movie I think that was pretty hard handcrafted. Even in the subtitles, uh, I would have read them all the first time around. But once I get a greater understanding of the context of the whole story, I can read them all again and know uh, more so what I can pick into them. I don't blame anybody for picking either. Um, but I, I just err on the side of caution with how a dub can destroy um, a story more so than subs typically do. Uh, in, with both of them at their worst. Yeah, I think especially for anime, I can't speak to other genres, but especially for anime, uh, not to trash talk anybody, but the, the dubs are usually pretty bad. <laughs> um, like almost distractingly bad sometimes, or like just the speech is awkward. So yeah, I mean, I think for most media, I think you, you generally have to go with subs. But also like the original performances are going to be the ones that are the most important to the person um, recording or filming or animating whatever you're watching. But Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah I think that's yeah. fine. Um, so... What I uh, what was interesting, I was just going to mention, because like I think especially a lot of lesser known anime are like known for having terrible dubs. But then uh, I was actually sorting this out when I was going to show Freeing Spirited Away. I was like, I wonder what the word is on Studio Ghibli dubs, and like apparently they are known for having incredibly good dubs to the point where the community themselves are like they recommend either that the, they're both good, the sub and the dub, which um, is interesting because the dubs will often have like famous American actors and stuff, which can be more engaging for people who don't watch many um, foreign language films but um i think the creative use of subtitles can help with that distraction issue as well because sometimes like the positionality of the s subtitles will be like they'll put it next to the person talking or like near yeah yeah <laughs> yeah rags learn it as, as opposed to oh, just saying position much more fancier like um it. but uh next to the person talking or like near the focal point of the image so, you know, it's not always locked to the bottom or you have to switch back and forth. Like, I did find yeah, that with this movie because, yeah. like, this movie moves, like, it's the shots are dense. Not only that, but it moves at quite a fast pace as well. And it's very fluid movement a lot of the time. They'll scan around so the, the world isn't treated as though it's always cut up into pieces. It's one big living world. But, um, yeah, the, the subtitle point as well, that you often find, I think, in a lot of movies, especially modern ones, whenever they're texting on phones, it'll often be that the text looks like the way it would on the phone and it, it scans up next to the phone. It even traces with the phone, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know there's a thing for that a lot of the time these days because that's not quite subtitles. It's rather just trying to show you in bigger text rather than showing you the phone because it can be awkward. But Yeah, it's, it's text. This is what the text would look like. It's a, you know. And that's actually, I would probably argue that that can create a bit of discordance with uh, this film if you're first time around, the fact that they're switching languages, even though you've got like, um, a guide with the subtitles. And if you turn on like uh, the, the English subtitles too, it'll mostly have you covered. But I could see people even getting confused with that. Um, but uh, I they appreciate are doing it only having to glance at the subtitles occasionally, whenever they would switch languages. You know? Yeah. I never, like, when they're speaking I never had a problem. English again. But I guess that's just person to person. Yeah, I really I, enjoyed. It was fine for me, but I reading could... and then hearing familiar words and. Yeah. Um, there's a line uh, where he tries to calm her down. She's panicking about all the different things that are gonna go wrong, and he says, uh, "Your father's gonna see a happy family and a successful business," and she says, "That's not what he's gonna see." And then he says, "But it's what we see, right?" 
And it's just like, mm. damn. Because uh, she doesn't yeah. say yes. Um, and it just sort of has this wide shot of just... Clearly she's not happy. Um, but yeah, her dad wakes up and so it just pushes everything forward. And I think they get a, a, a buzzer for customers. As in, like, they live right above their laundromat as their business. And so if a customer has a problem, they have to buzz them and they come down the stairs to see them. And so she's got to deal with that and the dad's awake and the dad needs food. Like, it's, it's very frantic. We're literally, like three minutes into the film and it's already just there's so much shit happening um, and I think that like uh, YMS has said the same thing I think this is, really is a film you need to see twice if you want to gather everything it's doing because it's, um, it's a lot of information for the first time around um, which I think is actually really typical of A24 films right? Hereditary was the same, Midsummer was the same, The Lighthouse like you can watch basically every, I'm, <laughs> hopefully this doesn't turn into an A24 circle jerk because I know that's like, a <laughs> thing on the internet right now but I mean damn it's a cool studio but like for almost all of their films if you go back and you watch it a second time you'll hear things you're like oh holy shit I, I guess like minor spoiler for like Hereditary but like when the mom I think is talking about like her family or she'll be like oh like this happened to my uncle or whatever and you're like oh fuck he was in the thing or whatever right like I think you pick up a lot on that that seems to be the case with a lot of A24 films yeah, yeah. to be fair I haven't seen Midsummer. I've seen Hereditary what did you think of that um do we want to go through all the frames of that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I thought it was a solid film yeah um, that film, fucking, that, that, that one, do you remember the bit where he, where he wakes up in the house? That shit freaked me out when I spotted the, uh, Oh, the in corner. the corner? Yeah. Yeah. That was good shit. I enjoy stuff like yeah. that in my horror. But anyway, um, so she leaves the room to go deal with the customer and we see that, um, her husband's looking at a, uh, petition for dissolution of marriage, which is like, oh shit. And it really cut strange because of how positive he's been throughout this whole scene. Very upbeat, very friendly. And it's just like, damn, he's trying to hand her a thing for divorce. Like, all right. Which will just, it'll make more sense the more we go. And um, yeah, so they've sorted out her and her husband. And then we get introduced to a daughter who's staring into a, uh, a washing machine or dryer, I think. I guess it's both. Um, it's just losing it. Lose it lose, just, just staring away, which I think... When you first watch it, you're just like, that could mean anything. But when you've seen the film, you're well, like, oh. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. I took a friend to see this film the second time. I felt like such a loser watching the second time because there are parts of the film in the beginning that are really sad, but they're not supposed to be yet because the other person, not to get ahead of it, but like, yeah, when, in watching it a second time, like, oh, no. Yeah. Well, and I love that um, it's, it's like, this will make more sense to people listening when we get further through the film, but she is distracted from staring into the void of the of the, the dryer by oh, a girl yeah. kissing her, like, and dragging her out of it, which uh, is so very yeah. important to, to a lot of the things this, this film tries to say. Um, mm -hmm. All right, where, 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 what happens next? Um, yeah, uh, again with the dialogue, because the reason I'm getting staggered here is because of copyright. I'd like to just fucking play the movie and talk over it, but I can't do that. Um, otherwise, the stream will get banned. So, the, uh, the, the dialogue, again, is all very, very specific. Um, she just comments... It, this is the thing. You need to get information out to your, to your viewers, but how do you do it in a way that's not just clunky as fuck? Like a certain other movie. I'm not going to say its name too many times, okay? So, we need Are to these? get across to the viewers that... Uh, our viewers and the, the audience of the film... This is Becky. This is Joy. The, the Joy sorry, Joy is uh, Evelyn's daughter. Becky is her girlfriend. We need that information. We need the fact that Becky is here to try and introduce herself to Gong Gong, the, the Evelyn's father. That is the goal here. And um, it's like you need to translate all of that without being so obvious about it. So she's kissed her and Joy says, uh, man, you look hot. Like just really normal thing to say. And then she says, oh, you like the Mormon look? Which tells us immediately that uh, she's not wearing the kind of clothing she wants to. Um, she's here to well, look. It's, it's, we uh, see Joy starts to roll up her sleeves where we see some of her tattoos. It's like, yeah, because she's trying to like, yeah, none of this... to get her in a position where this information will be able to be best communicated. Yeah, none uh, of or, like, you know, in a way that won't offend him. None of it's um, overtly stated. It's all it's being yeah. it's happening while she's saying something oh, else. And yeah. what she's saying is, um, I just wanted you to know that you look hot, but just in case my mum says you're fat or something. And uh and she says, I thought you said that that means she cares. Uh which again 
the dialogue is doing telling us something completely different while we're getting a bunch of visuals to tell us something else. Like, not contradictory information, just information. It's, it's coming at you real Remember fast. That line well, too. it sounds like the what's being, what's being told when I hear things like that are you have a couple that it's pretty clear that her mom has given her Becky shit in the past. And when they've gotten into these conflicts, Joy is probably trying to smooth things over with Becky. And like, oh, no, no, no. When my mom says it, like, it's because she loves you. Okay, I promise, right? When the reality is, is that her mom is probably not 100% on board with Becky because your you're traditional first generation Asian immigrant parent has a daughter who is gay. Yeah. Um, plus the mom has a dad that she's trying to like deal with, right? That's what I hear when you say things like that. So you can see that like, as she's trying to make her presentable, like hide your tattoos, I need you to look as proper as possible, like listen, but but at the same time, she's like, oh no, no, it's not that my mom doesn't like it. Like she loves you a lot or whatever. Like that's kind of like what's being conveyed, I think with that line of dialogue. Well, I just think so much stuff at once and it's uh, kind of awesome uh, that even, even if it was uh, Joy convincing her that it's not because she cares in any way, shape or form, it seems like Becky's a little bit more upbeat uh, regardless well, between these two that line of when she says uh, you look fat that's you know i mean she cares about you that is what the mom will say to the daughter hey. later hey what stop right there bitch he broke the rule i didn't break it first he broke the rule okay you broke the rule, right. are you writing rules points? make sure broken. you have that on a board okay i didn't break that one I, I, honestly congrats I'll by the way for, uh, <laughs> what <laughs> so when you have a thought like that no. put it in a notepad and then bring it up later yeah, we're not yeah. we're not allowed to do that, right? Gosh. Say hmm. I yeah, just go. Hmm. That it might be something that you'll call back to later. The old flag on it. Jump ahead. Once again, I am the lightning rod of hate being <laughs> victimized by others around me. Um. So what I really like is uh, Evelyn just fucking bursts through the door that they're, they're waiting for. They're both like shocked, and kind of thinking about it. Then Becky goes, "Hi, Evelyn, M Miss Wong," um, which is like. Just, just standard sort of fun stuff, and then she's like, "Hi, mom." And fucking, I'm pretty sure we just found this funny. All Evelyn says is, "I only cook for three people, now I have to cook more." <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, nice. What a great introduction. Um, yeah, and and I think I it's think it's like she's she's just very matter of fact, and I think like. All she has time for in life is work. Like, the scene could have been easily, like, Becky giving flowers to the mom. is like, oh, look, I love you. And her and the mom's response would be, great, I don't even have a vase for these. I have to go to the store There's now. No like, problem. that would be her yeah. response, you know? Yeah. yeah everything every, is, every. like, some something that has to be solved. There's no time to stop and appreciate everything. It's just the constant grind of life, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, like, it's eroded her social cues, like, completely. She doesn't... She's not even detecting what would be wrong here, I don't think. Because she's got, some, like you said, problems to solve. There's loads of them. Um, yeah, and uh, they head upstairs, and you've got uh, Evelyn even says, like, uh, uh, Joy and Becky are here. And then Waymond is, like, surprised that uh, she's surprised by that. Because he's like, well, yeah, we, we, we asked uh, Joy to translate for the IRS agent, and she said she would bring Becky so Becky can look after Gong Gong while we're gone. And uh, it just looks like Evelyn completely forgot about that. Um, obviously, because she's dealing with all kinds of stuff. Which, uh, all of that really does make sense. And then um, Evelyn starts spending the scene trying to find a way around that. It's, um, it's just good to note as well, as soon as uh, Joy and Becky enter the room, uh, Wayman hugs Becky. Like, he's, uh, it's just this completely different sort of... It tells us a lot about um, something that you'll notice about Wayman and his disposition, you know, compared to Evelyn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Fear was pretty indicative of uh yeah, something something that's a pretty significant sort of moment later on. But uh let's it's not gonna jump ahead this time. <laughs> um yeah, and then she says Which is um, fine. He can um uh so the, the the Evelyn presents like an opportunity of uh you stay with Gong Gong because my translation's good enough and uh and Becky doesn't even have to be here. Like she can go. And it's just like this, again, this implication of like Evelyn's trying to solve Becky's presence here when the whole point of Becky being here from Evelyn's point of, uh, sorry, Joy's point of view is that uh, we're trying to, to, to have it become more accepted within this family dynamic as well as Gong Gong finally understanding who she is, who she represents, all this stuff. Um, but at the same time, she's mixing up um, he's and she's because of the complication that in, she says in Chinese, just one word. Um, and so it's just one on top of several references that Evelyn's English is not fantastic, or at least it causes oh, a problem. Well, 
I, I don't know if I, I feel like that's just the mom doesn't want to accept it. I don't think that's actually, I think her English is good enough. I don't think there's actually a problem there with the translation. I think the mom is just like, uh, he's, like she almost like doesn't even want to think about it because the relationship is so non-traditional. Or I, I guess that's the kind of this, takeaway there that I had. And then she's kind of like giving like, well, in Chinese, it's the same thing, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know about that one. I'd be more willing to agree with you if not for the fact there's loads of references throughout the film of her poor English, basically. Um. um is there maybe? Well, yeah, you yeah. jumped well, ahead now, so <laughs> I guess yeah, we'll see what we Yeah, Mahler. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, that's fair, though. I'm not doing nothing. Because I, I would, oh, in a hypothetical fair. world where, where future things like that come up, I wonder more, is it really the language that's the problem or is it her attention? Because I think in a lot of areas, possibly where it comes up, there's like, it's an attention issue more so like, are you actually listening? Rather than like, oh, my English is actually failing. But maybe we'll see, I guess, yeah. Um, well, you know, I think that's a fair interpretation anyway, that she's definitely not taking the time to understand. Then, yeah, we're about to find out that Becky has been mm -hmm. around for three years. Um, yeah. And so it's it's a bit ridiculous yeah, that yeah. Evelyn hasn't taken the time to learn the pronoun for her. Like, this, it shouldn't be that difficult at that point um, mm -hmm. with someone who, because I imagine Becky speaks exclusively English. Um, it would be important to at least get some of those bits right. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, there's the there's just really great uh, moments here of basically like establishing who needs to take care of Gong Gong, and in the background you have um, they're saying uh, Wayman says like we can take Gong Gong with us. Uh, no, sorry, Evelyn says that, and Wayman says like does he know we're being audited? Which we've already got the uh, the line to imply what they want is for Gong Gong to see they have a uh, a successful business and a happy family. And so that's like one half. And then Becky says, oh, I'd love to meet him. Like, I still haven't. And both times they show the reaction on Evelyn's face being that of very much intense worry. Because, uh, mm -hmm. and so it, already you can pick up what the problem might be if, uh, if you've got enough clues, but they'll make it obvious eventually. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just cool that all the groundwork's already laid. The fact that Becky wants to see him and the fact that they're going to have to take Gong Gong with them. With, but uh, then... Yeah. Like, fortunately for Evelyn, the the buzzer rings, and so she has an ability to just like, oh, the customers, I got to go take care of that. It's like almost a relief on her face when she yeah. has an ability, a way to escape this situation. Part of the part of the problem Evelyn has is trying to ignore these problems long enough to hope that they go away. Mm -hmm. Um, I even like the the line where uh, Joy tries to say like, Becky, you're 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 really happy and interested to to hang out with Gong Gong, right? Like, and I'm pretty sure what we're supposed to gather from that once we understand a bit more is that Becky wants to be around him, for him to get used to her, to understand who she is. Um, and yep. she says, Yeah, I I always learn stuff when I hang around with uh, with the elderly. Old people are very wise. And um, <laughs> Evelyn just sort of laughs, like goes, because huh. I assume what she's thinking about is how much. Like she's gonna change her mind on that when she meets him, potentially is is what probably what Evelyn's <laughs> thinking. Um, but yeah, they come up with a plan. Of, 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 well, eventually, but uh, yeah, the customer has a problem downstairs. She's got to go. Um, just, so it was pretty indicative of um, I guess like the nature of their life that when descending this, I don't I don't think we see the staircases before that moment. But, like descending the staircase is just cluttered. There's so much stuff. Yes, and she's uh, there's there's like a a cue to uh, for Becky telling Joy like do do the thing, and it's it's clear that they just want her introduced to Gong Gong, and so uh, mm -hmm. this the rest of this scene now is. Uh, Evelyn just trying to absorb herself in her work while Joy is desperately trying to get her to acknowledge that Becky and Gong Gong need to meet. Um, and, uh, you know, she says, like, um, this can't go on like this for so long because it's been three years, and she says, your mother is open to you dating a girl, and she's white. Like, uh, so, you know, be thankful for that being the reality on its own. Nice. Um, and I think uh, Joyce says she's half Mexican. Like, so, you know, this, this, there's a... A subtle level of just not even bothering to understand the dynamic. Doesn't know at all. anything really that yeah, much about Becky. A lot less than she should know, given how long their relationships lasted. Yeah, and then she says that like, also, but but there might be something to think about in terms of like, I guess that lack of information and where it stems from. I guess we'll we'll get to that again later though. Yeah. Um, uh, before we do move on, uh, do you do you know what this Funko Pop is? Who that is? Because it's on the dresser behind her. Do you do you recognize that? Because I'm wondering if this is a reference to something, or maybe a. Does that ring a bell? 
I have no Dave. clue. If Anyone in chat? They all have the same faces, but like you. What's the you problem with Funko Pops? You can't fucking yeah, tell. Yeah, the, the big black eyes. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, though it is probably deliberate for all we understand with how this movie goes. Um. Yeah. Um. She says like telling Gong Gong at this point could kill him or would kill him actually, and uh, Joy's like, no, it won't. It's ridiculous. Um. Then you get, uh, the, the, so a lot of the characters that start coming in as, like, uh, tertiary people who are just involved in the, in the, um, the laundromat end up turning back up in the, in the movie later. Um, so it's just fun to see them at this point. The first one is the lady where she just, she just sees her, just goes, oh, wow, big nose. <laughs> it's just <laughs> Sounds like another rule break to me, Mahler, but okay. Hey, uh, yeah, we never, that's, that's more of a big nose before we got there. More of a be aware thing, okay? Uh -huh. It's, it's, it's okay. not anything else. Jeez, okay. racism. Um, so you start uh, to 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 like she. I, I think there's a line. I'll probably jump ahead just a tiny bit here because there's a line later as well. But she says, "I'm giving hey. them my ticket." She doesn't know what it is. She's on the phone. She says they don't read minds. And a little bit later on, like a minute, uh, when there's improper change, uh, the guy she's talking to says, "I thought you guys were good with math." And it's just like all math. I can't remember what he says, but point being, there's these uh, these bits that get um, added up, and even Evelyn comments on it more overtly when she gets to the uh, to, to the IRS. Um, there's there's tensions of multiple kinds. Uh, yeah, the 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 main thing I think we're supposed to take away is the fact that it's three years of this, and she hasn't done anything about Becky because I assume she thinks it's hopefully a phase. Um, yeah, maybe. But again, it'll we're, sort itself out. Maybe they'll break up. Maybe it's not something I even have to worry about. I have more pressing concerns. Um, as as like the the conversation ever gets closer to actually getting to the point, someone just moves into frame, asking for help with something to do with the laundromat or just distractions everywhere. Of course, and yeah, there's a guy whose money's been eaten by by the machine, so she calls down Way uh, Wayman to help out. Um, and just you just gradually, as the scene goes on, Joy is just getting progressively more and more depressed in the background because she can't get through. Um, until they head I think up. this is the scene, but there's like I think there's only one swear word in this whole movie, really? and it's in that one. I, maybe maybe there's more. The, the only one I'm remembering is when Joy is venting to her girlfriend, and it's like like it's an appropriate use of like cursing, right? Because they would swear when talking to each other. I just I don't remember any curse words. Anywhere else in the film? There's definitely at least yeah. uh, probably some, but I can't reference anything in the future. But we'll see, I guess. She does say, "Oh, oh okay. shit!" at one point later in the film. I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's well, also, doesn't right. when that one wasn't there the security guard right before he gets hit? Doesn't he say "fuck"? Am I crazy? Yes, yes, I yes. Think he does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, there's yep. a few. Yeah. Wow, I, John. I thought there was a single line of swearing live. overall. That's <laughs> my point. Um, also, just as as we go forward with this sort of segment of this first part of the film the the shift in just how busy it is here we're almost even though it seems to be really nervous uh she seems to really be, be nervous no matter where she is because of how much stuff is going on in her life there's this it's 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 very busy down here people are always you know talking to her she's constantly doing this as she's walking she notices was it like a shoe or something in the the in the dryer and she takes that out and she gets upset at a customer for putting like a, like a shoe in the machine. And she just gets bugged. We're almost at, you get the impression that maybe being upstairs, even if it's dealing with taxes and stuff, at, at least it's almost like a refuge in a way to get away from all this, all these people bugging her. Yeah. Um, I think that the soundtrack is helping out a lot at that point as well to just, it raises a sense of tension for, a, for an audience member, I think. That oh, true. If, there are there was a um, I don't remember saying there's a really shitty guy that does movie reviews online that said the soundtrack for this movie <laughs> wasn't that good. Hey. Uh, what a horrible, what a horrible. I, I horrible feel like that's thinly but... veiled. I feel, I, feel like I, just, I remember hearing that. I was so upset. Jeez, but yeah, you know. We, well, you I mean, I, no I, opinion. Uh, well, on the soundtrack. <laughs> no, actually, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I, uh, I I've seen a guy recently talk about The Lion King, and he was he made some incredibly good points about the soundtrack in that. So it couldn't have been that guy. I assume. I love the I love the 2019 Lion King. No. Like you, you guys, you guys told me all the time. You tell me every time you, before we go live how much you really, really enjoy you, it. Did you say, really like how much they spliced together 
Um, yeah, that's art. That's the, art. Uh, that is art. All creativity. The line yeah. From Ruf- where when Mufasa, it's sometimes his voice was just really bassy all of a sudden, just inexplicably. Yeah. But yeah. then there's other times where he's like, Simba. It's like, it's kind of. Amber. Uh, it's really <laughs> it's like artistic voice. It it's says John a lot Favreau's about. artistic nature. vision. It says a lot about the nature of, um, you know, like the film industry when even Mufasa, you know, his voice is just scattershot because he's just been doing it for so long. It's the artistic combination really of a, the uh, old and the new, yeah. bringing them together. Pretty brilliant. Yeah, yeah I don't it, know. It really is. This, um, really is. this new guest we got thrown a lot of shade. I'm just hoping that um, is Discord safe? Like, can we prevent anyone from just jumping in at any point? I hope so, because it would be really awkward. If no, I'm... yeah, of course. You have to drag people in here. What the fuck? Discord. End your what camera. Happened? You screwed up my screen. <laughs> oh my! Oh no! We had this all. Anyway. Oh no! Why am I broke in? Ah! I'm well, sorry. I'm sorry. Ruined. I forgot how to do this. I'm sorry. How do I do this? <laughs> There, there we you go. go. Now he did. It. Hooray! <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I thought it was. I th- uh, never mind. Anyway, uh, w- you're really lucky that <laughs> my webcam didn't turn on <laughs> because I don't have any clothes on. Right now. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> I'm not like completely nude. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that was funny. Okay. I am. Hi. Um, Hello. Hey, Stephen. Hi. What's up, Adam? Hello. Um, so I wanted to ask you really quick. I'm only going to be in here for like one minute and then I'll leave you back to your chronological breakdown. Um, so this is like your favorite movie now, right? (laughs) Maybe, maybe my feelings will suddenly be a new crush. I think, I think you said it it was. Yeah. I mean, it feels like it right now. Yeah, for sure. Did you have a favorite movie before this? I really, 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 I don't know why, but there was a movie called Pan's Labyrinth that I super loved. I thought that was like almost a perfect I love that movie. I love that movie so much. Um, but I probably would have said it with that. If you push me really hard, maybe I could have picked another one. But um, yeah. as long as you don't pick Interstellar, okay. Oh, that's a that's it? a good pick. Everything's wrong oh, with Interstellar. Cool. And go. <laughs> Not one yet. other thing. One day. <laughs> uh, one other thing. Uh, so you say that subtitles distract you a lot, but do you watch that many subtitled films? Because it could just be like that. You haven't gotten used to it. Like, I don't know. Okay, hold on. I'm going to be... Okay, I did really well in school, and I read really fucking fast. So I know a lot of people <laughs> in chat are like, oh, you can't read fast. I've got like three chats on my screen at any time in my fucking life, and in high school, I was a 99th percentile reader. So it's not the matter... It's not a matter of being able to read fast or not. It's that I don't know how to mm-hmm. explain it, but when you're sitting there watching a movie, like... In, in, in a perfect world, if you're like a director, if you're editing stuff, you, like you're trying to draw people's eyes to certain parts of the screen, even if you can read subtitles quickly, which I can, I can read very fast, there's still a different feeling. And I felt this, I'll feel this anytime I watch a movie a second time. There's a far different feeling be- between kind of like sitting there and just kind of watching and understanding what's being shown on the screen versus even like quickly like moving your eyes down to read subtitles and then back up. It's just a different type of experience. Um, I, some people are, I think, thinking that I think that like dubs are better. I would never watch, I don't ever watch dubbed media, okay? Because mm-hmm. 99% of the time dubs are fucking atrocious. I always watch subtitled media. Um, but I, I just, that's something that I, I mean, like if you're a real fan, you'd learn the language, right? But like, yeah, it just, you can miss a lot, especially when you're getting shots that are so dense with storytelling, when you're having to constantly glance down and read the subtitles is all I was saying. I, I, I feel know. like, I feel like most it. films, even without subtitles, like mm-hmm. there's a lot that I miss on my first watch in terms of how yeah. dense a lot of great films are. For sure. Um, sometimes, sometimes a, a scene visually can be just so packed with information, especially uh, things that you can, you know, pick up better on your For second sure. watch, like the Transformers um, movies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I'm prime sorry. examples. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Especially, yeah, I, I honestly like find Rose, even yeah. with. Um, here, here's something that I've noticed is like even with English movies or movies in the English language, mm-hmm. um, I watch them with subtitles because there's been so many times where like I've seen a movie like a billion times, but it just needed me having the text on the screen to like really absorb a line. Like sometimes I'll watch it for the first time with subtitles because I didn't used to do that. And I'll just be like, oh, wow, that that line's really important. Maybe it was like really quiet in the background. Like Oof. maybe it was something that was like intentional in the script, but just not like. I would fight you hardcore on that. I think it's a really bad nope. habit that people get into. But uh, for some what? shitty mixed bad habit. movies, yeah, uh, watching English movies habit. with subtitles. When I see people do that, oh, it makes me crazy. <laughs> <Adam. laughs> watching yeah. English movies. I think that I think I that watch every movie gotten, with subtitles. I think that people have gotten in this area. Now, I will agree with you partially because, especially, and I have to wonder. You're I'm 33 up. now. Sometimes I don't I'm know. Up. Wait, I'm breaking up. No, uh, say that one more time. Breaking oh. up is this family, and subtitles yeah. are tearing it apart. Um. I don't know if um, 
I don't know if it's just me getting old sometimes, but there definitely are, Nolan is super guilty of this, movies that are mixed really poorly sometimes. They're like, yeah. you actually can't hear the audio's noise. So I am a little bit empathetic towards people that are like, fuck it, just throw on the subtitles. Or if you're watching a movie at night and you have to be quiet or something, I can understand. But I think, I think there is a scary thing where I've noticed, because my chat watches a lot of movies sometimes, where people become like addicted or obsessed with having English subtitles, even if the film is like understandable. And it's like 85% of, of what's going on with an actor is conveyed through like facial expressions and stuff. And if you're just reading the text, how are you, Adam, how are you, I feel like you're missing so much of the movie. Can we, if it's an English actor, so we actually, actually, wait, 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 can we actually be clear on, on how, how long does it take you? you are from the screen, how long does right? it take you to read a sentence like, though, seriously? Cause it's like a much, split second. How much of the screen is your peripherals also? Like, cause there's a difference between watching a film in a theater like close to the front where you mm -hmm. have to actually like change where your eyeballs are and like change your focus of like where you're looking on the screen versus oh, like yeah, that's bad. if don't everything's <laughs> if everything's like further away from you, um, you don't have to look away from the screen to you know see the subtitle. Like you don't have to look away from the focus of the shot. You can pretty much absorb everything all at once. Yeah, Adam has found for watching films. You ever play video games with subtitles on? Yeah, All the time. I like to listen to him in the Everybody. Japanese audio. <laughs> well, it's just you, when you're playing, you're playing video games. You ever feel like you're distracted from like the gameplay when you have to like check the subtitles, or if if you need to, like if characters are speaking a different language. No, but it's like a different thing. Like if I'm playing like League of Legends or StarCraft, like I'm used to things existing in my peripheral vision because this is like when you're when you're playing a competitive game, the only purpose of that is to gather information. Like it's a very much a functional thing. I need to know if somebody is on the mini map, I need to know something like that. But for art, it's not I'm not just there like uh, my function isn't so that somebody can quiz me in two minutes and like who moved across. I want to be able to like take in like the artistic merits of everything that I'm seeing, I guess. I feel I like video little, games are art. Video but... game Wow, I figured you might have also, might have been a stick I, of the tongue there. I, yeah. I understand. I think I understand what Destiny's saying in terms of there's a very, especially in a competitive kind of sense where there is like stuff that's kind of on the line in the moment. The utility of the subtitles exists in a way that it doesn't exist in when you're watching a film, um, particularly sure, when you're watching it, it casually. Surely that depends on the type of game you're playing, right? Like, yeah, would, of would course. You, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't have a, subtitles but like, on all my games. I'm lost on because some I do. I've consumed so many fucking movies in my life, and a lot with subtitles, I've never felt the difference. And I've done both Me so either. much. I've never felt like, oh, I'm putting mm -hmm. subtitles on, so I'm gonna I, absorb less of the movie now. You know how, like, um, when you, you know those, like, tests that they'll do where they'll present you with a sentence where certain letters are omitted from the words, but, like, your mind will just fill them in anyway? Mm -hmm. I yeah. feel like a, a lot of the time that just happens with subtitles. Like, if it's a really normal sentence that doesn't call... You know, if it's just like, what are you doing or something? Like, I don't need to read the whole thing. Once I see it, it's like, ah, all right, I registered. Yeah, okay. I know what's happening. At thing. A too. If I was to cross a bridge, okay, maybe I'm projecting from my own mind. At one point, watching movies with my audience, I got into the habit of watching every single movie with subtitles because it was just, it's so easy. Sometimes movies are mixed poorly, et cetera. Um, so I started to watch every single movie with subtitles. Um, I, I read something. It might have even been a tweet or a Reddit comment where somebody's like, oh, if you're watching uh, with subtitles, you're not even really paying attention to movies, some shit like that. Um, and I tried after that, I tried to make a deliberate effort to not watch things with subtitles anymore. And I don't know, I just felt like when I didn't, that I was more like, I'm not just reading a sentence, I'm hearing like a line delivered from an actor. And it's a, it fundamentally feels like a different thing to me. But maybe you guys, I mean, maybe you're, maybe that doesn't inhibit your guys' ability to like, you watch Maybe the, everybody you know, knows 99.91 yeah. percentile uh, English. Yeah, maybe. Or, or maybe it's just a different way of engaging different. with it, where I feel like if, yeah. I'm, if I'm reading text, it just, it feels different than like I'm listening for the next word the person is saying, and then I'm absorbing it that way, versus like, okay, I read the whole line, and now I'm watching the actor deliver well, it. Yeah, so I mean, it's a really different thing. Yeah. You don't really need to like yeah. explain the reason why there would be any disconnect. Like, if there's a disconnect, there's a disconnect, then that's that's the end of it. And I mean, ultimately, so I mean, everybody should be making decisions about like what is the most optimal way for them to immerse themselves in the story. At the end mm -hmm. of the day. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, I've, like, Adam, I, I you're, found... you're very wrong on everything. No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Adam, defend. I found, I, I found that I used to get like a little bit annoyed by certain contexts of subtitles. So, mm -hmm. if you know, if I read the line before the character says it, yeah, then kind of you know, especially if you're Can watching be. like a stand-up special. Um, exactly. But over time, I just like after just watching everything with subtitles, I'm so used to it that I don't even notice it anymore. That like mm -hmm. in my mind. Like, even if I read the subtitle first, I'm still saying it, like, in generally a way that, like, the character <laughs> is, like, saying it anyway, if that makes any sense. I know it's, like, impossible to, like, it, accurate, accurately predict that, but, like, right. 
there's no there it, it doesn't feel like there's any sort of like difference in terms of like uh me reading it and them saying it it's like it's a very subconscious uh effect that's that's taking place you know it's, it's like Do i'm not thinking like... about it at all I'm curious, and when you see movies today in cinemas or theaters, whatever, I don't know, European American, um, mm -hmm. when you go to the movies and you watch a movie, does it? do you feel like you're missing out on something if there aren't subtitles? Do you find like hearing impaired movies where they have subtitles? Or oh, it depends on the movie. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. I'm, I mean, like, I, I would prefer to watch every movie with subtitles. Um, mm -hmm. I would prefer for there to be like more options for that in theaters. At Cannes Film Festival, they have uh, like everything like French and English subtitles, which was interesting. I was going to say, um, I... I just want to quickly bolster, like, I do kind of feel the exact same way, and oftentimes, I've seen so many both not and on subtitles, I'll usually find something I missed. I'm like, oh, they said that, not the other thing, because there's some words that... Great example is the, uh, uh, when you were covering the Lion King, and you, you there was that part with <laughs> oh, the yeah, fucking... Oh, yeah, I was... I thought, I thought he said something about, um... Norse, uh, what was what was one of the things? Because like, I was trying to listen to it over and over yeah. again because I couldn't figure another it out. Another good Norse tradition, or whatever. yeah. And I was like, "There's no fucking way." So I was, was talking about Norse traditions, <laughs> like, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that, there are sometimes where subtitles are like absolutely necessary. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like, it's. I mean, I will say, going like if you're watching a movie that was made before like 2000 and fucking five or something. Like the mixing on the audio is all very clear. Like they're clearly meant to be heard. I don't know why it became more fashionable for like more <laughs> modern films to where sometimes I guess we're just not supposed to know what they're saying here. <laughs> like I think Nolan even went as so far as to say for like Interstellar, he's like, well, sometimes you're not supposed to hear the dialogue. It's supposed to be an emotional experience. It's like, okay, well, there are like key plot points being revealed right now. What do you mean I'm not supposed <laughs> yeah. to know what the guy's saying on the bed <laughs> when he says he actually did do all the research for the time thing and it was a dead end? I have to know that. What the fuck? The is, uh, uh, yeah. I guess there's a balance because like it's always highlighted the social network when they're in the club and they actually have to kind of like yell over the music. Oh, I love that. I love well, that. I, I love that too. And it's like, I guess you could argue that you might lose some information, but I guess Yes, it's a balancing act between clarity and authenticity. So like, well, you know, uh, yeah, that's, that is such a, that, that's such a delicate balancing act. That scene absolutely. is because like you have to make it so that it it sounds natural enough that they're talking over it. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like even without subtitles, like you can you can still tell what I they're saying so. in that scene. Yeah, um, there is a, a, a unless you have ahead. like weird speakers that you have the bass boosted on them or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, this is something horror movies maybe do. I don't watch a lot of horror movies uh, or spooky movies or suspense sorts of things. But after we watched uh, Underwater, I uh, watched it with my folks later. And when my mom liked it, now we watch this in a, a on a TV, you know, the old fashioned way. No, the old fashioned way movie theaters. The next uh, old fashioned way. And my mom liked that movie. But my dad, he said he didn't like that movie because the sound balancing was so off where he couldn't hear what characters were saying. And then when the little voom, the stinger music would hit, it would be like overly loud uh, otherwise. Yeah. So I wonder if that's a thing horror movies do. Um, I know the movie we were. Uh, what was the, I know we were watching one movie in particular where it was like that, where we were. Was it Resident Evil? It was Resident Evil 3 uh afterlife where we couldn't hear like any of the dialogue Dude, all of super quiet uh, and then all of the is four rags apocalypse yeah get it right apocalypse all right I'm but also so paul ws anderson's connected. fucking mixing i don't know if it's his or whoever he fucking hired but like the mixing throughout the resident evil movies was terrible Do you remember we used to like crank it up and crank it down every time the difference between an action scene and a talking scene oh, was... god yeah yeah that shit when you've got like huge differences in dialogue and action is so obnoxious it's not I good hate it you know? mm-hmm it's really anyway, annoying. Maybe I've they got to, I've got to run and uh, do a bunch of uh, oh, wait, voice you didn't, over recording today. You didn't, so defend, just to, like, you, in, but... you didn't defend your musical what? honor. Oh, my music? What do you mean? What? Do you think uh, the soundtrack... The, no, uh, well, <laughs> Death, talking about someone, apparently someone thought that the soundtrack was uh, pretty bad. Well, like, not bad, mediocre. Uh, yeah, well, um, uh, no, I didn't even say that. But <laughs> I, um, uh, I think that melodically... Um, I would have liked something a bit more from the soundtrack in this film. Um, my favorite soundtracks that exist that exist are ones that uh, after I'm done watching the movie, I can still remember them. I can still have them in my head. There's there's not that much of that in this film aside from Claire de Lune by uh, Debussy. Debussy. Um, Claude the, Debussy. Yeah, the classical How? rendition, and it's like that one's very memorable, right? Um, the score is not bad by any means, 
Uh, the score is very ambitious. I love how many different genres that they tackled with this film, and it matched what was happening happening visually. It was very complimentary for the most part, but I still feel like, you know, if we're going to reach like what I consider to be like the top echelon of like a score, um, it's something that I would prefer to be, you know, memorable um, in terms of like a melodic, melodic structure. I guess, so I could um, be like, oh, I can, I could like sing it right now, but I, I can't do that with this film. That's like the one thing that's missing is like being able to do that with the score. How much would it be worth if you had something that was basically almost perfectly complementary to the film? Like it was absolutely like the the best you could have done in terms of pairing the music with the film but it was never in a way that could be like a track that you could take out, listen on its own and hum to like and appreciate as its own thing. Like you kind of can't remove it from the film. How much would that be worth? Um, well, I don't, well, I mean, it's exactly as it's worth in this movie, I guess. Like that's the one thing that's missing is. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I, guess, it's like, I, I don't know like how to Hans answer Zimmer that. Way of, it's the Hans Zimmer way of composition, right? Like, there's very few songs. Anybody that says anything different is a cope, including anybody here, okay? The reality <laughs> is, is that Hans Zimmer, for all three Batman movies, there are very few songs, if any, that you can take out of the film and listen to. Like, oh, this is such a cool song to listen to. Like, maybe for a couple of you really like it. But the reality is, is he composes alongside the film, and it's meant to be and sure that way. So it's a far different thing than, like, the, you know, the archetypical examples, John Williams, who you have melodies for days that you'll remember for the rest of your life. Every single person in here, even if you haven't seen the movie, probably knows the Harry Potter melody or Indiana Jones or Jaws or Star Wars and you will remember these melodies for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, it's definitely that, different um, ways of composing I guess them. The thing is though is like uh, a lot of the Star Wars music is very much composed to like match the scenes but I, for whatever reason those songs are a lot easier to separate from uh, from their original sort of purpose and context and listen well, to Well, it's different own. for Star Wars. So when Williams composes, Williams is writing very strong melodies. These are melodies that right. he's writing remember. themes. Yes, very thematic, uh, very much match characters and everything. Yeah. Whereas for somebody like Zimmer, or maybe arguably... Um, something sorry i don't remember this guy this composer's name um it's it's a lot more subtle and kind of in the background and you're not running away from this with a strong melody to sing it's just not how it's, it's just not it, the nature of what you're composing. Yeah. i i know exactly what you're saying and i'm not um i'm not suggesting that there need to be like full fleshed out themes in this film mm -hmm. even with you know uh, even with the dark knight i can i know exactly what track is playing when uh you know the joker starts his monologue there's that like the it's almost violence. like they're holding like a bow yeah. sideways to the violin. Yeah, exactly. Like, like yeah. that's memorable. That doesn't even necessarily have like a melody to it, but it's like so memorable. It's so like distinct. Um, whereas yeah, this sure. film, yeah, it's emulating a lot of different genres, and I love that. Um, but each each of the tracks in this film, except for maybe the one at the beginning that they used in the trailer, which I found pretty, I I like that one a lot. Um, yeah. But every other track, aside from the classical rendition, um, it's just missing a certain a certain flavor a certain something that would just you know help it really pop out more for me sure. um and it's not even it's not even a bad score i'm just like this is where i'm talking about what's preventing it from being like literally i guess a perfect movie for me so uh it's not really it's not really a huge criticism um Fair it's okay yeah, i think, I think, I think we all still like you um ah <laughs> well i'm going to run and i'm going to i'm going to record a bunch of voiceover um there's uh i won't say uh i'm not gonna break your rule and jump forward but i will say the director plays a character and if you don't know who it is then i'll type it in chat and you can <laughs> say that later because it's pretty funny oh, I, uh, cool. um very big uh quentin tarantino vibes yeah. i believe is how people would uh, daniel stop. scheinert the, so he plays one of the characters and it's really funny so i'll type that in chat and let you reveal that when you get to it Wait. um cool have right. a good one. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for popping Later. in, dude. We'll catch you around. Later, yeah. man. Peace out. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Do you think since Adam was here for 15 minutes, he's going to give you guys a number score for the entire episode now? Uh, hopefully he gives us a six, something like that. Maybe above. I'm thinking <laughs> we've earned it. Um, though our soundtrack isn't very good, so I don't know. Um, all right, then. Let's just get I'm back, back on. from the loo. Oh, back did on. YMS County out? He just, just left. All right. He, was, he well, said, make sure Rags knows that I said goodbye. Oh, okay. That's awfully nice of him. Yeah. I hope that he, uh, I hope that he just does well doing whatever he's doing. Of course. So Did we resolve the subtitle issue. Oh, uh, look at that. He, he even typed it out for you. He said, yeah, bye, what Rags. A, what a Chad. That's yeah. Nice. What a mm. Chad. So.
Evelyn needs to go get the the right clothes for the lady. And turns out Wayman put them upstairs. He said they're happier there, and he put a little googly eyes on her. She's like, fucking enough of your stupid googly eyes. And um, while she's like basically ranting, she rants a bit. We'll we'll go with that in a second. Uh, just the camera is just slowly tightening in on um on Joy, just gradually losing like her passion for trying to get across what she wants regarding Becky. But if you listen to what uh, Evelyn says. She's, the, the googly eyes prompted to basically say, like, so fucking bizarre. Like, I try to solve all these problems that we're having in the in the simplest and quickest ways while Wayman's, like, fucking around, basically. And she says, like, do you know yeah. our auditor, he put a lien on this place, uh, like, I think for two years or something it's been on now. And she says uh, his reaction to that was to give her cookies. Cookies? Like, what the fuck? And um, she just talks about how she doesn't know how he would possibly survive without her at this point. And while she's explaining all that, he in the background on the on the cameras starts doing some crazy ninja shit. He's jumping around the, the whole the whole laundromat and um the cameras are like screwing up as well. It's, I think it says establishing connection. So I Go ahead. When I, when I first saw this, I of course I the, we we are we we learn about this later on. But when I saw this at first, I was saying this was a sad moment for me. I was like, oh, look at how hard he actually tries to do things. And it's just dumb <laughs> luck meant. Well, yeah, dumb luck meant just Evelyn didn't see how hard he was working. And then she looked back at the screen and then saw him goofing around at the very, very end and thought that was him. You know, and I was like, "Oh, that's that's really sad. That's unfortunate." Just really loves his job. <laughs> He's yeah. really into the job. <laughs> well, I, well, I, because we're just meeting him, right? So we don't really know much about him too much yet. So, like, if that was a thing about him, where he does that sort of thing, and she just unfortunately misses those kinds of, you know, that that effort that he puts in, and she only catches the very end when he's talking to customers like this. Then I was like, "Oh, that that's sad." That's unfortunate. Oh, what a what a marital tragedy that is. I mean, that's, turns out it was something else. But I was going to say that's an interpretation. But I think the music kind of uh, gets you probably closer to what it is, which is this is not normal. What's happening here? Um, right. Oh, I, yeah, it's not normal now. Um, and he pockets something into his little his little uh, fanny pack, um, and then he rushes back to the to the guy at the machine. It's just like hmm. Um, but yeah. All um, right. Just before we move on, though, is yeah. this uh, our podcast? Are we uh, are we pro or anti fanny pack? Because that's a that's a divisive accessory. I feel. I think after this movie, I'm pro fanny pack. I mean, yeah, it does seem like it has multiple purposes or uses, I should say. Uh, All right, because I'm I'm very on the fence. I don't I don't know how I feel about fanny packs. What do you need to carry with you as a guy? I, I, wow. I don't know. He needs like, a place I, to put all of his coins because you won't put them in his wallet. Because <laughs> I have, like, I've got my wallet, my phone, and my keys, and then sometimes like a thing for headphones. Destiny, and you're American. For... You can you can settle this conversation. So, d do you put your coins in your wallet, or do you put them in your pocket? Yeah, hey, we don't use coins here. I haven't used coins in like 20 years. Okay, that's some weird. Oh, Where are you from? Australia. You, Australia. Do you guys? Yeah. Okay. I don't know why. If it's in, like in Australia, in Europe, you guys have Not like one dollar and two dollar coins. Yeah, in Europe, uh, they've got like a million different fucking coins too. We do. Uh, yes. I don't know. Yeah, I think even if, in Canada, they have like toonies. They call it for like their two dollar coin. I don't know why. Yeah, in America, we don't do that shit. Okay, coins suck uh, here. Hypothetically, if you had coins, would you put them in your wallet, like in a little pot in your wallet, or do you put them in your pocket? I'd throw them at children. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that no was not they would go, they they would go if I really had to carry coins around, they would go in my pocket. I feel like I would destroy my wallet over time if I stuffed it full of coins. I would end up getting Man, up. stuffed oh, your wallet full of. What is with Americans? <laughs> is that what okay. you would do? Would you take out your wallet and it's just mat? It looks like it has fucking cancer. <laughs> <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> That's what it would look like. You would take your wallet, wallet out. And we're yeah. supposed to have nice folded yeah. bills. It's supposed to look good and have cards. But in your wallet, you take it and, and it's like all the leather is deformed. There's quarters falling out of it. Like, I don't understand how you would do that. There okay, are so first of all, out of your, your wallet's made of fucking paper mache. Like, what the hell is going on? Secondly, why are you stuffing it so full that it bursts? That's not what you're supposed to do. Oh, wait. So do you have like three coins with you? What are these to flip if you have a bet coming three across? Coins. Something? Three coins. Three coins in your wallet. <laughs> I have coins in my wallet Man. if there's any spare change that I get from transactions that require me to use money and that have like 95 transactions that, What transactions size drug purchases do you, are you required <laughs> to use cash? 
Well, so the thing is, you sometimes go to these like little convenience stores where they're like, "Oh, we got a ten dollar minimum on like the FPOS machine." It's like, oh, well, Fringy, right, we call those pay. we call those inconvenience stores. Uh, yeah, bro. Even in America, homeless people have card swipers on their phones <laughs> now. Okay, like I don't, I've never been to a place that needs you to use cash for like ten years. But well, yeah, this, I mean, uh, this, the homeless the people point, around here have Patreon point, accounts. <laughs> look, the whole point of this is that. It's, it's not a matter of whether or not you're going to need to use cash money. It's if, in the very rare moment that you do, hey, you got a little, like, a little pit part in your wallet, you can put the coins in, as opposed to having them in your, yeah, like, like, pocket. I will say, Fring, what you're wrong about is that in Australia and, and Europe, uh, we don't have plate-sized coins. Like, we can put several into our wallet without it actually giving yeah, you a cancer. How big are your coins, Fringy? I mean, are they two shields or something? So one well, of them yeah, does. One of one of them does have an emu on it, and it does have a like. Was that part of the treaty? Kind of like, they had to be on your money. <laughs> so we got five cent, part ten cent, uh, twenty cent, fifty cent, one dollar, two dollars. Five is like a little yeah. dinky. It's tiny. Ten cents a little bit bigger. Twenty cents is pretty big, and fifty cents is a chongus hexagon. Do you, do you uh, prefer really seeing cool. your monarch on the coinage or the birds you lost a war to on your coinage? Which of the well, so there's a lot of things because they're the, one and the same, right? <laughs> There's a platypus on our 20 cent coin. It's really cool. Oh, that's, and then that's I, pretty great. I think the $1 coin has a kangaroo on it because that's the one you're probably going to see. I, I'm actually now forgetting what they look like because I haven't had to use coins for like probably wow. over a year at this point. Yeah, we got what we got is we got like uh, on the 5 cent, I think it's like a, an echidna. 10 cents, I think it's like a plant. And then 20 cents is a platypus. 50 cents is a kangaroo. And a uh, emu holding a shield. See, that's fun. And one that's all very fun, I think. An emu holding a shield yeah. is a, a pretty. Well, that's decent our coat of arms. That's our like national coat of arms. Is the emu? Wow, they got you to do that. <laughs> that's that's, that's right. part fun. Of the that's cool. That was part of the treaty. I like I'm that. Just saying. I approve. But of I, the I do. The shield. I do agree with Destiny on the the coin thing. We, this is a discussion we I had know earlier. You, agree, you can't give it up. You yeah, can't you, admit that you, you both be wrong. I, I don't never, care if you agree with it. I would never voluntarily <laughs> take the wrong position. That seems very silly, and I don't think I would do that. But. You've, you are, you I mean, really like, I'm empathetic that. now towards like the fanny pack thing because you need to lug around. I guess like you know, fifteen pounds. Lug of around. Of, yeah, I get coins with you everywhere, I guess, in case you're, getting, you're running around getting all this change thrown at you from all your transactions, I guess. I'm sorry, how is 15 pounds worth of coins not filling the fuck out of your pocket, too? Your trousers are going to have Wait, fucking cancerous we don't have. We don't use, in the United States, okay, when you make a purchase, there's a little dish that sits on the counter, and it says, take a quarter, give a quarter. And you know what? If you have coins, you just throw them in there. You don't carry around change with us. That's just... Insane. Spoken like absurd. a true bourgeois one uh, percent. Yeah, bourgeois. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. You, you, I'm so bougie. Straight. They give me back like twenty four cents, and I'm like, <laughs> I keep yeah. the change, man. I'm a big spender. I'm on YouTube. I only okay? give quarters. I never take exactly. Quarters. Yeah. Well, there are nothing but pennies. Just pockets full of pennies, just sloshing. Back. Now I realize full of pennies. That's why a, that Britain like left America calling. behind. Just saying. <laughs> So anyway, that so was like the many packs here today. Uh, <laughs> Once we find out how they deal with how coins, many, we just left them. We were like, no. Nah. Depends on how many places you go that uh, require you to use at least ten dollars to purchase things. I guess is how much you want a fanny pack. So, does it not make more sense to have one dollar be like a coin rather than a note? You know, like what, does how does it make sense to have anything be a coin unless you're trying to hurt somebody with it? What, you can what, just build indefinitely. Is, well, I guess what I mean is you think of the natural progression of currency when, you know, things used to be like when rent was one dollar like a year, <laughs> you know, and then it gradually <laughs> escalates with inflation. It's in Arkansas, but... Does it make sense, you know, for it to be like a note instead of a coin? Does it deserve to be in that category? It's probably cheaper to manufacture, to, to make the money. It's probably cheaper to make it out of I guess, the, I guess the weird me, cotton, that, whatever it is that they make the, it out of. There's a level of, like, notes are like, ah, now we're in the big boy category. You know, $5, yeah, like, we're in the notes category now. Well, and one dollar real money. Like not, Here's a question, because I can lock you in, all right? You need, you know, you need to carry five coins with you for a whole week. Are you putting them in your pocket or your wallet? Put them in my pocket. I don't want to fuck my wallet up. Why would five <laughs> coins fuck you? What 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 wallet because do you it's have? Gonna be, it, I have a I have a nice. I got a thick ass. ass. It's have you got a wallet right here? It's got it holds my cards. It's a it's got a little magnet thing. It's a nice leather wallet. It's a good Wait, does it have wallet. does it have a place for coins in it? No, it doesn't. Well, then there you go. That doesn't apply. That's just your fault for buying a shit wallet. Why would I buy a wallet that has a purse inside of it? I don't understand why you would do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what, so why, can you guys even fit your wallets in your pockets? Are you like carrying these around slung over your shoulder or what? Jesus. <laughs> I, got, I, I sat somehow, our cultures figured it out. <laughs> 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 
Somehow like somebody miraculous. asked me, like, do you have a $5 bill? And it's like, let me check. I need to go sit down for a moment and take my wallet out and go through it. Like, Jesus. <laughs> unbelievable. I, okay. I don't they know why you strange find people, sorry, Destiny, but we, we keep them around. We humor them. It's all right. And the, But however, all of that being said, I think that there is something that we can all kind of unite on in that this is very, very good news. Baba, Babu for here in The Mandalorian Season 3. So I feel like everything... Finally, a character can star okay in The Mandalorian Show. That would be great. Finally. Yeah, Imagine right. posting something related to TV or film and thinking we would give a fuck if it wasn't about Morbius. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you should have said Babu Frick will appear in Morbius 2. <laughs> <laughs> Not only will he appear, but he's the main antagonist or protagonist. Rather. It depends he's, on the point of He's view. Morbius' as mentor. Morbius. We'll be Morbius. Bob be Morbius. Babu Frick. Bubble and then you have it on the poster. It's them staring each other down, like the Civil War poster. Yeah. One side you got Morbius morbid out, and then on the other side you got Bob Frick. And it'll Lighter. be Morbius, comma T O O. Morbius too. That. That's the fucking dumb and dumber subtitle, isn't it? <laughs> dumber two. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Anyway, all right, so. Yeah, she doesn't get through to her, um, and Evelyn just comes back down with the, uh, with the laundry. And so she just walks, uh, uh, Joy walks off to Becky and says, I'm gonna fucking kill myself, because she just can't get through to Evelyn. Um, and then she, she tries to explain to Becky that, hey, look, if, if we introduce you, and that fucking kills Gong Gong, okay, but if we don't introduce you, he's just gonna die later anyway. Um, which, <laughs> so... A bit rough, but yeah, uh, and she re doesn't realize she's saying that right in front of uh, Evelyn, who's listening. Uh, Becky can see her, but she can't. Uh, Joy. Um, and they have this like really, it, it's, it's just bobs back and forth really quickly. It's uh, us absorbing that she said that, then realizing that Evelyn heard her say that. Then we pan over and realize Waymond was listening, and he says, That's not very nice, honey. It just like has a little smile. And then we pan over and realize Gong Gong has actually woken up and he's come downstairs. It's like this. It just keeps rising in terms of things to solve or or, or address. Um, and right before all of that happened, Evelyn was just staring at the TV, enjoying the, um, I don't know if you know, it's a musical or whatever. Uh, it's just like two people dancing and singing, and she gets a bit lost in there, uh, which is, you know, just flaggable. It's 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 a commonality. She, she can daydream a bit. She just wants to get lost in things that aren't the life she's dealing with. Um, um, question, though, is, is this movie one they specifically made for this film or did they just recreate it i it assume it's completely made up i i haven't they shot seen... it for this movie because they do a gag later I, I don't I, 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 yeah that's <laughs> but yeah, did, every one of us has done it except for no, I, haven't. I still haven't done it you think i have you i i, I, I haven't mm. spoiled anything by doing that I um I, I'm fine with you guys making future references in terms of like this may come up later sort of thing. Like Fringy already said, you can say, "Hmm, interesting." Ooh, look at that highlight in the thing. I mean, everyone should know at this point we're only highlighting stuff that's going to be meaningful. That's really, that's really clamping down on my artistic vision, but well, uh, you're not Zack Snyder, buddy. You're not going to make miracles. No okay? one's Zack Snyder. No, no he's, he's Zack definitely Snyder. is. He's, he's, Zack Snyder. he's brilliant. Uh. So yeah, um, they just try and get Gong Gong back upstairs to give him his um, his food. But before they can do that, um, it seems that there's an opportunity here to uh, to 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 perhaps introduce Becky finally because um, he's she's there, he's there. It's all gonna work out, right? And so she walks up to him and says, um, "You know, Gong Gong, how is your airplane?" And he says, your Chinese is getting worse every time we talk. And she says, yes, yes. And he just goes, yes? Like, it's... And um, I think it's worthwhile at this point pointing out. That might be confusing for someone who's, I guess, like me, and doesn't know the differences between Cantonese and Mandarin. So it would be like, why... She was fluently talking with Evelyn earlier, but she can't talk to Gong Gong? And it's like, yeah, so... The way this works, or the way I understand it anyway is that Evelyn's family, as well as uh, Wayman's, are from uh, Gongyang in China, which is a district that uses Cantonese quite commonly, but um, Mandarin is the state-mandated language, or country-mandated, I guess, I don't know. Uh, the 
idea being that like that's used infrastructurally and educationally um like, like that's what everybody would be taught but at the same time there's going to be generations that are proudly going to maintain speaking cantonese and so what you have is gong gong only knows cantonese um evelyn knows cantonese and mandarin and she's fluent pretty well in english and that's the same for waymond and then joy is very fluent in english uh, really good with mandarin but not very good with cantonese um is does she speak Mandarin much this film, Joy? You, there's a couple of lines that she speaks to Evelyn in, and so I think it's safe to assume that she's fluent in it. Um, but I could I be wrong. So. When I view these things, I, so I might be either reading too much or too little into it. Um, I think when I view these like language conflicts or a lot of the conflicts that come up between the family, um, I kind of view this as Evelyn's existence in both worlds of... When when you do this thing where you are a first immigrant Asian family and you have children, um, oftentimes, especially depending on where you live in the United States, your children are very Americanized. Mm. Sometimes they don't speak the language very well at all. They'll have very American accents. They get American interests. And these things oftentimes, being very Western, will stand like in stark contrast to more traditional parents that um, either weren't immigrants or came over later like the father. So I guess I, rather than like thinking like hyper fixatedly, like was this like a Cantonese versus Mandarin language differential? thing or like she can't understand I, th I think i kind of view this more as just like um it's just another example of joy is just a very americanized girl that's kind of moving away from that traditional asian family thing and evelyn who is also in america like is still simultaneously trying to hold on to her daughter while also like appeasing her father and it's just kind of like highlighting that weird tension between the two where joy is like very much often like and is an americanized gay child that is very western and the father is still, like very traditional and they like literally can't even communicate with each other anymore yeah um this is this is something that I, I think that's that summarizes the actual point that they're going for in this film really well mm -hmm. which is that they've only created these divides with the the way that they speak to each other as i think representative just communication is really bad in this family compared to how it could be if they were all speaking one language because even becky mm -hmm. in this scene doesn't understand what any of them are saying except yeah. when they speak english um so it's just really dysfunctional on that level which is just one of many levels uh I just, um, I appreciate it, because I was reading into it, and apparently it is, to a degree, that complicated, because people can recognize that they are using, they're switching between um, Cantonese and Mandarin, and considering the production in this film, I assume that's on purpose. Um, well, do I don't know if most listeners would pick up on that, do you think? No, I don't. Uh, that's, that's, yeah. that's almost why I appreciate it more, the fact that they didn't uh, mm -hmm. signpost it. Instead, it's something mm -hmm. that you grab if you look into it, sort of thing, or if you just have the knowledge on hand. Mm -hmm. Um... And yeah, and then we get what I guess you could call the fact that they've already they're already bringing in their payoff. So um, she uh, Joy doesn't know the word for girlfriend in uh, well in in Chinese I guess I'll say for the sake of the uh, clarity. And so uh, her mum introduces Becky instead as a good friend, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's very like it's just it's just a how else you put it like if you're immersed already at this point it's pretty heartbreaking. It's just like ah that's the uh, not working out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, good, this is going to be a uh, Michelle Yeoh appreciation stream, along with many other actors in this. But man, her yeah. um, her face when she turns to look at Joy is like that of you know that was necessary because it's gone gone. But then it, it drops uh, relatively subtly, it subtly because of like yeah, that probably wasn't the right thing to do. But it's like it just it's it's just it just puts the problem down the road instead of having to deal with it, which is that she does not know how her dad will deal with the fact that it daughter is gay um which is easy to understand i would say but that, that'll just be something nice and established we're, even, we're moving on yeah even gong gong's subtle facial changes after uh uh, uh daughter's girlfriend's name i'm terrible becky. Names. becky becky even after when becky is like gives him a thumbs up it was nice to meet you he does the thumbs up back but then once he leaves he's, his face just kind of drops and he yeah, it every, looks like every every actor in this is good. And yeah, it's a stellar cast them. in this movie overall. Yeah. You can just sit there and watch them, you know. No, and I love the fact that we can draw so much out of their expressions. Uh, it's it sounds like the kind of thing we'd be like, well, of course, it's a movie, and I'd be like, even <laughs> some some filmmakers even don't by, really take advantage of it. I don't know. Yeah, even by better movie standards, this is impressive. Um, nothing just nothing's accidental. It feels like this is a very well-oiled machine with many, many moving parts, and they're all working in tandem with one another. Yeah, and so we've 
we're almost pretty much done with the foundation. Like it's 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 they've done a lot of work to set it up. And uh, um, Evelyn chases Joy outside because obviously it, Joy wants to leave now because because of, of all of that is is just that's like the worst thing she could have had as a result of all of this. And um, her mum is like, let's talk. I have something to say. And you know that both characters know what they should talk about, but instead she says, uh, "You're getting fat. You need to uh, need to be eat more healthy." It's a lie. And it's just like, I mean, yeah, but still, it's kind of not. Well, yeah, it's, it, it just sucks because right they they both know what needed to be talked about, and uh, yeah. yeah, just Evelyn can't bring herself to to say any of it, and um, so Joy leaves. And the scene even. is so well executed, and it needs to be right because this is the scene that creates the antagonist basically and kicks off the whole movie. I don't like, know what you're saying, like, John. I feel like you're, go, you're insane. I don't know what you mean. All women are <laughs> just talking gobbledygook here. But uh, she, I, I just like how like she's obviously had enough, and she's just, like storms out of the parking lot, and then she says that line, "You've gotten fat," and the way she plays off that, like she's just, oh, you really had to go there, right? F fuck this, and then just leaves, like, like so well acted, you know? You because I, I got the. I got the vibe of like you didn't go there. Like the this is you I know what we need to be talking about and you're not doing it. Yeah. Um uh oh, right, like avoiding the elephant in the room. I I just mean like it was like a needless insult and it's just like you pushed me enough inside the laundromat and now you're going to follow me out here and like stick that last knife in me like it could definitely be that Joy's perception, but obviously, I think with our understanding of Evelyn, she's just desperate to avoid the actual discussion. So she reaches for something that, if anything, is just really hurtful. But uh, you know, that's how it can go sometimes. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, that that hits you is just like above the ten minute mark, and that's it. The film yeah, is basically said yeah. like they, those are all her relationships as they currently stand, and we're back in the um, we're back in the room. With her, with the taxes, dad's eating cereal, and uh, Wayman's just asking her questions again, reflected in the mirror, just being like, "What are you doing? What are, What are you thinking about?" And um, yeah, I guess this, this will be a fair question for anybody who's seen this film. But when they put part one, everything on the screen, did that did that volume shock the shit out of you? Anybody? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it was the loud, volume yeah. of the music. Yeah, because it no, basically it, was, uh, yeah. it brings in and it's like Whoa! like it does yeah. like the big thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I just it's it's very obviously deliberate, right? Like this, the I I, I would take it at least the soundtrack, just the noise of her whole life. Just uh, that's what this is. That's how this, it's all within yeah. ten minutes. How fucking stressful all of that was. And for a ten minute opener, this film is dense. They yes. are not wasting time. Everything has a purpose. You're learning so much that the information per second that you're just soaking up is very very high. In ten minutes, they get you super invested in everybody involved. Everyone feels like they're real people. This is a very in multiple ways. It's relatable. It's very mundane at the same time. It's very down to earth. Um, they do a good job at establishing a lot, which is important. Very, very important. Especially because the film's going to go crazy soon. <gasps> well, yeah, that usually try to line up. Oh, go for it. Yeah, and it's something that I um, that I enjoy. So I think we everyone here has seen like Uncut Gems and Good Time, or unfortunately, no. I meant to see Uncut Gems, but I never did. Uncut Gems is on our list of things yeah. to watch. Whoa. It is a, it is a long, long list. I love Uncut Gems. It's great. You can see the Resident so, Evil movies though. So yeah, we've seen them. There is a yeah. So if you ever want to reference <laughs> those, nice. we're That's we're your guys for that. Yeah. Something that's really interesting. It's like a big difference between middle class families versus like working working class families in the United States. Is that for middle class families, there's a lot of time during the day to like think and feel and have conversations about your emotions and like you have like a lot of space between events when you're a middle class family at least in the United States. When you are at the bottom end of working class, you don't ever really have time to do any of that. Like every single thing you're doing in life is a grind. You don't have time to stop and appreciate things or have meaningful conversations with family members or resolve like complicated interpersonal conflict. You just, you, you can't really do that. Something that they do really well in Good Time and Uncut Gems and something they do really well in this movie is um, 
through through showing uh, like because there's no exposition or anything like that but just through showing like the life of just 10 minutes of this lady you very much get that vibe that when you're in these types of working positions it, everything is like barely held together and it always feels like everything's about to fly off but you're constantly trying to like um i guess the expression is spinning plates you're always spinning like three or four different plates at the same time trying to keep everything like and you're always barely hanging on i think they do a really good job at conveying that feeling by the time we get done with the first 10 minutes of this film yeah i, I oh. doubt that it was an accident that when you've got the frame there part one everything it's evelyn sitting there with the table full of her tax stuff all of the laundry, uh, all of like the customers' laundry everywhere, the house is messy. It's just like, yeah, everything is very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. and it's like that comes through clearly. In the, like the first 10 minutes basically lays down the groundwork for everything that you need to understand before the plot begins. Because the plot hasn't really started yet. You might be able to say that her life is like uh, she's a clay pot holding water and there's little, little cracks that everything's falling out and she keeps trying to plug them back up. You know, for every one, two more open, sort of thing. I don't know. It's, that, it's just that kind of life, and um, yeah. Let, I suppose now we're on the way to get an audit by the IRS. A very mm -hmm. commonly understood to be very easy and chill, normal thing to do. Nothing, nothing annoying about that at all. Um, so on their way in, they're taking Gong Gong with them, and so obviously we know he doesn't know. And they tell him that they're opening up a, um, a second laundromat, and um, uh, he says like. Fucking why? I think he like he almost like denigrates the idea, and uh, she says, or well, Wayman says, um, it's always nice to be needed. Plenty of people need their um their laundry done. It's always like all of his dialogue just reflects so much about the kind of person we're dealing with, which will become more and more important. Same for all of them. But he does. They make a point to show him noticing uh, quite an old couple who the the let's say the the passion for each other is still very much there, which is very important to consider because he's still intending to deliver a divorce to her as far as we know right um, and all, all visual no dialogue necessary like yeah so of course good. it says it all in that moment well and as they enter the um the elevator he says like maybe we should like you know once this is done go on some kind of trip do do something together which to me is just a sign that he he hasn't decided yet that he's gonna give her that divorce paper maybe he's still thinking looking for any excuse not to essentially um and uh, yeah, she just shoots it down, and so he's just like, uh... which uh, again, that's like the last moment in this film where everything's very, very grounded because you're just like, just reestablishing <laughs> all that sort of thing. But yeah. the second the elevator closes, Wayman does a weird thing with his head. He like goes down, then goes back up, and then he just has a complete disposition change uh, and starts speaking. I, th I I'm not sure if this is true, but this Wayman, the one we just have seen now. I think his English is better than the regular Waymond, because um, he's very straightforward, or at least he's more um, assertive and confident. That's that's like the biggest mm -hmm. thing you'll notice straight away. And uh, yeah, so for anybody who has no idea what's happening, basically, it's like um, I don't know how else to, to explain it. It's it's just like this happens in stories a lot. He basically is just another person suddenly, and he explains to Evelyn there's there's a whole bunch of shit going on that she needs to understand, and she needs to understand it quickly because her life is in danger, and it's. It's just like, dude, what? Because like you got everything else we've just got going on, and we're pre plenty invested. I I would argue a lot of people would be at this point in the family drama, but now we're engaging in like crazy sci-fi fantasy shit. And I think the film that comes up as most comparable for a lot of people would be The Matrix. Like, there's a whole world out there you're completely unaware of that's, that's going on, and it's kind of just like um, pretty baffling. I don't know about you guys, but it took me a while to um, understand everything about how it all works in this film um from everything wayman says and i'm pretty sure that's deliberate like he he gets out as much information as he can in the small amounts of time he has with her, this uh this guy which i guess we should probably refer to him as alpha wayman is the is the way to separate him out from our wayman um yeah you may refer to me as alpha rags whenever you wish oh great just i just want there that it the offer is out there stigma rags you mean mm -hmm. right like sigma balls no <laughs> uh i don't but yeah. know he um he pops on two earpieces for her and says like hold still and take a breath cuz you're about to have your life scanned and his uh, the phone her phone starts doing it as well presumably this is uh the earpieces were what he picked up earlier when we saw him on the camera and um the tech is like something that his team is sorting out from the other side of the of the universe, like hacking a phone, sort of thing. I assume that's how this works mechanically, but 
Um, she's not really taking it very seriously, and then it like activates and it just shows a summary of the biggest moments in her life that defined its path. Um, and yeah, it involves like meeting Wayman, going to America, opening the laundromat, and uh, her father abandoning her. And then. And they actually feel like snippets of a life lived, you know? Yeah. And not just rushed, pr like produced scenes to like. It's like, oh, this is just going to appear in the film in, for, in, for three seconds, so we don't have to like treat this as a serious production or anything. Everyone just get together in front of the camera, we'll shoot this quick. There's none of that. Like, it actually it looks really good, and the, the footage looks aged, and it looks like they did some de-aging on the actors that looks really good. Yeah, I think um, they try to gun for appropriate, like, like this 4 by 3 for a lot of the clips, because I guess that would be time appropriate. Um, yeah, and just the quality of the image. Um, it's just less than it is now. Yeah. Um... And yeah, yeah uh, like memory. we get clips of Joy doing like, you know, I can do whatever, I can say whatever the fuck I want to you or something like that. And it's just like, hmm, there's all these, the biggest important parts of her life regarding all the, the interactions with her family. And she's just blown the fuck away. And then uh, Wayman hands her the, on, the, on the back of a, of a sheet he was holding to use as instructions for her, the instructions to swap her shoes, uh, think about being in the closet that she walks by. And then press the button on her thing uh, when she thinks about that. But what he's unwittingly done that you can tell if, you, if you're just paying close enough attention, he's handed her the divorce document as well. She's written that on the back of, which um, yes, very naturally could have just easily happened because of the fact that he doesn't that, like Alpha Wayman doesn't give a fuck about what he's giving her the instructions on because there are bigger yeah, things to worry about. Something to write on. Simple as that. Yes, this is more important. Um. Yeah, and you know, they, they do it really quick, and there's so much shit going on, and lots of flourishes for how it's directed, and then he just says, like, I'm not going to remember anything in a, in a moment from now. You know, good luck. And then just goes back to normal, and it's a uh, regular Wayman, and he's like, wow, what a yeah. fast elevator. Oh, what a fast elevator, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, it's such a, like, uh, th this is the fun of fiction, I find, right? Because it's just, like, you get the everyday stuff that's definitely um, endearing and binds you to it, but then you're just like, now let's have fun that we can't do in real life. Like, crazy sci-fi shit. Why not? And Look, yeah. This movie manages to feel like a, an indie movie, like a low-budget indie movie, and a huge Marvel thing at the same time. Like they definitely are strategic. Yeah, I feel. They made really strong use of their budget. I don't know what else to say about that. Like, uh, yeah. And yeah, like you said, I think that's by design. Like, they wanted that feeling it works so well oh yeah especially and the first time they go quote unquote cinematic they're definitely showing off almost and after yeah. our first 10 minute sort of sequence when we see how you know depressive she is and how troubled her life kind of is and uh, and we really feel for her there's almost this like you you want the wacky crazy things to happen because you almost feel like we need to get her we need to shake things up for her and get her into a better place. We need to do something for her. So these kind of crazy moments for us, it's almost, it's just like, well, this will be good for her. Something new, something that's out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. And then we get introduced to uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's Deirdre. Um, and the line we introduce, we introduce with is she says, uh, Mrs. Wang, are you with us? Which... I guess I appreciate it. throughout the whole film she just pronounces her name wrong, which is a nice touch, I guess, because like I think you would intuitively read the name and say Wang when uh, they all pronounce it as Wong, like because that would be how it's accented, I guess. Um, I like that because uh, Deirdre is quite a character. Um, the more we we get She's through great. it, cause yeah. At first, I assumed from this that she was going to be quite one dimensional, just the asshole IRS agent, which she kind of is for at least a little bit. But we'll we'll go over it. Um, that is one dimension, yeah. So, yeah, she basically Hilariously explains, miserable and frumpy. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, well, funnily enough, actually, I think I have the image for this. They, um... I was checking out discussions on this film, and apparently, uh... The director, or maybe even costume designer, they were looking for, like, an authentic look for, um... Uh... An IRS agent. And apparently they, they they searched for it online. That was the way that they got their ideas for the um uh, the look. And apparently, like so, someone on whatever discussion threads for this did the same thing, and they came up with this this lady. And it's like, man, that that actually looks quite like possibly where they got the inspiration from. 
Oh, holy definitely. shit. Yeah. Oh, look, if, if, if I... <laughs> Let me, try, let me go to IRS agent and just Google it and see if I can just scroll down and find it. That would be interesting. But yeah, wow, that's really interesting. It's, uh, what are they? What does an IRS agent look like? I'll Google it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, what's really neat, I think, is that Jamie Lee Curtis is pretty damn good as well. She she commits pretty hardcore to this role, even though it's absolutely arguably pretty embarrassing. Um, but uh, I really, it, it, I've always appreciated her in movies when she pops up, but um, it was just nice to see her here as well. So, she goes over the problem here, and that is that uh, their finances are all fucked because she's been trying to get loads of tax write-offs, um, Evelyn, by claiming lots of things, like her being um, a singer, a novelist, a chef, a teacher, a singing coach, and a Watsu technician, which is like aquatic therapy, which I think is hilarious that... That's how far it's gone, and so obviously the IRS are just like, this is bullshit at this point. And um, earlier when the guy was asking for his accurate change, because uh, she gave him change for his, his 20 getting stuck in the machine, um, she actually says to him, like, we'll give you interest next time, um, because we're, we're, we're not doing so good right now. So she's been trying to charge a little extra, if you will, from customers while also trying to get tax write-offs, meaning they're just, they're in serious trouble, um, debt-wise. It's unfortunate, of course, but yeah. It's I like think a, something that's also kind of cute here, with all the reference to the other careers, it's very subtle, but in a way it kind of foreshadows a lot of the rest of the movie too, right? Yeah. Because like, right now it's a joke that yeah. it's an obvious fraudulent thing, that like, okay, yeah, you're a singer, you're a blah 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 blah, but um, maybe that'll be relevant later on. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, she uh, she starts getting so frustrated with the whole conversation that she starts to wander, and then she thinks about looking at the um, the instructions and starts actually doing it. Uh, which um, sends her into the to the closet in a different like. So the the visual. This is what I was talking about that they use in the trailer. She, like it splits her like glass style um, into two different universes at once, which is just. Probably as straightforward as you can get as a visual for helping people understand what's probably happened here, which is that her consciousness is now spread across two different worlds at once. Um, one where she decided to go to the janitor's closet, and the other where she didn't. Um, and in the janitor closet universe, she's able to talk to Alpha Waymond, who's currently there. And he uh, gets to explain a little bit more, but at the same time, this is like the first time we've uh, done this, so her mind isn't exactly dealing with it very well. And we get a lot of really cool camera flourishes that I really like. And they do this a couple of times, I'll try and point them out. So, she's like in the universe, as you can see on screen, with, with Deirdre. But then she's pulled out by William and in her universe until it pans over and she's with him in the in this one. They make like the, the, the element that uh, takes you out of your current world appears in yours to drag you out. They do that a couple of times. And I just think it, it's a really nice way of making it um, seamless, I guess. They didn't have yeah. to. Great use of glass. And, yeah. And uh, in, in camera effects. Like, uh, I watched a little bit of BTS on this, and they, they did practical in camera effects whenever they could. And CG is used as, like, a, an augmentation, you know, to, like, whatever they can't achieve practically, which I always appreciate. That's how CG should be used, you know. And uh, it's just good that Evelyn is such a, a fun character because uh, Wayman is like, you know, the world is at stake. We need your help. And then she says, um, no time to help you. Very busy today. Like, after everything that just happened to her, that's all she says. Like, I'm very busy. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's almost like that's her default reaction to a lot of things. Yeah. Like, no, I'm just busy. Yes. I'm just, I just, I'm busy. I can't do it. Fate of the world. Yes. Yeah, sure, I'm busy. This fucking crazy absurdity. And she's just like, eh, let's see. I got enough to think about. I don't want to do this multiverse shit, whatever yeah. the fuck this is. Yeah. And, and yeah, another thing I love about it is how generic it is at this point and uh, storytelling wise, right? So Wayman just says, there's something that's destroying the universe. It's going to end all of them. You're the <laughs> only one that can stop her. I've been searching for you for ages. It's such a like, uh huh. I'm the chosen yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right. Yeah. Why not? I guess. Um, yeah, I just, I just love that. That's where we sort of start with like the craziness. But um, yeah, uh, uh, th this is like she keeps splitting back and forth, and it's like costing her um, the IRS's agent's patience because she comes across as vacant, like and just disrespectful and stuff. And um, 
at one point, um, she summarizes her problem as, like, even if they don't uh, put her in jail, she's going to be ta uh, she's obviously going to have to pay a huge fine for gross negligence. And then Evelyn says uh, later on, well, she says at that point, you're always trying to confuse us with, like, huge words. And then the IRS agent's like, you were supposed to bring your daughter, remember? And it's just, like, reminding you of how that's fucking not a possibility with everything that's happened. Um, yeah. But on top of that, we then cut back to the other universe, and she asks Alpha Wayman what gross necklaces are. Which, uh, is so wonderful necklaces. little misunderstanding. Um, and yeah, um, he basically tells her, uh, both in both universes, Alpha Wayman tells her there is nothing more important about uh, than than what is happening in this universe right now, and uh, Deirdre also says there's there's nothing more important than the conversation we're having right now, and uh, mm -hmm. she's presented with basically a choice to commit to one or the other, and she just says I'm thinking because um, she gets dis what I like about this is she gets so distracted because Wayman basically explains to her that like this is um, this is every failure in your life, every missed opportunity, all of it has been leading to this moment. This is this is where everything has brought you. And she like really appreciates that and like smiles at him because it's just a nice thing to hear that like it was all for something. Yeah. Yeah. Which um yes. feels like that's pretty heavily sort of indicating that a, a theme that's gonna be thoroughly explored going forward. Yeah, he says like with every passing moment you fear you've missed your chance to make something of your life. I'm here to tell you. That uh, everything has led to this. Don't let anything distract you. And it's like, it's like the first thing he says. I think that really convinces her. Like, wait, maybe I should take this a bit more seriously. Um, but before she even gets a chance to commit, uh, someone bursts. It was trying to burst into the room, and Alpha Wayman gets his fucking neck broken. And uh, talk about like just raising them stakes straight away, and getting us to believe the fact that what he's talking about at least has some merit. And, uh, yeah, she gets her head knocked in by, like, a, a pipe, I think. By, um... Yeah. Well, funnily enough, is Deirdre as well. <gasps> oh my goodness. So at this point, I mean, it doesn't stop here, but, like, there's so much you just don't understand about how any of this could possibly be working. Um, and it's kind of the nature of, of any story that's unraveling, because it keeps you going with them. Just fun stuff to not understand. But I was going to say as well, another flourish for like what I was talking about with converting them from one universe to the other. Like Deirdre just stands up in between them and says, Mrs. Wang, with a, sub to a spotlight on her. And then it cuts back to the universe. Like you get fun stuff like that where stuff that doesn't belong in the one universe appears and it's actually yeah, just I mean, a visual. Yeah, they mix together and they use the visuals to imply that in a lot of different ways between the mirrors and the and how the audio just gets kind of caught between the different versions. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's good to do that sort of thing because, of course, you know, Evelyn's really confused. And so, you know, we kind of get to share in that confusion. Things aren't quite lining up as they should. So yeah, make us feel as the protagonist does. It's helpful to do mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Share the journey. Uh, and so, yeah, she's like screams when she's hit by the pipe and she goes back to the normal world and everything's pretty normal. Uh, it's just, just, just. Chill, and so um, Deidre asks her to sit down and says, all right. Everyone's looking at her, yeah. You got, um, you got until 6 p.m. to resubmit, because this, this is not, this is all, like, they've made mistakes with their submission, and she's going to give them a chance to resubmit, which uh pretty kind of her. And it looks like she attributes that to the fact that she's got a big uh, container of cookies next to her, and she thanks uh, Wayman for them, which is just... Pretty interesting thing about since earlier she said that's like bullshit. Why would you even try that? Not um, even twenty four hours to go through all those receipts, <laughs> mountains of receipts. That's the thing. I assume what she's referring to is resubmitting what needs to be a tax write off. Okay. So like, don't lie or supply the proper justifications for the things that you're trying to use as tax write offs. Because um, there is a poster in her laundromat that says that she uh, uh, she she does singing lessons or speech lessons or whatever so she probably is trying to find more ways to make money but she might not have the proper documents to like incorporate it into her taxes i guess i'm not sure what i understood to be the essence of like the fraudulent element is that she keeps confusing business for pleasure right which is like totally understandable i think for someone like her because like because they're both one in the same for her, she kind of like lives in that laundromat. Yeah, could just be a total uh, 
Yeah, either that or, or a total just not quite understanding how taxes work, especially if you have a business and you have business expenses and you have all this stuff going on. Not necessarily maybe simple for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, and she's all work, no play. It seems to be her existence uh, right now as well. Not going to help. But um... I didn't. I didn't really get like a dis deliberately deceptive practices vibe. What I was getting was like she made an honest mistake about what was business, what was pleasure, and she shouldn't have written off this thing. I think I felt like it was pretty mean, deliberate. I was going to say like, when they have yeah, her I saying that she's got the the water thing, water therapy. It's mm -hmm. like so she's made that up, surely. I assume. Oh, okay, fair enough. Or yeah. maybe not made it up, but like I guess like for. If you do taxes in the United States and you're self-employed, kind of like one of the big memes is like, how much can you write off? Yeah. It's like a business expense. So like yeah. if I, you know, like if I go, if I fly to go visit my mom and dad, maybe I like do some emails and then I'll tell the IRS like, well, that was a business trip. I was working, you know, it's like one of those things where like, <laughs> maybe it's not like 100% fraudulent, but you're like, you're pushing as hard as you can into it, um, which I think is pretty consistent. All tax fraud. Yeah. Of course, obviously, uh, never, never, um, never tax fraud uh, advocation for here. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it kind of fits with the theme of her character of like basically trying to push everything off as much as she can. Yeah, and even if it's like a little bit can. of lying. Yeah, like this is my daughter Joy's friend, Becky. You're like, hey, Iris, like I do, you know, this is all my businesses. Like it's just kind of like kicking the can down the road indefinitely without actually. It's not about being malicious. Really. I'm yeah, sure right. about that, yeah. I don't think Evelyn is, like, a mastermind of trying to get as much money as she... Because this is the thing, I think she's genuinely trying to make it work at the laundromat. Yeah, of course. Failing. Yeah, for sure. Um, That's a great point. Makes sense. So what I quite like about this as well is that they've got that big basket she came in with, the, the one she's wheeling around. She's got all of her tax notes in there and all the receipts and just everything to do with her submission. Um, she's walked off now with Gong Gong because she's just stressed out and panicking as a result of all this universe splitting shit meanwhile um it's obviously on uh waymond to grab the the taxes in the basket but he spots that she's dropped the uh the rules for or rather the the directions for how to get into the other universe unfortunately he sees it for what it is which is the divorce papers and so he thinks that she's been acting really fucking weird because she's read that now and so that reading right. that makes him panic, and he forgets the um, the tax submission, which is something that um, some people might not pick up because it, it can it can explain what's about to happen next a little better. Because this is all very much so much miscommunication between everybody that causes something big to happen. So it's happening quick. It's very quick. It is, things yeah. happen. It's 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 a it's a very appropriately paced series of events. And he says, "I missed like, that detail." Yeah, the assumption that she read it. That's that's cool. So he's he's like, I know why you're acting strange, and then she she assumes he's saying as Alpha Waymond that I know like you you've now understood this a bit better, and so she's like, what are you talking about? And then he shows the <laughs> the document in such a way that she can see the the rules that he can see the divorce paper side of it, <laughs> um, and so it means different things to them, as, uh, which is a fun little little like way of doing that, but obviously it doesn't last very long because they figure out. Well, yeah, can I very comment yeah. on this? I fucking hate it when entire shows or movies are based on a stupid fucking misunderstanding like this. I'm so happy that they did this and then they cleared it up in like, I think like... Yeah, they clear it up straight away. Yeah. I hate it when they're like... And everybody's seen those episodes of sitcoms or movies where it's like, the person's like, I don't have time to explain. And it's like, no, you do. Like, take like 10 <laughs> seconds and explain it and you'll fix the whole movie. Why would you not yes. explain this right now? Um, yeah. I'm Use so happy words. this wasn't like a misunderstanding that went on for the entire movie. And I'm glad it was like a thing and it happened and it was okay. Jesus. Yeah, no, that's one of our big problems with, uh, like I was saying earlier, from that show is like people, you have brains and you have words, use them. You can oh, clear God, this yeah. up very quickly and efficiently if you would just, if you would just talk and just explain things. Well, yeah, you so want for whatever, because writers want a plot to happen. To give you context sucks. for that, uh, Destiny, because I'm pretty sure you'd, you'd understand this. So, like, the, the premise of that show is you get caught in a in a bind where whenever it goes down to nighttime, the, the vampires come and kill you, and there's people trapped in a car outside in a forest. They have to get into houses with talismans to be safe from the vampires, but that's all new information to anybody who gets there. They arrive mm -hmm. at daytime and crash. All of the characters who are aware of the vampire shit don't tell them anything until the vampires start scraping at the RV from the outside. And then they're like, so... There are people who arrive at nighttime, don't let them in. 
-hmm. And it's just the most, like, why the fuck wouldn't you have told him how everything works way ahead of time? Because now, it's just funny, because you picture yourself in that sort of situation, just like, um... Like, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go, and, yeah, it's very frustrating to see characters yeah. just, just not behaving with any know, sort of just, urgency when lives are on the line. I also don't know about you guys, but just, like, if someone was like, oh, there are vampires out there, I'd be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> sure there are. Yeah. Anyway, uh... Yeah, so she says like you, you're you, the, you were in the elevator, and then he's like, yeah, I was in the elevator, because he's just fucking confused. Whatever she's saying, um, and then Deidre is seen getting up in the background, looking fucking furious, and uh, you might be like, well, wait, why is she so angry? And it's like she's carrying the the, the basket, and the whole point is that Deidre's annoyed because she gave them a chance to resubmit, and they haven't even taken back all the stuff they need to resubmit. So it's like they didn't listen to her in any way, shape, or form. Um, and you know IRS agents, they're not exactly a forgiving people already, so she's, uh, she's like... We at EFAP, we love the IRS yes. and all of its agents. Yeah, I, sorry, I meant they are totally a forgiving people. She was just, she said her last, last draw, alright? Enough. Sure. And, um, yeah, uh, it's, it's funny because this dialogue, like, Evelyn's saying, I'm not ready to fight, and then, uh, Wayward's like, well, maybe we have to fight, like, because obviously they're just talking about completely different things, but, uh, yeah, it's like, um, He's kind of because we're not sure as an audience exactly what Deirdre is coming for. I think you can easily forget because it's relatively not signposted the um the resubmission stuff. So it might be that this is just Deirdre's like the one from that other universe we saw, and she's actually coming to kill our characters. And so it's you know it's it's time to to face your fear or whatever. And um obviously the dad's been listening to their conversation, but he can't make out what they're saying because they're actually spending a lot of it in, uh, pieces of it in English, and so he's just like, why are you bickering? Why aren't you dealing with all this shit that's happening in this building? And, um, and he says, like, all you ever do is run away from your problems. Which is, this is intentional, right? The, um, the reason why, I think, did you mention this, that the dad thinks that, I don't remember if you mentioned this explicitly, but the dad thinks that they're here because she lied to the dad and said, we're applying for a, a license to expand our business. We're going to buy another laundromat. Yeah. So I think she's trying to intentionally keep him in the dark about the tax troubles by speaking English, by obfuscating as much as yeah. possible. She doesn't want her dad. She to wants really him talk. to think that things mm -hmm. are going well. She wants to kind of impress yeah, um, him and, well, you know. It's just a good example of, um, you're communicating it's something that's like pretty easy to miss the first time around, but you're communicating a lot about what's going on in her head right now, just based on her decision, like what information she's going to tell him, what she's going to admit, and like how she's even going to convey it, like which language she's using. Mm -hmm. Subtext, strong. Oh, really strong, because uh, uh, he... Well, we'll get to it in just a sec. I actually, I gotta show the payoff first, which is fucking great. So, you have an IRS agent, Jamie Lee Curtis, walking up to her to tell her she's done something wrong. She just pushes past Wave and fucking punches her. It's just like... <laughs> like what? And then, uh, I think, what, Rags, when we were watching it, it's like, you assaulting an IRS agent? It's just like, yeah, you're fucked now. <laughs> like, yeah. Um... Yeah, and of course, Wayman's just beyond shocked, but, um... Before she, like, what I really liked about this is that she would address that situation, she would talk about the split universes and how he did it, but Wayman makes clear to her he's divorcing her, and the second he does that, all of that shit doesn't matter anymore, and she just focuses on him. Um, and I quite like it, they do this a couple times in the movie, like the, um, the interpersonal drama, because it's just that potent and that meaningful to the characters, that it can actually... Uh, have them temporarily forget of the surrounding area being like, you've got likely a security force coming to stop you now. You're probably going to go to jail for what you just did, on top of the fraud that she's going to accuse you of, or, or sort out uh, meticulously with what you've got as your submission. On top of the fact that you've had someone tell you that the multiverse is coming to an end or something, and you're the only one that can stop it. All this shit's going on, but when she reads that he's divorcing her, uh, it all goes away temporarily, I guess. And, man, Michelle Yeoh's performance again uh, yeah, the both of them pull you back into that uh, interpersonal stuff really well. Um, again, I would, yep. I wish I could just play it, but I, YouTube don't let me do that. Before this, when she's still talking with Jamie Lee Curtis, and she's like jumping between that and the scene with uh, Wayland in the closet, like she's she comes back to the exchange with Jamie Lee Curtis with a genuine sense of terror, like. Like, you can see, like, she's so scared in her eyes. Like, what the fuck is going on? Like, I can't handle this. Like, uh, 
I feel a lesser actor would have just been like played it with just kind of a cheesy bewilderment other instead of just like actual dread like she did. Like this is so destabilizing. Like I don't understand what what the fuck is real anymore. Like it's we have um, just re- really well done. Yeah, it's of, a lot of. I was gonna say it's in a terms, lot of. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> in terms of characterization, I love the fact that the first thing she says when reading that it's a divorce is "Who gave this to you?" <laughs> just that she wouldn't believe for a second that Wayman would divorce her. Um, and then of course he says nobody gave it to me, but. Go ahead. I'm saying there, there's a there's so much happening, in such a small amount of time, and so much of it is strange that you can it it justifies kind of their delay and their why why they kind of linger for a little bit and sort out this sort of thing. And it's something that a lot of shows just don't do. It's something a lot of well, yeah, movies yeah, just don't do. It's like it's sometimes like really hard to justify a moment where characters can just talk, but right now you've got a crowd of people surrounding Deirdre, making sure she's okay, and she's calling security, and security are on the way. Like, there's no... You could have someone try and, I guess, pin Evelyn down, but she's clearly yeah, just the, standing talking to somebody now, so... Yeah, the world is operating like it totally should all around them, because they're not having the personal drama that she is, and she is, so that's why she's delayed. It's not like people are... D- hanging around casually when there's something very, very important to do for no reason whatsoever. And I appreciate that she's about to start the sentence, your brother gets a divorce, and so you think divorce is okay? She, she's about to say that um, in Chinese, and then she stops, looks at her father, and then switches to English. Uh, again, yeah, 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 yeah. just keeping up the facade, like she, she just doesn't want him to find out. Yeah. Anything to do with the, the, the happy family or the, uh, the functioning business. Uh, also, it's it's it that's what her mind goes to you know you get you've got divorce papers who gave these to you yeah. oh your brother does it now it's okay for you like that's that's what her mind goes to first yeah it can't be you know, a, it can't be that it's, it's right an, for it, them at this point or something yeah it's it's not about you know me or us really it's it's definitely we're looking outwards first yeah, and uh, with what we understand about Wayman, like this is the first time as well that he seems to be much more emotional about it. Because I think up to this point, you might be able to infer that it seems like he thought this was best and that it wouldn't go over too tough. But uh, obviously, Evelyn's taking it incredibly badly. Um, well, it's in his fashion. I, I, he doesn't even really truly want the divorce, right? Yeah. Because I think that the um, the example that he gives was that did, did he say somebody at the church? I think he said somebody in their community, like they tried to do a divorce, and through the process of having that conversation, they were able to figure their problems out. So, like, yeah. I'm sure he's even still holding for the idea that maybe just this conversation will move their relationship forward in a positive way. Oh yeah, right. he's definitely not happy about this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very much a. Uh, I it I it kind of sucks that this might be best for us. Well, I think um, part of the reason why Evelyn would be like, "Wait, you're not divorcing me." I mean, it's because like, yeah, why would he? I mean, he obviously has affection for her. You know, like he he cares about her a lot. Like that's pretty. I feel like that's got to be evident even to her, even given all of the stuff that's going on in their life. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the first things we saw was them talking, like as they would, you know, very, very plainly and you know, to one another. So, yeah, they, they seem to it's it's not this overt kind of this just isn't working out and there's clearly strife between us. It's more of something, something lingering that maybe, you know, Evelyn wouldn't even. Yeah, and he says that he can't notice. get like he struggles to get conversations going with her about stuff like this, so this would, as Destiny said, he would force it at this point. Um, I don't even really yeah. have the time to talk about their relationship because yeah, and it, if you're constantly so busy, things. yeah, you you've got the taxes, you got the business, you got the daughter, you got the dad, you got all this stuff you have to do. Your mind not even think to think about oh, is our marriage okay? Yeah. You, maybe you take it for granted. You don't even think about it. You just assume things are fine. Maybe because something explicit hasn't been brought up. You know, that's, and like this, long work. this happens a lot, but like that is we're getting to peaking the actual time they can finally talk about this and uh, Alpha Women takes over and just says, I told you to stay under the radar. That sort of thing. And it's just like the there's almost like two two um, switches we can have here, or two tracks. Like the you could call it the plot versus the the character, and like the you know Alpha Wayman trying to save her from being potentially attacked by the um, 
the cult of I don't even know what I'd call them the Jobu cult for now. Uh, the it's like, it's like this has caused loads of attention to come to uh to Evelyn, and so he's back. And like before, she can even deal with all that stuff. He tries to drag her away, and the security guards have arrived. And we're also at around half an hour in, so it probably they probably felt like it's about time for a for a little bit of an action scene, maybe. I'd say thirty minutes in is a good point. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and it's just like as the security guards are approaching, she's like panicking. The dad's confused, but Alpha Wayman's just pretty pretty fine. He seems pretty confident, and um. In terms of maximum confusion for this film, for, for like a viewer, he, uh, the way this scene unfolds, as everyone's probably familiar, just, uh, the security guards ask him to just get on the floor, put their hands behind their back, and, uh, Alpha Wayman seems to refuse, and he puts on his little earpieces, gets out lip balm, and eats it. He eats it. <laughs> Which is very confusing. Yeah, the you, first time you, around. You even get the yeah. guard being like, Sir? Like, why, why, why would. <laughs> and yeah, as, as a viewer, this is one of those things where it's just like, How are you going to contextualize that? What the fuck could that possibly mean that will make sense later? But they'll do it. By the way, if you're a regular chapstick user, don't use red chapstick because it will make your lips more red over time. Really? Use clear chapstick. Yeah. It's so I great because it, it's. A lot. Yeah. It's I have not. Dry lips. It's not always what you reveal, but the order that you reveal it in, and the the exposition that explains those things, like biting the chapstick, that comes after. But like you have this one here before that exposition dump, where she's like, "What the fuck is he doing?" And then you follow that up with this crazy fight scene, and the obvious point is to just make the audience go, "What? Yeah, what is happening?" And then you find out, and it's like, "Oh, okay." And it's actually it actually makes a surprising amount of sense. Well, yeah, this was so fun. So you, you like engage, and then they have this again a flourish that is so cool for the little direction. But as his head is tilting down, the aspect ratio changes uh, to get you into a more cinematic view, which um, it's it's almost like a signal of like, oh shit, we are getting a fight scene then because it just it feels appropriate at that point. Hey, uh, Order sixty six, right? That was a cinematic experience. Oh, you know it. Yeah, it was. I'm not, I'm not seeing instant praise from you guys about that game. I don't know what's going on here. Never played it. Oh, I think you played it, right? Which one? Sorry, Order sixty six. Yeah, the video game. Or is it <laughs> yeah, the video game. <laughs> the best selling game of two thousand five. Yeah, just they, uh, had, they had a really good grasp on how to make things cinematic. I don't think I did. No. Oh, you did. I, I missed that one. I think it was uh, Evil Evil Within as well. Was a game where they just had black bars put on because that's just it's more si and to the point where I think that's people when could you know that yeah, that was the Evil Within. Yeah. 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 Didn't people like, hack even it over gameplay? Yeah, it was, and people. No, it was, no, no, no. It was the Order eighteen eighty six because I they uh, oh made sorry that, made I that figured 19, yeah. 1920 by 800 because that was more filmic um when in reality it was because the ps4 couldn't run like what they wanted to render oh that my is, god really <laughs> yeah that so is funny. true that you can mess the resolution of the way i think typically for whatever reason we tend to perceive wider aspect ratios as being more epic like if you see something in like a th um like a three by four aspect ratio like the box almost it's whatever but the wider a shot gets like for some reason the more epic we interpret it so it would like the yeah Here's the thing, though. How much of that is just because we know that that's what films are versus television? You know, how much of that is just conditioning in a sense? Yeah, it, could, it could literally be conditioned, but we are conditioned that way to feel that way. That when we get, when the yeah. aspect ratio changes in that way, or when we see those wider aspects, for some reason it just feels more expansive or something. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you have tentpole films like Lawrence of Arabia or like all the westerns and shit like that. You do think of wide aspect ratios in that kind of way. Someone said I'm going senile. Look, it just shows how much my brain's been fucked by Star Wars, okay? That's that's it. All that was. <laughs> Order 66 is better than Order 866, okay? Anyway. Yeah, so this fight happens, and I mean, really, you know, there's, I can't play it, so what does anybody have to say about it? I don't know. The floor is open. Um, um This would be, like, the first of what we're gonna see a lot in this film, which is very creative and clever. Like, leveraging seemingly bizarre like everyday objects and integrating them into fight scenes um which is a really cool choice um something kind of makes it, yeah go for it 
Yeah, I was gonna say something that they said that I totally believe 100% afterwards is watching, um, there might be future fight scenes, who knows, but um, watching any of the fight scenes in this movie very much feels Jackie Chan inspired. Um, uh, yes. Like, yeah. yeah, like Jackie Chan fights are always like, it's him versus some number of people that seem more equipped. There's like usually cool prop work or cute stuff going on. It's very rarely like a straightforward fight, 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 fight. There's usually like clever integration of props into the fight scenes and the choreography or whatever. Um, I very much got that vibe watching uh, this and potentially future fight scenes in the film. Um, you could, I think I read later that apparently they were planning on casting um, the mother's role was supposed to be for Jackie, Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan, that's right. Yeah, which yeah. But yeah, after reading that, yeah. Looking at how, I don't know who did the choreography for these fight scenes, but it must be absolutely Jackie Chan inspired for a lot of these. It's gotta be. Well, cer it's, certainly yeah, this like, fight. I genuinely got like a full sense of it. Just the fact that he's using such an unconventional prop to his benefit, it feels yeah. like yeah, Jackie Chan as well. Something just we so see here that's um, really fun when you see it in fight scenes is um, a level of rhythm. Like, it, it feels yeah. like uh, a lot of the actions are kind of synchronized with the music, but it's not even, like, quite that. It would be, like, that um, each movement kind of has, like, exactly the same amount of time separating them, so it really yeah. feels, like, bouncy, and um, I guess it, it feels consistent, in a sense. It's, it's I feel like it's kind of hard to describe how it feels, but, like, there's something it's satisfying what it doesn't about have. that. Think, yeah. think about all those fight scenes that are ruined like the all the Disney fucking fight scenes that we have now and a lot of Marvel fight scenes, a lot of fight scenes in general where there's so many cuts, you don't know what's happening. It's just like someone punches someone else, I guess, and it cuts. And then someone punches someone else, cuts. And then there's a kick, and then there's a cut. And, and you're constantly changing. You, you can't keep track of things. You just know that there's a fight happening. And you just well, sort of wait. That, that stems from uh, probably either poor choreography or uh, the inability on the part of whoever's doing yeah, it to talent, execute yeah. all of those. <laughs> Which just when you when you have like a wide shot and we can see everything that's happening with no cuts, that just indicates like a level of confidence and like your own ability to capture all of this and to to do all of these actions and to get them right. And it probably okay. took a lot of tries to get a lot of these things right, but I mean, it's impressive. I'm yeah, not going to say uh, they're perfect fight scenes or anything, because I'm not even that great at fucking judging choreography perfectly, but stuff like, there are just some scenes that we can all be like, oh, well, that would, didn't make sense. Oh, that was fucked. That is, why would they do that? Why didn't they use this? That sort of stuff. But one thing I really like about this fight is that he opens it by throwing the, the fanny pack into, like, the main security guard guy, hits him in the face, and then later he throws it again at him, and he ducks to avoid it this <laughs> time, but it hits the guy behind him, who then hits the girl behind him in the head, and it's just, like, really satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm yeah, and a lot of it matches the music. It's a super high energetic fight scene uh, with loads of satisfying and fun yeah. choreography in it. And you can follow what's happening. He does a thing, and then there is the result of him doing that thing. And your brain doesn't need any help to just link the cause and effect of this fight together. And it's it's just so easy to follow. And it's so nice to see a fight scene where you could just go along with what's happening, and your brain doesn't get confused and give up and i like just, that it's a, pr a prop not just grabbed randomly from the environment and improvised with like it's tied to his awkward husband slash father persona you know yeah the he's fanny using pack that he's as making a, a fanny as, pack as threatening as <laughs> yeah um yeah we get the, like oh well, go ahead the, the the impacts are no joke i mean the the like some of the the way they fall sometimes like it looks like there's some real neck breaker you know yeah, impacts they, on the floor people landing on their shoulders like they must have guys trained to fall like that i think so yeah because the way that they it, it's a little un, it's unrealistic how some of them react oh, yeah. to some of the hits um it's sure definitely stylized in a, it's heightened for sure yeah fall, like in a certain way to not injure themselves too badly oh, yeah. and also to to make it look cool uh but it was it's it's very fun all the way through to just watch it happen. You could track it. It gets the point across. It's it's very impressive and it's fun. Well, yeah, it's just uh, fun. You just enjoy watching it. I like that there's like a, a a break between in the middle of the fight where they're all just struggling to get back up, refocus, fucking understand what the hell is even happening because this random guy's beating them all up with a fanny pack and he drops in uh, a gravel from um, a fish tank into it to make it a uh, you know hit harder. And yeah, the first hit, he hits someone in the head, he goes like flying three meters in the air. It's uh, definitely not trying to fully maintain a grounded physics with that one, but whatever, he probably would have been <laughs> fucked by it. it. 
Yeah, this and some other things uh, that will come up later, they're not trying to hide what they are. And so you can accept it in a way. Like, it's clearly, we're having fun here. We're There's definitely a lot of uh, bending physics in this. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just like that in reaction to that, the guy goes, Oh no, Craig! And then he looks back at uh, Wave and he's like, Fuck. <laughs> just the, the <laughs> forgetting for a moment he's in the middle of a fight. And he gets hit in the head, again. Um, yeah, and and he just wrecks them both with the with the fanny pack. With the last one, he just keeps doing his like spinny, 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 spinny with his uh, like the guy fucking drops his. Uh, are they called truncheons? The um the the, the like nightstick Night things. Nightsticks. Yeah, I can't remember what they actually. Oh, like name what is. Are, what are they really called? Yeah, like yeah. The, the official name. Uh, batons. No, but yeah, I was about to say. A, I think all those let, names let are valid. It might be referring to different versions or something. A truncheon, a short, thick stick carried as a weapon by a police officer. It specifically says noun British. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Well, all right so, then. Yeah, uh, no one calls it a, not calls them truncheons here, so I guess it's a more local thing. Mm. A truncheon. It, that sounds like a weapon name. You'd call a weapon a truncheon. And yeah, so he's cleared him out. And, uh, I was so uh, impressed um, with this actor, like the way he, oh, wow. not only the martial arts, but the way he kind of switches from like the awkward dad to like this hyper, like this almost super heroic yeah. guy with like very controlled movements of his body. And I'm looking at this guy. I'm like, I know this guy. I've seen yeah, this guy right. somewhere. Where do I fucking <laughs> recognize this guy from? Yeah. I'm like, he that's not short round, is it? It can't be. No way. <laughs> Like, if it is, where has this guy been? Not only short round from Temple of Doom, but uh, the Gadgets kid from the Goonies. Data. You remember from that. Yes, exactly. I'm like, where has this guy been? This guy's so fucking talented. When you said Gadgets kid, my mind went to Mr. In sorry, Inspector Gadgets. Well, it is, basically is that, yeah. Because he had those, like, oil, oil slick and all these things attached to his wrists and his ankles or whatever. Go, go, Gadget Fanny Pack. He even had, like, the gray uh, trench coat, like Inspector Gadget does, I think. Well, there's something wonderful about the fact that at the end of the fight scene, he does, like, a really cool little uh, move to reconnect the Fanny Pack on. Like, it, it, it slaps <laughs> yeah. around him, and he can, and it's just, like, the Fanny Pack, the peak of not cool. <laughs> but, like, trying to be badass <laughs> as fuck with it. I think this movie fucks around with that a lot, which I really enjoy. Um, yeah. The juxtaposition, if you will. And yeah, so he heads back to, to Evelyn. Evelyn sort of crab walks out. <laughs> yeah, I love her little walk here. It's great. It's like, and she sees him, she's like, ugh. Um, yeah, and I think what, what's cool about the question she asks, she, she's going to say what is going on, but she starts with who and then what's going on, because like it's almost like the more important question for her right now is who even are you? Like how, like Rather than the absurdity of everything she's gone through. Um. Like the more pressing question, because she does care about Wayman, and we're getting split on our focuses, which is uh, throughout the movie. But yeah, he just says, like, um, I'm not the one that's trying to divorce you, and it's like, you got to focus. Either we we move, or you can just sit here and wallow in, in the consequences of your choices. And uh, she just says, I just want to sit here. Which is <laughs> like, refusing the call, everybody. Your bingo yeah. list for the hero's journey. This film goes right through it. You don't have to do it, but it's neat that this film does do it. Um, and so, yeah, he drags her off, and we're getting our... Uh, this is the most Matrix part of the film, I think. Because um, it's like, he's even talking to someone on his little thing about getting the right exits to go the right places to get the information yeah, on where people kinda, are. Yeah. In an office building, it's just like, oh, I feel so. I feel so that. The, the aspect ratio goes back to... Uh, There's another tainted franchise. It's definitely a lot of nods yeah. to the Matrix. That that fight reminded me a lot of the lobby shootout, you know, confronting the security guards and. Absolutely, there's going to be a future one potentially that uh, will definitely make <laughs> some like thematic references to the yeah for sure potentially and uh, even the whole. We I guess we haven't really gotten there. Maybe in the future, in a few minutes, we'll get there too. But this constant calling of um, we're we're getting to like what is really the climax of the Matrix, um, where it's like she needs to believe, she has to believe, she mm -hmm. needs to do the thing, she started, which was like Neo's like thing, what everybody's yes. favorite the entire time too. Yeah, and our the IRS agent. Well, no, never mind. Future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so totally. in 
in again, like presenting a more standard approach with the story, I think is what this scene is. It's like we go back to the world where she was killed, along with uh, Alpha Wayman at first in the alternate universe, and it's like the what we would have to assume are the villains have got like little black circles on their foreheads, and they're like, "Welcome, you're about to experience the the glory of Jobu Tupaki," and it's like. It feels so much like a villain introduction scene, like Vader walking in in A New Hope sort of thing. It's like, ah, so here's our bad guy who's gonna, everyone's gonna have to deal with sort of thing. Um, it felt like the scale of like Thanos being introduced, but on, but with like a low budget feeling at the same time. You know what I mean? Where it's yeah, just it's like, like oh, it's, oh, this is eight people in an IRS office. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they built it up so well. Yeah, and she's just, like, already showing off. She's incredibly powerful. She can, like, switch everything about her at will. She's fucking around with all kinds yeah. of different things. Um, and, yeah, and she walks up to the Evelyn of this universe, who isn't actually quite dead yet. And uh, I think she, like, taps with her head, and then she spams through a whole bunch of universes. And uh, then they show a visual, I think, of, like, a fruit exploding. And, um... And it's just blood coming out of her head and stuff. Which, as a visual, not going to make a lot of sense in any way, shape, or form right now. Um, but it will once we find out what's going on. Um, the one thing I haven't actually really got any explanation for is she ends up in, like, a baby outfit. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's just a matter of the fact that she was pushing it through so many of the multiverse that it just it fucked with the clothes. Or if it's meant to mean something else. But um, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, it's like a glitch almost where she's wearing an outfit from a from a vision. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's like Um and yeah, uh, something that Deidre says when introducing her is just like the rest of your miserable lives, this is nothing more than a statistical inevitability as uh, in relation to meeting Jobu and that she's seen all, she knows all, and she knows what makes you tick, what fragile branches your self uh, your self-worth rests. Um so it's like you get an idea of what these 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 this weird culty people follow, or maybe what they're thinking. Uh, but mm -hmm. Jobu says it's not her. Um, and if you remember, Wayman says that uh, the one that we're following is special in some way. So just, just building is, up them references. This is the this is the cult of Don Beveridge. Oh no! Do you think? I mean, I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that what he's up to? Uh. So yeah, then we get one of the cooler pieces of directing for traveling through the multiverse, I think, anyway. Uh, really up to you guys, whatever you pick is your favorite. But um, Jobu, the, the bad guy, realizes that she's got to be close by multiversally. And so when she says that, again, the aspect ratio starts to come back in. And she tilts her head back and forth like she's switching channels. And the, the visuals change based on that as well. And then she ends up in the in the universe we're familiar with. And they really don't waste time with this. They reveal that Jobu Tupaki is occupying the body of Joy, Evelyn's daughter. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, my goodness. And see, the fact I that we get her. that in, like, the first half hour, it just it's just like, yeah, there's a lot... They're going to be doing a lot more with this story than you might have assumed. Because you'd think maybe a payoff like that might be saved for later. But uh, there's no need with what we're, we're going to be doing in total. Yes, in a lesser film, we would chalk it down to just not knowing how to write a story <laughs> dramatically, but uh, not the case here. Um, but yeah, so then we get a lot of, this is probably the most expositional film gets, because it's really just trying to explain a bit more about how everything works after having all that fun. Um, Wayman says, every small decision that's made splinters your universe off into another one at the same time, like, with the decisions. And um, uh, Evelyn is the one who invented the technology to travel the multiverse in the Alpha universe. That's where he's from. Which is where he's from. Yeah, and uh, they, they they were just trying to pioneer it and work with it and con just c connect and uh, talk with other universes until one of their jumpers, a girl, was pushed too far and her like mind essentially spread across the entire multiverse as a result of the, uh, the, the pushing of it, and now she intends to destroy all of the multiverse and kill everybody in it. Um, and he just introduces her name as Joe Butapaki, and uh, uh, Evelyn says, you're just making s sounds up. Which um, is funny, at this point, that's like three different movies that have made that joke now. Um, that it felt new a little bit of a while ago, but wasn't it like Infinity War that... Um, all words are made up. Yeah, yeah that was one up. of them. Right. 
I think it was, wasn't it Infinity War? Never, no, never, first? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was, they were going to like Nivita, Nivita or something like to go get Stormbreaker. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's a made up word. All words are made up. Yeah. And then, um, it was in, uh, the Suicide Squad as well, right? He said, um, I can't remember that one. He, sa he says, your word, your name is letters. All names are letters or something like that. It's just a oh, similar right, kind yeah, of joke. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's good, it's good stuff. Anyway, he says, yeah, they're, uh, the bubbles are getting, like, if you think of the multiverse as a series of bubbles like, that represent each of the worlds, she says, um, well, sure, she's, like, destroying them, but there's loads of them, so whatever, leave me alone. And then that's where he, like, reveals it. But he also says that, like, the, the nature of her plan is being felt all over the universe. Um, and he says, your clothes never wear as well this, the next day, your hair never falls in quite the same way. Our institutions are crumbling, nobody trusts their neighbor anymore, and you stay up at night wondering to yourself, how can we get back? Which, Starting uh, to build up now the major themes the, that ties into us, I guess, what you could call the core theme, but we're just starting to stack them on a little bit. Yeah. And you know a film that wanted to try and do this, but did it in a terrible way? Which one? <laughs> the, the very often forgotten... Uh... A wrinkle in Time. Oh You've my god. That. Don't watch it's A Wrinkle the, in Time. One out of ten that, it's the one out of ten movie that we always you know, forget. Uh, that we watched and we did a whole Eve movie. I would Sonic. say it's worth seeing for the Cabbage Monster. but I think it's worth, it's worth watching to laugh at how marvelously terrible it is on every level. I, I, cabbage Monster sounds funny. She was great. It was Reese Witherspoon turned into a Cabbage Monster for, uh, for a portion of the film. It's um, nice. but we had no idea what that film was doing, <laughs> really. <laughs> it was, you had giant Oprah in it at one point. That was fun too. You have giant Oprah in it. Um. But anyway, something that's interesting about this is the first lines he has: the uh, the clothes never wear the same way, and your hair never falls in quite the same way either. Like the next day, same way. They are lyrics in a song, and I was curious, so I decided to go listen to this song because it's referencing, and um, it's called "A Story of a Girl." The the actual song that the lyrics are taken from, and the following up lyrics are, uh, this is the story of a girl who cried a river and drowned the whole world. While she looks so sad in photographs, I absolutely loved her when she smiles, which, when you know what Mahler, the whole movie is about. Able, we're not going to recognize the song if you don't sing it. You have I ain't to fucking sing singing it. it. Get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Accept this reality. So, yeah, uh, the, the song itself... Is some, I like it when media does this. It's like, you don't have to. But if you did, like, oh man, you get a little bit of an implication there about what maybe this, this story could be about as opposed to what we're being told strictly. It's about yeah. a girl, yeah, maybe. Uh, so, uh, where, where, where do we even go next? Where does this film go? It's so many places at once. So anyway... Um, they, they're moving through the building to try and get out, I think, uh, at least to some level of safety, but they walk past we Deirdre. Hate. What do you say, sorry? Uh -oh. You mentioned as well, like, because we have this, did you mention it when he, he, he takes some gum off of, like, the bottom of a desk and starts chewing it? Yes. And he uses the machine again to gain new, yeah, new attributes. Yeah, I don't think he's fully explained the nature of that yet. Just the, yeah, because no. we're still like, the fuck's going it's on It's just that? more weird behavior yeah. that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, but will in time. Right. Um, I can't remember, I might be wrong about that, I can't remember if they've explained the whole slingshot thing yet, but it's fine, we'll get to it in a second anyway, probably. But, yeah, they walk past Deirdre and um, she apologizes for punching her in the face. And then we just watch her staple a receipt to her head. Uh, it's just it's just like why <laughs> now if that's not from irs symbolism <laughs> that's what they're all about they worship the receipt uh <laughs> all hail the receipt they staple it to their head that's how you get the job they have a ceremony and everything and so he's like run 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 she's verse jumping and it's like eh. and then like her um the nature of her body changes uh which I think for this, I don't think Jamie Lee Curtis has this, this got this much of a pot belly in real life, so I'm assuming it, it was like some kind of filmic thing where it's like a thing that deflates. No, it, it wasn't. I read about this, because it does look like a prosthetic, right? Yeah. But she had said in behind-the-scenes footage, nope, that's my actual belly. Oh, and man. I, I was so 
desperate for this role. It's like, please let me play this character. And she just used her actual belly, yeah. Well, oh. I mean, yeah. All right. <laughs> Guess so. <laughs> um, but yeah. You're, okay. Huh. Like she almost looks like she's gotten taller and leaner. Um, and she's like s- fucking screams, just coming after him. It's like, oh god. And so uh, we need not quite the true lies physique, but uh, no. no. It's been, older, it's been a that's while. That's totally time, fair. Yeah. yeah. Yep. She's in her like sixties now, right? So must be yeah. At but least. not slowing down, because right now she's in a fucking action scene. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, Waymond needs to uh, get some kind of ability. Um, and so he's talking to his, his people back in the in the other universe, and they they just tell him, like, you can have a break dancer, an acrobat, a gymnast, or something like that. And he just goes, gymnast. And uh, they tell him he's going to need to... Uh, one in 8,000 probability, he needs to cause four paper cuts on his hand. And... Uh, there's just this great bit. I am Johnny Knoxville. That would be pretty tame for Jackass, I think. <laughs> oh, that, that's something that they did in Jackass. They did do paper cuts in Jackass. Paper cuts yeah. between the fingers. Yeah. What was was it like a like was there anything else to it? Or was it just doing that? No, it's just a little bit. No, it's they just did, it's just dumb shit that they, they did. did. No, because they did it in different. Because they did paper cuts on their the, between their fingers and they did paper cu- cuts across his lips. I think. Oh, oh, oh yeah. fucking paper stop. cuts between the uh, toes. That's okay. It's fine. Because, <laughs> no, it's uh, okay. My, Imagine it, like, Rags. You brought it up, right? Uh, you mentioned it. it. Feel it, Rags. Um, uh, but I mean, he he then starts doing the paper cuts, but like he meant it's a lot harder when he's trying to do it on purpose. But then eventually, he's just like whittling them down, and she's getting closer. Well, just there's that, that line one. though where he says, "Paper cuts only happen when you are trying. It's then impossible." <laughs> but eventually, he finds a way, and then they do like a really cool embellishing of the fourth one, where it's like a big sweeping gesture of blood flicks all over the screen. Yeah, and then um. Press the button, gets those attributes, and they have a big old fight. Well, not a actually, big no. Actually he, does, he does not get the yeah. to press the button. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he doesn't press the button, and then she's about to do like a bane move on him. Backbreaker, I think they say. Yeah. Uh, but he gets he gets a, a handy sign is above him, so he, uh, he grabs that and puts it under his back before she can do it. Um, but she still kicks him out of the fight basically, and and puts a mm-hmm. like a file cabinet in front of him so that it's just her and Evelyn now. And obviously, this is this is one of them. Just uh, you don't get to be eased into how all of this works, which is funnily enough. I was about to say well, unlike she... the Matrix, but then I guess he didn't. He still had to do some shit that he didn't want to have to do pretty quickly. So, mm-hmm. um, but well, yeah, he's like this section is kind of like a um, like kind of like a roaming sort of you know, like in a horror game where you got like the enemy roaming around yeah. looking for you while you're trying to achieve some other objective. Yeah, we're gonna it. swap things up a bit for you. Like alien or nemesis or something. Yeah. Um, well, Evelyn he... has to now kind of on the fly try and figure out how uh how um uh Waymond was like jumping and gaining all of these abilities. Yeah, he tells her to pick up the the earpieces and then tries to explain to her that basically you need to do something that is so incongruent with what you would do normally that the uni- it pushes you into an adjacent universe enough. That it like elastic bands you back into yours to like autocorrect, and that will shoot you into your desired universe temporarily, to uh, sort of phase in with you, you from that world, and you can draw abilities, skills, and and knowledge from them. I think is how he says it. Um, and so Mc- the the way it works is the more illogical the thing that you do, the farther it slingshots you. Yeah, I think and so. And so you have more access to more outrageous abilities. The more Which kind of makes sense thematically if you think about like what the multiple universes are, right? Like how do you make a really big change in your life? You have to do something that is like statistically almost impossible to actually do it, right? It's kind of like a I, idea. A radical change. Yeah, like yes. a radical change. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it's all about choice, right? Like you, you would never choose to fucking give yourself four paper cuts on your hand and so it takes you into a, just a completely different uh, pathway. I can believe, I mean, I can believe Johnny it, Knoxville you know? is from a different universe. Well, see, for him, it would be not doing that that would slingshot him, probably. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. But I, I guess it's kind of interesting to think about that as a concept. You need to do something that's so out of the ordinary for you that it'll slingshot you into a universe where you did that. So, well, hmm. It's kind of, well, the way that they show it visually is like 
pulling the catapult back to that universe where you did do that, that's relatively adjacent, but it pulls you back into your universe because that's where you belong, but it can't control well, I... the force of you being pulled in, so it overcompensates and shoots you temporarily into one that's, like, opposite. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I guess what I'm saying is I kind of find it, like, that's something worth thinking about in terms of how that ties into, like, the broader point of the story. It's so out of the ordinary that you wouldn't do it, but you did somewhere out there in the multiverse. Right. Like, I think even maybe, broad, even going more broad to look at like the actual like the the real themes of like what's going on. I, I think it's it's the, or like the the very human themes rather than like looking at the multiverse stuff. It's more just like if you Evelyn's whole life is taking the path of least resistance, right? Even though it's a grind, yeah. even though everything's different, she's avoiding conflict. She's avoiding right. If you want, if you wanted to be a singer, if you wanted to do it, if you want to make those changes in your life to access any other world where you'd be a better person, you have to do something a bit out of the ordinary. You have to do something that you wouldn't otherwise do in order to yeah. make the jump to be a different person. And up till this point, her whole life has been doing whatever's right in front of her without like yeah. fighting too much, you know, yeah. So she, um, she's told that <laughs> they even show this actually. So the the most likely way she can do this is if she professes her love to Deirdre. But they've actually got a list for us. Like she could rip out all of her hair, jump out the window, break her nose, lick her elbows, sneeze two hundred times, repair father <laughs> relationship, uh, air flares, write a novel, bite tongue off, poke eye out. Kind of but, funny that repair father relation is like lower than jumping out of a window in terms yeah. of improbability. These little <laughs> the, I, I've never looked at this freeze frame, so there's a number associated with each of these actions. So yeah. is, is that like the level of improbability? Yeah, I think that the would most, happen. What they're saying here is the most reliable is, it? Yeah. is oh, Professor okay. Love to Deirdre, which is also relatively easy to do compared Very. to a lot of these. Reliable well, in it, regard to their intended outcome like the yes. abilities how, that they want to snag from another universe right how well will it be able to slingshot you across those different um, places it's, it's kind of a, a fun little mechanic to have for this story because it means that there's a level of like you have to try and think about what is available to me at this moment that i can use is that useful to me is there something else that i can choose to do that will be more effective or get me an attribute that's more valuable it's like a, a cool little sort of um risk reward system that um right. I think I think it's like it flies past um, as you're watching it, but it's like that's a fun. There's a lot of like fun modifiers that they throw into this film to make the conflict more interesting that stem from like mechanics or events that happen that make a lot of sense. Like the fact that we've we've got like our main plot in this universe has stemmed from this massive misunderstanding that was entirely reasonable that caused Evelyn to punch the IRS agent, and now it puts him in a situation where there's like a constant pressure. It's like police, the building's locked down. It like makes the environment suited to the needs of the story. And this one here, we'll see later on, gives them a lot of fun opportunities to uh, play around with the world and the multiverse. Right. Yeah, and, and with the image they show, it's like she's surrounded by much more common variations of her own universe, but then there's these pockets that are outside of it that are much further deviations. She needs to get to those ones to access the power in them, but to only do that, you'd have to do more and more unlikely things. Um... Yeah, and, and the problem here, though, is that you actually have to complete the action. And so she says, I love you, to Deirdre, but she doesn't mean it. And so she uh, tries to access the power, and all it does is send her to a very, very close by, like, adjacent world, which is just her talking to um, her husband about the divorce. That's it. And again... Right. We're in a position where it's like we, as the audience and her as a character, is like, I'm fucking dealing with a life or death situation battling someone right now. I've got, I've got literally no time to be talking to you about the divorce. But and I, f I feel this is the case. That fucking actor's performance combined with a really strong script, you actually managed to get Where's, drawn into him. Mm, totally. Like, and to the point where she actually wants to address what he's saying, even though she's currently in the middle of a fight to the death, theoretically. Um... <laughs> I just really appreciate that, because, yeah, he talks to her about, like, how he could see it on her face that, uh, she thinks they never should have met, or they never should have left together here, sort of thing. He, um, even starts, he's, he's tearing up the poor guy, and you just, and, you know, you just want to tell him some stuff to reassure him, sort of thing. Um, and they also show the visual of her, like, splitting again, because, uh, you gotta be careful. I think he's explained the clay pot thing to her, or he might not have yet, but... We're almost there anyway. Um, 
But yeah, he uh, there's, there's there's some fun lines with this as well. He says, "Whenever I try to talk to you, unless it's an emergency, you always get pulled away." And as he says that, Deirdre's arm comes from the window and pulls her back into the universe she's uh, fighting her in. Stuff like yeah. that. Um. Yeah, and they they assume then from what Deirdre's doing that she must have like a WWE fucking wrestler in her, or like that's like the alternative path that she's in, and so they're gonna need something to counter that. And what they're trying to get. Uh, Evelyn into is like um, some some kind of fighting ability to be able to deal with her, um, but because she failed, uh, Wayman uh, Alpha Wayman basically says like you're clearly not the one. You, you can't you can't be the one. You fucked it up, um, which is uh, depressing. But you know whatever. That's just the, the reality. And so he leaves because he's got to search for like the correct Evelyn out of you know theoretically the whole multiverse with. So it's another um, thing the Matrix did, right? Like you're not the one. Oh shit. Yeah, again, it feels like we're doing that portion of that kind of story way quicker in this. We're doing all of that, and then we've got another story to tell after it, pretty much. Um, yeah. But yeah, he, he, she must not be the one. And so he, he stops, and then regular Wayman comes back up, like, oh, hi. And then he's like, ow, my hand. Because the paper cuts, it's, so, it's just so normal and chill. Uh, yeah. yeah, and she's like really sad that she's lost Alpha Wayman again. But uh, they get in. The close of the door and stuff, and then uh, he gets pulled back into having the conversation with the other Waymond, and uh, he's trying to think about what to say. And the fucking the door gets broken off, I think, this time because Deirdre's breaking in on the other side, and we get we she she's attacking him, and we get this wonderful visual uh, of them being halfway down a staircase, and J.B. Lee Curtis getting ready to fuck him up by jumping on him from the top, <laughs> legit like. When the camera cuts Not to this, the kind of imagery that you ever really would have expected to see ever <laughs> no. at any point. In life. I think this was like this is again one of those moments of the film where they know how fucking absurd they are, and they they're oh, confident yeah. you'll just be enjoying it anyway. But well, it's gonna... a really effective way of kind of defining that this is a tiny instance in time where like she is milliseconds away from getting her nose broken, basically, and there's all this shit happening in another universe where she eventually gets her powers. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. this, this is used very effectively as a framing device. Like, this is all taking place in, like, fractions of a second. But she says, I love you, and this time yeah, it was the, meaningful. The, the, uh, the imagery that I think is, like, probably most strongly identified with this movie, her, like, flying through all of these different universes, so like oh, this right, one was yeah, like yeah. slingshotted. And it's a really cool, like an interesting sort of a uh, little montage. It's only like 10 seconds long. Yeah, it looks great. It's um, and it's basically, uh, as John just said, this is all experienced in like a s split second. She goes to the other universe and it even plays like um, a different life path to help justify, I guess, how, how she could have ended up here. And... Um, it cracks back to when she first is hanging out with Wayman and when he offers her to, to go to America with him. And in, in, when we first saw this, she agrees and the father abandons her, but in this version it splits. And um, you can already tell from his expression in both splits what happened, what choice was made. And like, seriously, yeah. from this moment, it's already done. This has taken advantage more so of the multiverse than Doctor Strange does. <laughs> like, it's already over. Yeah, we're we haven't really talked about it too much. It will come up more though. It's an interesting coincidence how these two movies kind of came out at the same time and they explore these kinds of concepts loosely similarly. And um this really nails it while Multiverse of Madness bungles it at every just in every way both from a character and from a just basic logic perspective, whereas nothing works in Doctor Strange. This tries really hard to create a very emotional connection to, you know, multiverse implications and its involvement in a plot. Uh, it's, it's, it's the anti-Doctor Strange. I couldn't believe how lazy and unimaginative that was written, you know, the Doctor Strange movie. I was expecting much more from that. Because, like, it's a multiverse movie. Like, oh, this movie's going to have some fun. You know what I mean? Like, what do you mean? You got, the feeling I had going in. That's Mr. Fantastic, isn't it? There you go. 
Oh yeah, right. You have... And memory lane, that fucking the <laughs> laziest possible way to like introduce flashbacks. Like, are you fucking kidding me? What's interesting too is that the portrayal of the multiverse in this movie, it is something as simple and everyday as a a breakup or I never you know, I never went with a man that I loved or something of that nature, right? It's not some galaxy spanning end of the cosmos. What weapons ridiculous... you choose to kill the multiversal god. It's not that. It's yeah, it's yeah, really it's, grounded. It's, you know, it, it's things that people do every day. It's events that happen every day. It's uh, an accident or it's uh, just a little choice that leads you on a different path and it shows you what could have happened instead. And so it gives you this immediate connection. Uh, to the to the multiverse in the sense of yeah i could i can relate to all these other versions of you and they do it so quickly because it's just very relatable very down to earth uh the stakes are just so uh comprehensible yeah yeah i'd say so um so when she doesn't go with them she remains in uh gong yang and then she's walking down an alleyway at one point and she gets mugged only this legend saves her who's who is this who knows and she gets inspired by her and studies with her the art of <laughs> martial arts. And you get this little montage that I was just like, is this, are we doing Kill Bill? Is this Kill Bill? Is it, or it just feels like it is to me. Uh, yeah. Especially with, she feels absurd as, like, as a teacher as well. Um, but yeah, she, well, so. That, that genre and era, like I think they, they the footage is oversaturated the footage is a bit yeah, dated they little, do those 70 grainy, snap zooms yeah. where on a telephoto yeah. lens where they go for ultra wide to like super close and it's like wobbles a little bit like uh, i think kill bill kind of emulated that and this is also emulating that but i wouldn't say this is necessarily trying to be like kill bill you know what i mean i thought well i was thinking of um Oh fuck! Is, it, is his name Pai Mei, the 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 teacher in that? Yeah, Pai Mei. Yeah. He, um, he it, she reminds me of him because like she's clearly like wearing a big white wig, long white hair. Yeah, like, oh, totally. Yeah. Outfit. I think it. Yeah, it's definitely a reference. Um, that, that's at least what my mind went to is Kill Bill and uh, another yeah. movie that's very well stylized, uh, which means it's easy to kind of, uh, you know, to to emulate it in this it's great and so uh it fast forward to then to she gets a movie career because of her training and then they do something really cool which is to intersperse different things like flashing around with the paparazzi and stuff and all the different things she did and I, i'm imagining this is the reality they've they've got real michelle yo like red carpet footage in there uh oh, pretty that's quick neat. yeah because oh, right yeah in a meta sense, you can definitely look at it in the way that um, uh, Evelyn, one of her non-taken paths, could have been what Michelle Yeoh has as a life. Yes. And um, it's cool because it plays on our understanding and familiarity with Michelle Yeoh being a, like a kung fu star. And like that's yep. what she is in this universe, and she's relying on that. She's drawing the skills of that universe to help her in the one that we're seeing in this film. Just like, man... I wasn't prepared for this level of meta. That's that's real neat. Um, yeah, it's a movie called uh, Crazy Rich Asian she was in. That's that's the red carpet she was on. So I'm pretty sure that's just legit footage that they took f to involve in the movie. You wonder about Probably licensing would. for that. Like, there, yeah, I was about to say, the rights to that footage, are you able to... That's interesting. Well, I guess so, right? I guess I got it. Yeah, imagine, good on them yeah you would the go music. to ABC or wh whoever specifically recorded that I red imagine carpet footage. There's thing, th things that cost a lot of money. That's got to be on the lower end, right? Like, can I have access Probably. to red carpet footage? Yeah. Well, maybe they had their own people there, you know? Their own journalists that got their own as part of their company. I don't know. <laughs> maybe they, they had this all planned well ahead of time, you know? They knew. But, uh, yeah, she beats Deirdre pretty easily when she gets her, uh, her powers up and running. And it's just a moment of, like... She's beginning to believe, but the equivalent for yeah. this movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's like when he fights Agent Smith and like he realizes like it's all just code and he can fucking do anything. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, she's kind of blown away by this. Um, 
And she says, I saw my life without you. I wish you could have seen it. It was beautiful. I should have listened to my father and not gone with you all those years ago. And it's just like, oh, fucking hell. Sad. Yeah, that's sad. Yes, uh, there's a lot of things. How little he understands about anything that's going on. Um, and what's so great about that, right? It's a heartbreaking line. And then it cuts to uh, Waymond, and yeah. he reacts to it in with a really well, like genuine hurt, right? You can see it on his face. And he turns around in the same shot. And he faces her again, and he's like in alphaverse mode. And it's just like, he's, he has such, not only bodily control, but like em control over his emotions, where he can switch from something, like from a heartbroken reaction like that to like... He just goes, oh, Chad, yes. It's like, yes. yes, yes. Divorce now. I've completely now. forgotten about that, and now I am in like Superman mode again. And here we go. Yeah, he carries like, himself really well for that. Yeah, he's so good. Um, and it's it's interesting to note that she has a tear out of her eye when she's she's thinking about all of that. I um, it's a tough interpretation to have, but there is a really good chance there that she's genuinely forgetting what it means, what she's actually saying when she says that to him, and she's instead actually commenting on like, I really wish Wayman could see this, like what what it is, what I was in this other world. I don't think she intends to say like, what a mistake you were. I think she's oh, like, just, to like I don't think so. deliberately no, make him feel so. bad, right? Yeah. Because, like, yeah, so it's, it's just blown away by the potential that she never knew she had, sort of thing. Um, right. The other thing I really liked about it as well is when she f first knocks Deirdre into the wall, um, the first thing Wayman says is, uh, why? How did you do that? Like, the first thing he wanted to actually say was, why would you do that? As in, why would you hurt her like that? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's where his priorities that's are. Where his priorities are, as we'll see going forward. Um, but yeah, Alpha Wayman is back, and he says, now you're definitely going to be on Jobu's uh, radar. We gotta go. Um, and they hide in, like, a little boardroom, and that's when he starts to explain a little more detail what the uh, central... and, like, who Jobu is. Um, yeah, and it's a, the boardroom has a bunch of bagels. Yep. Um... So yeah, because uh, he highlights that they should eat. Um, uh, try and get some energy. Yeah, a lot of energy consumption with this sort of thing. Um, but she starts getting distracted by the the other world paparazzi stuff, bringing her back in, and he explains that like the more jumping, well, whenever you jump, it's like you're deliberately uh, cutting a piece of like thing out of your stability in your mind, and that um when you get used to this and more talented at it, you can seal it back up, but sometimes they'll remain open a little longer than you would have preferred, and the more you do it, the more your clay pot will get uh, leaks, is how he, how he explains it. Um, and then she says, what if I want to be in the other universe? What if I just, I just want to be there? And he, like, goes nuts, fucking slaps her, and says, shut it down, and, and he says, like, uh, mm. goes on to explain, basically, that if that clay pot shatters, you'll die, or worse. And uh, she's like, what could possibly be worse than death? He doesn't answer the question. How interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's when, I think this is where he explains, like, fully how all of the mechanics work, or at least the last piece of it for us to get it on board, but I, I think we've mostly covered it by now anyway. I like um, when he eats the bagel and he focuses on the fact that it has cream cheese on it. Yeah. Like, just cream cheese. And you obviously juxtapose that with the idea of putting everything on it, right? Like, sometimes it's good to orient yourself towards, like, a, like a, a singularity on some level. Yeah, and he says... I'm explaining that well. Well, no, he, and, and he appreciates it so much because of the fact that they don't have cheese in his world anymore. Oh, right. Because uh, Jobu, the fight with Jobu has wiped out all kinds of uh, stuff like that. I think he says we lost all the cattle or something. Um... But yeah, uh, so she asks for an explanation, he says, so Jobu has lost any sense of morality and any belief in objective truth. Uh, all they know is she's looking for Evelyn, and she's incredibly dangerous. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Evelyn gets distracted again by the, the flashing lights of, I think it's like the emergency lights in the area, because the place is locked down. They flash into flashing of the photography shit from her other universe. And she spends a little chunk of time there, enjoying it. And she actually spots in her universe 
the Waymond is there in in the celebrity one. Um, and he's looking great, like very well put together, uh, very successful, which is like really interesting to her, I guess, because she just assumed uh, what we could have picked up from the other parts of the movie so far that he's a bit of like an, an anchor or a, dare I say like a weight. And so obviously if she were unburdened by him, she could be successful, which is what she first concluded, but he's successful without her. So it's like, there's more to think about there, but they don't get to think about it for very long. Because they, she has, they both are, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she gets, uh, she gets handcuffed. And it's like, wait, what? And it's because uh, she was daydreaming a little too much there, and unfortunately the police have now caught up to him, or at least the security guards, and they've put handcuffs on both of them. And <laughs> this is just this great moment where she's phased back in, she's pretty confused, and Alpha Wayman is like, Evelyn, quick, pee, it's a great jumping pad. <laughs> and then they tase him and I'm just like amused by the idea that they're listening to this guy say that after he's beaten the fuck out of all of them several times like and yeah so for anybody who's confused like well why didn't he beat them again um these powers are temporary they only work as a as a sort of connection to the person you've slung shot yourself to for like I would guess something like five minutes they don't they're pretty temporary they don't work very long um so that's he, not the first time they mentioned jumping pads is it like I it's probably addressed in the exposition scene with uh Wayman, right, where he's explaining the alphaverse, he explains the jumping pad concept. Yeah, yeah, we've already gone over it as well. Like the right, okay. a jumping pad is is just reference to what action you can take that's so improbable it can send you to another place sort of thing. Right. Um so yeah, he's now out of it and um the police have got him, but there's someone coming up in the elevator and the guard is like, We don't need any backup, we got him. But they keep coming. And it's Jobu Tupake. Uh who's finally arrived. And she's um she's dressed pretty uniquely, I would say. Uh, I, I don't really care about like outfits ever in movies because it's not something I generally pay attention to. But um she has so many amazing outfits in this movie. It's actually unreal. It you, must have been a lot of fun for costume to do like thirty or forty different costumes. At least, yeah, like high quality, like a lot of work too. Not just like an outfit, but like the whole shebang, like the shoes, the outfit, the accessories, is, and they're like all of them are ridiculous. Like, yeah, and sometimes for costumes that are only on screen for like thirty or forty seconds, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's a lot of work. But I mean, you even see that in like the quick flashes of these different universes. It's like, yeah, you had to shoot that. It's like each one of these is on screen for what, like a split second. It's like a whole bunch of work that would have had to go yeah. into each of these, or like the flashes in the different universes when Evelyn was earlier on and then later on <laughs> like, yeah you know. it's like not not only a new costume across the different renditions of chaos by that particular character but just like every time they jump to a new universe or a new kind of like genre of film whenever they jump to an old like kung fu thing or you know that well, like that's all guess, set design and production design and unique costumes and stuff like something I really appreciate that uh, the effort I presume this would have been intentional, or it may not have been, but just the fact that the the costumes, their absurdity starts to almost become a little like less absurd and surprising um, as it goes on. It just becomes something you get pretty accustomed to pretty quickly. Yeah, which is kind of like uh, interesting in terms of again how it ties into uh, something that becomes, I guess, much more clear as a point. Like yeah, and they're not. But. They're not just thrown in to be wacky. It's like, is it, once you understand what kind of character Joe Butupaki is, uh, it'll make a lot of sense that she... Well, this whole scene will give you a great idea of what kind of character she is anyway. Um, it's funny as well, when she first arrives, Evelyn just goes, Joy? Why do you look so stupid? <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> no, it's like that's, that's the only thing she has to say about this whole situation at this point. Uh, and that's what's really fun about Evelyn. I think that she very consistently will, like, change her priorities because th that's just what she has concerns regarding. Like, think of everything she's just been through. But she sees Joy in a weird outfit, so she just wants to comment on that while she's being arrested. Well, think, but <laughs> who knows at this point? These are, like, gra the grounding elements in her life that matter to her even in the face of a situation where she has to have some understanding that the stakes are really significant. We're talking about, like, you know, the multiverse, essentially. But even, even in coaxed in that uh that situation it's still the things that in her life and the people that she cares about that are grounding her i mean we saw it earlier when um she accidentally jumped into that conversation with wayland um 
uh, Wayland Wayman <laughs> when um uh when they were talking about the divorce in that universe, and it's like even though she's in the middle of like a fight here, um you know, and and the stakes are really high, she's still invested in this universe's Wayman and the situation that's happening there when it almost doesn't make sense in a very cold and clinical way to be focused on these things. These things don't matter in a sense, you know, like in the grand scheme of things, but they do, they matter to her. Um, yes. This feels indicative of something. <laughs> this artwork is awesome, by the way. Uh, beautiful. It's got so many references to the things that happened in this film, but later that will make more sense, I suppose, as we get there. But thank you very much. That's from uh, mm -hmm. Live Art Chain. Yes, you get yes. great fan art. It's so good. Absolutely do. The wonderful, talented fans. That bagel, I wonder what that's about. Yeah, no idea. Or why you're lifting your... That is? Your, 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 why would you call that a bagel? Could be a donut. Oh, it could be a donut. But I, I just get the distinct impression that it's a bagel. Don't know why you're lifting okay. your pinky finger there. Don't know what relevance that'll have. My fingers are pretty long, but that's that matches. You, I'm a long person. That's, so how you know. eat, that's how you eat a bagel politely, is you stick your pinky through the hole, and you just go around the edge. And just work your way inwards. Totally. But yeah. Just spin it around. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. And it look, does look very, very neat. I like this one a lot. Um, yeah, the, uh, I think the officer says, um, you can't be here. And she says, what you mean is I'm not allowed to be here. I can be here. And then uh, I think she says something like uh, something about going through him, right? Um, yeah, she says, uh, you're going to make me walk through you? And he says, you can't do that either. And then she says, well, you see, you're wrong again. She turns him into confetti. And then does walk through him. <gasps> Look at that. Play in with the rules like that. To be fair, you don't need to convert <laughs> someone into confetti to walk through him, though. It would just be a lot messier if you did it without doing that. So, she's showing off some unbelievable powers. This, this, uh, seems pretty fun. Um... I don't, I don't even the, if, like completely setting aside the comedy of it. This is like one of the greatest depictions of chaos in film that I can think of. You oh, know, yeah. like this character that can just be anything and completely tear apart reality and reform it to however, you know, like not even Th Thanos with the reality, reality stone was as no one you're as fun, entertaining as this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he converts his gun a into a bong. Guy. Yeah, Thanos never converted anything into a bong, did he? The biggest, biggest flaw in the film, I'd say. But yeah, she. A lot of things happen. It's kind of. I don't even know how to explain this to you as someone who just doesn't know anything about this film. A lot of weird things happen. She, she, she has a dance with one of the security guards slash cops, and then the other one, out of desperation, tries to shoot at her, and he ends up. It's this is like. He's literally killing probably one of his friends, but the situation is so absurd, it just, it's funny. Like him shooting, it, with the music and the lighting as well at the same time, it's all so the fucking crazy. Motion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and, uh, yeah, uh, she then jumps into the guy, uh, like up, and then turns him into like a wrestling match where she's just converted him into being, I don't even know what this move was called, I'm sorry, Metal's not here, so we can't tell us. He fucking gets his neck broken, which again, it's really rough, but it's all so absurd at this point that we don't even know what, like, we're supposed to exactly make of all of this. Yeah. It's a great villain intro. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, this well, is a staggering another... amount of power that this character is in possession of. I think we jump between, there are some instances where it's not the case, and then sometimes where it is where it's very much about us having the same perspective as Evelyn while uh, while watching all of this happen. You know, like, we're just as confused as she is. But then it'll all start to make sense eventually, once yeah. we start getting more explanations for how things work. Oh, well, people saying pile driver is what she did to him. Damn. Uh, yeah, she even takes a bullet and blood splatters everywhere, but then she just says, don't worry, it's ketchup, or whatever. And it's like, oh, and, um, the guard then, realizing his gun doesn't work, tries to hit it with, uh, with his baton. And then s something else happens, which, which was, you know... It actually reminded me of Saints Row the Third. You guys ever play that? Yeah. yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I never played that one. 
I believe in that game, ago. there that is... Like, it's like a 10-year-old game, Saints Row 3. Am I crazy? It is. Yeah, yeah it's, it's old as fuck. It's 11 years old, I think. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in that game, you get, I believe, a dildo sword. And uh, let's just say that's relevant <laughs> to this moment, where she converts his baton into one and beats him half to death with it. Uh, God, I that was in San Andreas as well. You could get a dildo melee weapon. But yeah. Oh, it could have been that. Yeah, it, it, maybe it was both. I don't even know. But um, yeah, at this point, you got the cinematic view, the the music, the, the just the violence of it all, and then dildos. It's just like um, and it's, it's I think it's supposed to just uh, sort of over over. There's just so much yeah. shit all at the same time. You don't even know what to make of it. And yeah, um, I think Evelyn says uh, your juju tabuki. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, because she's not getting the name right still. Uh, yeah, and then it, like, cycles down a little bit. Uh, enough of the insane, crazy shit. Or or at least we, we're we getting there, because um, other points are about to be made. But they have a moment of her catching up to Avalyn, and actually uh, they use, like, Looney Tunes sound effects. Just for this moment. <laughs> um, there's a couple of... There's a use of... Um, you know the, the sound uh, it makes when... I'm not sure if there's a better word for this. You might know it, Frankie. But in Smash Bros, when you do hit someone with like the maximum power move, and it like goes. Oh yeah, and then it has that high pitch like. Uh, it's hard to I was simulate it. Try and emulate it, but yeah. I can't. Yeah. Oh, it's a smash, right? It might be. Um, but it's a like lot a of people... maximum power A move. Like well, it's like you know when you're in, uh, in melee, you and they give you like they give you the baseball bat. You know how like they've got that little. Uh, boxing bag and then you try and hit it like it's the yeah. sound that that makes yeah when you go to full full power yeah. strength smash it everyone's you know, heard it record well yeah, yeah. and, and from what it, i could yeah. see from different discussions it's like everyone's saying it's referencing smash bros i was like is smash bros where it originates or is that referencing something it itself because no way i no, wouldn't have thought it would have originated from originate. smash bros I, but i don't know i've got no clue i just know it so well i don't know the origins of it yeah uh, but you know the, the the references are fun. They're neat, and uh, so Evelyn's like, doesn't matter that you can do all that. I can beat you. I've been learning about all this. I'm gonna do it. And so Jobu's like, all right, do it. And so she concentrates real hard. She learns all she uses all the knowledge she's gained, and that includes Waymond earlier suggesting a good jumping pad being peeing yourself. So she does that, and she focuses on the world where she is the martial arts expert. Unfortunately, she gets a little confused because she's with the, the paparazzi on the red carpet, flashing lights, gets a little confused. She sees a poster for a guy holding hot dogs. And then um, it cycles her over and around a more familiar uh, multiversal place where she's doing her taxes and she sees a picture of a, drawn by a kid of someone, uh, presumably done by Joy, uh, where their fingers look a little, a little weird. <laughs> yeah, you know? and uh, all that information gets tangled up, and she does manage to travel to a different multiversal place and draw, let's say, a skill from it. Uh, and I think this is yeah. the part of the movie that really it can make or break it for a lot of people. Uh, at a least skill that's what I've sorts. discovered. Her cuffs fall off, and you're like, oh, and that's because her hands, at least temporarily are like boneless essentially and yeah. uh, they just be flopping around and it's like it's like you get this brief moment for the audience to try and guess what's happened because you ain't gonna guess what's happened and uh yeah they establish that she's uh drawn from a world where everyone's hands are, are hot dogs uh, well their fingers are hot dogs um and like now, i said what really sells this gag is when we jump back a million years ago when there's a bunch of uh, apes having a, a, a fight and the, the hot dog hand apes win and triumph over the human, more like <laughs> human hand uh, apes. Yeah, they felt the need to provide us a basic justification that in the evolutionary yeah, chain of, of humanity there was a deviation that had hot dog fingers and they battled and uh, the hot dog fingers won. I think I think the fact the the the, the shitty 
ape costumes sell this and i think oh, that's yeah. intentional I, I, it's the, just... well, the, the big part is when he's screaming to the heavens while flailing his hot dog fingers <laughs> <laughs> I love I love the shot of it tightening up on the classic human hand and its and its defeat. Just <laughs> like, drenched in blood. It's a good. I gag. couldn't believe what I was watching at this point. You know, like there's a few plateaus for me where I got that feeling, and this was one of them. Where it's just like, because it's obviously doing like a 2001 thing here. Yeah, and uh, like just this is so ridiculous. Like, I've never seen a movie do this. Something like this. Like, to have the balls to make a joke like this. And, uh... Once this happened, it's just like... Alright, I don't know what's coming after, like but like, I'm on, on board. Table. Like, I was totally sold at this point, you know? That's the thing. I think you can have multiple reactions to this. Some people would feel this is too absurd. They're, they're, they're lost now. They're not, they're not following it. While I think we were, um... I was so fucking ready for whatever else they wanted to try. I was like, if, you, if you're going to commit to stuff like this, this will be great. Some people oh, are like, yeah. how did you not get it? it was a 2001 reference? How do you think anybody's going to point that out and it would be interesting information to anybody? It's like the most obvious thing ever. <laughs> this is like, everyone knows this scene from 2001. Some people who haven't even seen the film. It's like one of the most famous movie scenes. Anyone who's seen the movie, yeah, because the shot is so similar, right? Oh yeah, it's it's it's, it's parodying it, but like it's yes. obviously I was just going over it mechanically. It's fucking hilarious. Some people are saying as well, wouldn't the universe be completely different if it changed all the way back there? And uh... wait, hang on. Someone said, "Wow, really breaking artistic boundaries." If you don't agree, that's just because you're not smart enough to understand the significance. It's like I don't. Nobody said that. You oh, don't. Fuck. If you don't enjoy, it, that's that's fine. Um... Uh, to me, yeah, well, it's totally all right. I will say, I've seen because uh, I, I saw the guy who posted that posted the same uh, comment a few times about, oh. like, uh, yeah, it's like, um, oh, here we go. Th yeah, there it is. Thank God he's here to describe the movie. I'm blind, so I couldn't watch it. That's okay, a very profound, observation. I could understand why the boundaries are falling down. You've awoken me to the knowledge that, like, talking about a movie is just making observations about what's happening in the scene. Yeah, like, more. a lot of the more substantive sort of comparisons and analysis will be in the second half of the film. The first half is telling well, you what is being shown and given to you as a information. Lot of what, like, it's a lot of what storytelling is, at, at least in the case of good storytelling, when you, like, build up your, uh, I guess you're stacking your blocks, you know, you're sort yeah. of building the tapestry so that then you can start to have your really meaningful payoffs. Payoffs usually don't come in the beginning. That's like all the setups. The setups are super important because yep. without the setups, payoffs are just kind of like, just kind of the idea that you have. It's not really much of anything. Well, to go for a classic, if we were trying to talk about how well done like Shaun of the Dead is, and then I go, so Shaun mentions that there's a gun above the bar, or uh, uh, Ed does, and then Shaun's like, well, it's deactivated, isn't it? Like someone could be like, why are you just repeating the dialogue? And I'd be like, well, because you need to know, and we need to establish that's a thing, so then when we get to it, it's uh, it's not just out of nowhere. And that's appreciating how they've written it. Um, so, yeah, I think we've talked about a couple of the, the pieces to compare and to praise at this point, but it's just going to become way more common the further along we get, because that's, that's just how it works, yeah. Um, as for, like, I don't know, Thinking this is a bit much, like I said, this is like I don't think you have to be intelligent or something to to appreciate this. It's just it may work for you, it may it may not. Uh, the the whole sausage fingers thing. I think it was pretty bold of them to try. And what's neat about it, I think, is that they commit pretty hardcore. They don't. Um... They do. Yeah, <laughs> it's not just a one time gag. They work I think yeah, I think they do a really good job at like anytime they introduce a joke, it's pretty relevant throughout the entire movie, and they manage to build like sincerely off of everything, which I think is pretty admirable because they always seem like all of these are going to be like one-off gags, and they end up becoming more meaningful. Yeah, and they're already laying the yeah. groundwork. We've got um, she pushes Deirdre off her in this world, and then you catch her saying, um, "Why, why you you're always so warm, but then suddenly so cold?" Like pretty casually, and it's like that it could just be a throwaway line, or it could be something that's a little bit more important. Who knows as we move forward. Uh, for the sausage world, but one of the things we see is that, I guess, are we supposed to interpret this as the equivalent of sex in the sausage world, where you put your fingers in each other's mouths and then it sprays out mustard and ketchup? I, mean, I, guess I think it makes that's the sense. idea. I don't, 
I'm not sure why the hot dogs would spray out mustard and ketchup, but <laughs> I don't know you. Who knows? Think, Maybe that was I... like an evolutionary advantage during <laughs> well, the, uh, the just... prehistoric times. The monkeys that could spray mustard at their uh, foes while they were being hunted were the ones who survived. It's so stupid, right? And that's kind of the point. Like, if you're doing a movie it's about encapsulating the multiverse, like it's you have to kind of visualize the absolute absurdity on either end of that. And, you know, that, that includes a universe where everyone has hot dogs for fingers. And there's, uh, there's another universe that this movie incorporates that I won't touch on yet, but it's just like, cause we're not there yet, but it's just like equally, if not more stupid. And it's just like, that's, that's what you do. If you're doing like a multiverse story, if you want to like demonstrate the stupidity that comes along with that, you illustrate universes like this, you know, that's what I think. Like I said, it's really testing the bounds of a lot of audience members who just, it'll be too far for them, but I think they handle it really well, <laughs> all things considered. Well, the fact that uh, they will reincorporate that later into something meaningful. Um, that world, anyway. Which you, yeah, which you just wouldn't really expect from a lot of other things. No, it's just I, a think, um, I think in a movie that was uh, less thoughtful, that would just be a one-off joke. That would be it. It's just like, haha, isn't that funny and absurd? Anyway, moving on, like that you wouldn't try and leverage it to do something meaningful later on. Mm -hmm. um, you guys going to analyze paint drying next? I wait in anticipation after the engaging analysis of nightstick etymology. Hey, I didn't know that truncheon was British only. And I'm so sorry that took up 0.01%. I think you're gonna be fine. Anyway, <laughs> we got a uh, so so after that, and I think it it really primes you right in terms of the juxtaposition of the tone in this film. We go from that, and now we're going into Jobu explaining her motivation and her plans, which are not exactly funny, uh, and the movie has to try and balance that uh, pretty well. So what she explains to her, I think. At first, I can't remember if this is where she first talks about the, the bagel, actually. I think it is, right? Uh, uh, it's referenced uh, it earlier, yes. but I think is this first. is when we finally see it. There's a lot of visual hints in the, like, even the first act, yeah. Yeah, so... You see, like, the little Marvel Church thing, but the drapes are still down. Or the veil. Yeah, and she's like, let me help you out, because she's got sausage fingers, and she... Does the little, this little like hand game where you put your your fingers together and you open up on the other side, but instead of what you may have expected, we see mystical room. What could it mean? Um, yeah, and so she says, uh, "I made a bagel and I put everything Wait, on it." Do you do you guys know the silly hand references or? Well, I don't know what they're called. I, I remember that from school. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. People yeah, putting their like hands together. Vagina. I yeah. I I did not do that. I, I remember it was like it was a pussy joke when I grew up in school because like you would stretch the like the the what do you call it the f you know the flaps of skin between the fingers you would like labia put your fingers together <laughs> and stretch it out and it looked like a vagina I guess yeah I think they call them the things between your fingers I think are labia the webbing yeah the that's what, what that's what I mean, that's like what the they were referring to not what they really mm. right I'm 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 learning about this this strange vaginal gesticulation we're talking about the anatomy of the fingers rags i mean i i know it's just like what it's supposed to potentially represent i'm i'm it learning that, about it this. wasn't that it was my now. school it was just a fun little hand game there was a fucking me and john went to different schools it was definitely it was definitely yeah like it wasn't just a fun hand gesture because i remember it too but what was well, so enlighten me what was it then like it's. It looks like it's vagina. Like, that's, 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 that's that's no. Is that why? It, so because you mentioned, did you say it originated in China, uh, Destiny? <laughs> no, I, <don't> know. <laughs> I literally thought no, I heard someone say that. I was like, you got to explain like how it's vagina. relevant. Or... Vagina. vagina. Ah, now vagina. everything makes sense. I thought you... China vagina. I thought John brought that in randomly. I didn't realize. No, it was I don't remember around. any kind of game element to that. I just it's remember people did that because it looked like a vagina. That's yeah, you see, put we're your all, hand we're all confused here. And you look at it, it's supposed to be like, oh my god, that's what a vagina looks like. That's like the whole point. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that, that is what they look like, yeah. <laughs> so I guess it's... Well, what about the other one uh, that they do at the end? The other hand gesture, you know that one? another one later? I think that's just like another game they put. I don't think it's supposed to look like a vagina. Yeah, I was going to say, that, 
That one's definitely a game, right? There's no fucking vagina imagery with that one that I'm unaware of. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, but anyway, she says she puts everything on the bagel, including uh, every report card, breeds of dog, every personal ad on Craigslist, uh, or Craigslist for Americans. And she... Uh, there's, there's a couple that flash on. <laughs> there was one that I saw. I'll try and get the image on the screen for everybody, but... Uh, it says, ladies, hello, bathtub, male for women, man for woman, I guess. Because I never actually, I've never been on Craigslist, so I'm assuming that's what it means. Um, it says, hello, beautiful, who are you? Come to my door open, come, par come to party my door open, many riches in me, beautiful water, splish splash to my bath. I am very serious man, looking for love, sing to you. So that's, just, that's what it says. Jesus Christ, I'm I'm halfway there already, just reading I, that. Oh. I really hope they're real ones that they took from uh, Craigslist rather than made up. That I, wouldn't it it funny, yeah. I wouldn't put it past them. I wouldn't put it past them. I'd be surprised if they weren't real. One of them is Cash for Tickle. Yeah, there, <laughs> there it is. All right. Something for the... Uh... <laughs> Do not contact me with unsolicited services or offers. There you go. Nice and official. Um, yeah, she says, Unfortunately, the bagel collapsed in on itself. Because, you see, when you put everything on a bagel, it becomes this. And, uh, like a big, scary, kind of black hole sort of situation. And she says, The truth. And then Evelyn says, What do you mean? What's the truth? She says, Nothing matters. Which... Yeah, you're around about the hour mark into this film, where, um... ...become clear that that is the villain's point of view. If, or no, rather, antagonist, I suppose. Oh, we, uh, I mean, it's pretty explicit, we, I don't know if there's anything else we, to... Yeah, well, we've, yes, that's basically, we've jumped right into the whole nihilism fun <laughs> stemming from all of this. Yeah, um... Like the absurdity of so much that there's, like, no meaning derived from anything. And that's Jobu's perspective because she's seen everything. Just everything. She's been exposed to everything, which is Act 1, right? Sort of establishing this as being like the, um... I guess in a sense, like, the beginning of, uh, the subtext rapidly becoming text. Yes, though... This is more so the introduction to this portion of the film, because this, I don't think, has been given to us in any real way yet, uh, Jobu's perspective. This is obviously, like, her intro scene. Um, she says, it feels nice, doesn't it? If nothing matters, all the guilt and pain you feel from making nothing of your life goes away. Sucked into a bagel. Which is said in a way that I think softens the blow of this sort of uh, moment in the film, which is a little bit of a dark thing to say, uh, but she's even shedding a tear when she does it as well. One of the things that I think this film does exceedingly well is it layers a lot of themes and then a lot of separate stories onto one thing that all becomes like reinforcing or self reinforcing. Um, so, like, on one hand, we've got like the family is just struggling with taxes and business stuff. And then on the other hand, we've got like this multiverse story superhero thing going on. And then on the other hand, we've got like a deeper rift in the family that needs to be solved. And then on the other hand, we've got they're introducing this like broader concept of like existentialism from nihilism, which is like a like an age old kind of like existentialism is supposed to be the rejection of nihilism and all of that. They're kind of like being in that journey, too. I think they do a really good job for the entirety of this film of like hitting on so many different plot points. It seems like it's going around in a bunch of different areas, but they all kind of reinforce onto like all the other themes and narratives. So it works really well. Um, instead of it feeling like you're getting ripped around into 20 different things, like you'll bounce onto one point that will reinforce another point that will reinforce another point that will reinforce another point. I think this film does that really, really well. It's, uh... Yeah, like it, yes, it's hard to say that there's any like specific part that feels like it leads to a dead end that it doesn't tie back into the core in one way or another no wasted time or wasted lines that seem like they're kind of directionless we well, yeah, and lost that may appear that way they've all got stuff to to happen cuz yeah this is this is we're still essentially setting foundational work for like what we're fighting in this film or at least what uh, Evelyn will perceive she's fighting for now um this thing's going to change. But yeah, I just love that all of that is in such absurd packaging as well. Um, cause it, I feel like the, the script was so thoroughly thought out and finished, and then they shot, which is, uh, I feel like is not the norm in Hollywood. You know, they go with like an unfinished script and then they just start shooting. And oh, then... yeah. I refuse to believe 
the they don't redraft scripts like this. It's like you you have to right. You you need to you'll you'll write the whole thing and then you'll be like right. We need more work on uh, setting things right for getting people to where they're going to end up. We need to get all this stuff properly couched uh, so that it all just doesn't happen because fuck it. Um, which has been happening yeah. with a lot of movies lately, and not necessarily because of the writer's intentions, like, they just don't care. It can be because of production limits, like, the uh, the production line for Marvel movies and Star Wars stuff right now is insane. It's um, yep. Meanwhile, you find out something like uh, Squid Game or Arcane, which I just think are much stronger as, as things compared to stuff like that for mainstream. Uh, you find out it's like they had several years to get a lot of things right. Yeah. Scripts need more time, is, is the conclusion. Anyway, yeah, I mean, eyes. you would think like you would invest so much into the script because that's where everything is. The, the ideas, story. the characters, the story, like fucking everything is in that document. You know, everything. Get that right. Everywhere. And then shoot. So um, she's actually about to like her eyes start to glaze over with the uh, the, the black sort of. Well, I guess it just, it just like the whole all the eyes going black. Um, but then Gong Gong fucking plows into 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 Jobu and smashes her into a wall. because uh, he's on his like he's on like a high tech wheelchair now. And this is because he's no longer the, the father they're familiar with. He's Alpha Gong Gong. Um who's simultaneously working, I guess, with uh, Alpha Wayman in the in the same way. They have like their own factions and they're working to stop the evil that is Jobu from spreading through the multiverse. Still very much like we're in the portion of the film that's very much on the... I hesitate to say surface level. What I mean is text, basically. Like, we're, we're, we're getting closer... We're piecing sort of to, to getting to the super like meaningful the plot, character stuff. Yeah, but we're back to... Because this is the kind of thing that a lot of people get turned off by in, in like, low-budget sci-fi, should I say, where it's just like, oh, no, and then weird pronoun is coming to weird pronoun to do weird pronoun, as, as in, like, the Alakazam is gonna blah, 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 blah. When, when you don't have anything underlying it, it just it's just like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this is happening. Um, but the film keeps, like, inching toward the more uh, meaningful underlying stuff, and once you get to a certain part in this film, it, it's, like... The, uh, the crazy surface level text plot stuff starts to fall away in favor of uh, what it all actually represents. Um, but for now. I, was, I really love this wheelchair takeout where, like, uh, the grandpa in the wheelchair, she, he takes out, uh, was it Topu? Jobu. And, like, the, 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 right. And the footage is obviously, like, sped up. Like, uh, it, it looks kind of weird. Yeah, and awkward, but I appreciate that about it. Like they didn't try to smooth it out or anything with CG. You know, it's just it just looks like sped up footage, and I th I thought that was so funny when I saw that in theater. Like I was I laughed out loud. It's like I'm glad they kept that in. You know. Um. Yeah, he basically says that uh, they need to get the fuck out of this universe. Job is gonna gonna kill him, and Wayman says, "No, nah, this is the girl we're looking for, Evelyn. She can stop him." Oh, uh, here, sorry, and then. Uh, Gong Gong says they're gonna have to kill her too, essentially, because he's opened up her mind to too much, and the implication being that uh, there's like a there's like Should a become, like yeah, there's a split in the decision here between these two. One of them wants to encourage her to get to that point because he believes that she can handle the power and thus provide a good sort of counterforce counter to her. Yeah. While Gong Gong thinks that all that would happen is she would just become another one of the same problem. Um. <laughs> Which is kind of, if you think about it, again, this is like the layers of the story. Um, this is like the same thing almost that the two characters in the real world believe as well, right? Like, you would imagine that the dad is trying to make everybody happy and bring everybody together, and the grandpa's like excessively like cutting out his daughter, cutting out his daughter's daughter, like won't accept anything, right? It, it's a reference to the actual characters in the actual yes. world, too. And, it, and it's also a reference to that it's this is from inside it's it's about your perspective on that kind of revelation it's about how you process it it is something that comes from within it's not like some some superpower that you're bestowed with it's it's your personal ability to you know to have a good attitude essentially yeah because if we go with what jobu says that when you put everything on a bagel it becomes clear that nothing matters. You can draw from that. She's describing the process of what happened to her, because we already know that they said she spread everywhere. 
And so it, just because that process happens to you doesn't mean that you necessarily conclude what Jobu has. Uh, so yeah, it's functioning on several uh, layers at once, I think, which is part of what's so impressive about the script. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so uh, she doesn't believe she's, she's the one. She's having one of them moments. And he's like, no, I'm pretty sure you're the one because you're the worst Evelyn. And she's like, how could I be the worst? What about the hot dog one? And he says, um, <laughs> he says he's seen thousands of her, but never an Evelyn who's had so many goals she never finished and so many dreams she just didn't follow. She's literally living her worst version of herself. And the reason why that's important to her potential is because that means she's literally the... she's surround, Every multiverse around her splits off into a better life, is what his argument is. So... No matter where she so she has like, the most tools at her disposal, basically with the the yeah. jump first thing. Um, but I think on a more meaningful level, it's supposed to just be you have so much unrealized potential because your life has never you've never managed to get to the places you've always wanted to go. Well, yeah, because every universe just represents possibilities, possibilities that were very much within reach of you. To, I mean, to varying degrees, because there are ones that are a lot closer and ones that are further away. But essentially. Anything is possible, much more so for you because you haven't really done a whole lot. It's kind of a interesting way of tethering theme to the you know clear or external conflict. And it's I love what this movie turns into plot devices. You know, like not only the thing where like you are the quote unquote worst Evelyn because you have the you've done nothing with your life, therefore you have the maximum amount of potential energy that you can potentially harnessed to accomplish anything you want and there's like a truism in that that you can apply to your your own life i think right but then obviously the the thing with like taking things that people have might have thought a lot of doing but they never would like just just like the uh eating the chapstick thing like you know you 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 extract the whole piece of chapstick and it kind of looks like candy but you would never fucking bite into it because it would obviously it would taste gross but like there's a part of your brain that would think like what if i just bit into that like no that's totally stupid but this turns it into a plot device where a character does that and then they accomplish this thing where they get a bunch of powers and they can use that like it's a very clever script like you guys are saying and i think moments like this are designed to simultaneously reach out to people just in the world, in the audience, when he says something like, you know, you are one with the most potential because you have so many unrealized dreams and stuff. It's like, it's pretty easy for that to, for someone to think about and to maybe be motivated by. And I think the movie does that quite a bit, especially the longer you go on. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but uh, Gong Gong argues that she's succumbing to the, uh, the chaos, the splintering, and so even if... Uh, you thought she was the one sort of thing that she she won't even be able to make it she's already falling apart um but the weird thing is uh jobu is not breaking down the door and killing them right now why where is she and they they have like a moment of oh no she's not here and then we find out she's uh she's off hunting the alpha verse people because they're getting in her way which um i think is a really good idea writing wise because first of all it probably is something that she would do because she doesn't want them to get in her way with Evelyn right on the on the text level or, or rather the surface actually the surface level at this point but as a writer you need Jobu to fuck off for a bit so that Evelyn can have a bit more time uh, realizing her own potential which is what these next few scenes are about you need like a reasonable reason for why Jobu would be out of the story temporarily basically and I think they did a good job here because uh I could totally picture it being like enough of these fucking alpha verse people getting in my way, you know. And, and we know that a, a lazier writer would just say, "Oh, she, she just uh, takes a while to show up. She just shows up later." Because she's she's know, limping, she right? Because she's she she was on glass. Okay, just ignore the fact yeah. that she can fly. Nobody cares. Yeah, fuck it. Um. Yeah. Uh. Normal Wayman comes back and he lets Joy in now. Who's got a control back and she's just like in the golfing outfit and just like, what the fuck's going on and so uh evelyn tries to explain it to him that uh there's someone who comes from a different universe to puppet them and it gives them even access to abilities they don't usually have and she compares it to rakakuni uh which was <laughs> and they're like 
I mean Ratatouille? And she's like, no. Um, it's funny because at this point, I think in the film where she describes the, um, you can do things you normally can't and someone, it's like someone's taking control of you or something else and stuff. It's like, a lot of people expect she's going to say The Matrix, I think, even though she mentions puppets. Um, I don't think anybody expected her to say Rakakuni. Uh, and yeah, they just laugh at her, basically. Uh, she's not taken very seriously, and then when good old Waymond is, is, is untaping Joy because she tries to tape her down to a chair to stop her, uh, Gong Gong gives her a box cutter to, to, to kill Joy because he says, like, the way that Jobu works is the more Joys there are in the multiverse, the more access points she has, so the less there are, the more... Uh, you, you control or stop her. And uh, he says, if you're not willing to kill her in this universe, how do you expect to kill her in any other? And uh, it's, it's, I suppose, because again, we're, we're being pretty expeditious. This is like a payoff you could expect a lot later, but she basically decides she doesn't, she's not willing to kill Joy. Um, no. Kill uh, hey, Joy. kill Joy, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, don't be a kill Joy. Um, but one thing I quite liked that they do here is she says, she like pleases him, she's your granddaughter, and he says, how do you think I feel? And I think it's yeah. it's just supposed to be a little sign into, there's more going on with Gong Gong than he, than he lets on, yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm not just, yeah, I'm just, I'm not just, I'm not some heartless bastard, like, I, I really don't want this to be the way it is, I just think that this is the way it needs to be. Um, <laughs> and so he I says, like that Rakakuni feels like a one-off joke. Like uh, I wonder if Michelle like maybe improvised that line, in and the they scene. made something of it. And it's like it's such a dumb joke, and not I'm, I don't say that to like as like a detriment to the writing or anything. I'm like I I feel like that joke was written with the intention of the audience going, oh my god, that's so dumb, like Rakakuni instead of Ratatouille. But then they actually do something with that. Um, but anyway, sorry, I, I don't mean to <laughs> jump ahead. No, it's all good. Uh... So yeah, um, she refuses to kill her, and so he pulls a gun on him. I think the reason he didn't pull the gun out straight away was because uh, he was trying to see if he could get her to do it. It was like a sort yeah. of test. So at this point, if she's not willing to, he's just going to have to kill a lot of them. Um, and uh, she uh, she says, uh, he says it's only a matter of time before you become like her. And that like twigs Evelyn on to thinking about that as a strategy. He's like, maybe that's what she should pursue. And like she's having that thought, and the music swells, and so she starts dancing. And it's such a like, wait, what? Because you might have forgotten how the rules work for a little moment there. And fucking Gog Gog just says, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, and she she just prompts a slingshot, and she just goes with it. Um, she ends up with <laughs> Wayman's voice. That's what she ends up grabbing randomly. Um, is she getting instruction from her headset, presumably, at no, that I point? Think where it's like, do this, and then she dances. You know the, what I mean? The the nature of um, it for the, like the Alphaverse people, I think they are, they are told by their operators what slingshots to do to get specific powers, while she is more so at this point trying to work it out on her own, as in choose to do inaccurate or, or incongruent things, and then uh, think, focusing hard on a world she wants to get to. Um, okay, and because obviously she's like a super being in waiting, uh, that works for her where it wouldn't for the Alphaverse people. Um, but it's right. not reliable, as you can see. She ends up uh, having a bird voice for a little bit, um, and she she then her third try she manages to cycle into like a, a maid in an alternate life for the uh, the IRS building, and uh, she finds out there's a secret door in this room that she can use. And so she pops her family in there while she tries to explain the situation. And, um, it's, uh, cause yeah, it's, it's all getting a little bit more and more and more complicated, like, uh, and, and getting all these variables thrown in. And so it's getting so much more chaotic. And basically, uh, Gong Gong's decided that he needs to bring in his, his alpha force to, to kill her. Cause obviously Jobu's out of the story right now, but the other enemies to worry about. The 18. They want to kill her. So that she doesn't become a second enemy for them to have to deal with, uh, with splintering her head and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, before they can get to her, because they all, they all activate, I think he says, like, any agents within the area uh, converge on this location, because we've got a killer. And so they all start arriving, all different kinds of people. One of them is the, uh, the security guard who got hit in the face, like, twice with the, with the fanny pack. He's, like, outside giving a, um, 
an interview with the police, and then they all just start walking in. Uh, yeah, she gets a, a moment to talk to to, jo to Joy, and she says, um, I know you have these feelings, feelings that make you so sad that just you just want to give up, but it's not your fault, it's her. And then it's like really, it's getting somewhere, it's working somewhere, and then she describes her as Juju Chewbacca. And it's Juju like, Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> just like kills the moment for a daughter. Um, yeah. But yeah, they toss a, I think, tear gas into the room. And so she uses, um, I'm afraid I'm really not going to be familiar with whatever this is. Because they're in a BDSM dungeon, basically. Uh, like a secret door. And she, she uses a, an item, puts it up to her nose to to do some to, to activate a slingshot and she gets into a, a world where she sang and they even show you like the pathway for how she got there was uh when she was little she was running she slipped uh which they dare i say set up before one of her memories with gong gong is him telling her not to run in different places and so i think they're trying to imply the pathway where she chose to ignore him she fell and uh it's it's, it's, it's not nice i think she like literally stabbed both of her eyes out uh because she falls on like a stick she's holding or whatever yeah. Sticks, I think. yeah, something like that. But that takes her to a world where she became a singer, and she's got a heightened awareness of everything around her, beyond her sight, obviously, and uh, increased lung capacity, which is helpful so, in lots of ways. Kind of, kind of just taking some Daredevil <laughs> attributes, essentially. Yes. Um, and when she breathes in, uh, they they change the aspect ratio again. Just mm -hmm. that is fine. Now it's it's. It's fun the way that they do it with like the smooth transitions because you know sometimes there are movies that will just jump between sixteen by nine, and then like uh, is it it's like twenty three by nine or whatever the aspect ratio is for films. They'll just jump back and forth between them because they shot on different cameras and didn't give a shit about maintaining their aspect ratio. Um, you know Transformers Five. Have you ever well, seen that? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, oh, many times like in. leaps. I know it's 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 truly like uh, a masterpiece. One of sometimes it hard cuts between aspect ratios, and sometimes it smoothly transitions where you see. Well, it's scale. just it's very uh, on purpose. It's not just like ah, uh, well, we yes. shot with the wrong camera. Shit, we didn't get it right. All right, well, too bad. <laughs> We're just gonna jump between these aspect ratios. Yeah, for, like cropping or editing or ch fixing it up. That always bothered me in the Dark Knight. When they would cut between IMAX oh, yeah, and they the between regular IMAX camera and... footage, mm -hmm. I don't like yeah. that. When you it's just, too yeah, jarring. There's no reason yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah, I, I get I totally agree. Like they, uh, a lot of the time where they're, they're moving into the action or a cinematic sequence, they'll um, they'll make use of knowing that that change is coming, as opposed to they just change. Um, which, yeah, it can be jarring if it goes back and forth and back and forth. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't judge a film too harshly if it just. You know, one cut, whole action scene, one cut back. Mm -hmm. um, it's just when it gets excessive, I think. So yeah, she gets she gets all that, and we get another action scene. One where she's um, avoiding everybody while she's looking for get, to get gas masks off of them, which I guess is a reasonable assumption if they're using tear gas on her. She can toss them to uh, her family. And then she swallows like a frog statue -y little, little piece. Um... To prompt Trini another slingshot. Like no. Ring got very upset about that moment. But that's okay. Uh, and mm. she. He's she, gonna have to poop that out later. She is, yeah. We never saw that part in the movie. That was probably a wise choice. It's implied. Um, so. Well, unless she, uh, you know, she can just. Can, you know what? It's fine. Never mind. Uh, so she slingshots then into another universe where she's. Uh, like a, the, We've seen the guy outside before. Um. It was like a, like a pizza salesman person who's, who's spinning around the little board. You see him all the time in different places. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the idea being that she, she gets access to that, so she's got really good control with, with a, a board-like weapon. I don't even know if that would be fair to say. She grabs a riot shield off one of the, uh, the guards in the action scene. Goes like that. Um, I don't know. No, what I... Do I... Go ahead. I guess then before... she's channeling the abilities of a pizza sign spinner to be able to spin that shield around and deflect all the attacks, right? Yeah. Is it an issue plot wise that all of these people were able to get in the building with the police outside? Um well some of them are police, so I assume you could yeah. argue that they're gonna be letting people in. Maybe. 
it's just something I noticed when I watched it first through. And then I saw one of the policemen turn, and I was like, eh, it's something, but I don't know. I think when the, for fire. this upcoming fight, too, something you noticed that I mentioned before is the prop work with the shield is definitely yeah. Jackie Chan inspired 100%. Also, I think for plot devices, I don't know if this counts as looking ahead or looking behind. I think at some point you have to not treat everything too linearly. Like, maybe they could have come from nowhere. Th this is kind of a question I have. In the beginning of the movie, you remember how she punches the IRS agent, right? Yeah. Wasn't that supposed to be the original, like, all the way universe? Like, that she was in? But I think that kind of goes away. I don't know if this counts as a spoiler or not. No, I think you're right. Uh, th that's something uh -huh. that a lot of people are still trying to figure out about this film, exactly what happened to the original timeline that she was in. And a lot of people I've seen arguing, uh, the second she punched her in the face is like the splintered timeline, and that we saw the splintered one rather than the one that, let's say, maintained. But the one that maintained is probably the one that he went into the van to talk to her about the divorce, and then she left that one again. That one continued to go back to the laundromat, and like... It's the one that's the most un unharmed by all the multiverse stuff. And so I think that's the yeah, one she ends up going back to. It's hard to keep track. Yeah, so much happens. Uh, There's an establishing shot earlier in the movie as well with this pizza sign spinner in it that foreshadows this. I yeah, like I, I said, it, it, it was shown before, so it's just like a fun... Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's a little thing, but... It's probably what yep. she used uh, as reference. I think they drive past it at the beginning, so she would have picked it up as a visual. Yeah. And then gone with it, yeah. But uh, like I said, I can't really play a lot of this because of the copytisms, but uh, it's pretty fun. It's pretty cool. And the music matches all the main hits. Once again, because oh, yeah. uh, what they're working with, it makes for a very fun moment. And the first thing... Um, they sort of uh, do once... Because she defeats them all, and like uh, her family come out... And Waymond is like, did you kill that guy? And she fucking kicks a wrench into his head. And he goes, ow. She's like, no. <laughs> he's, he's clearly fine. Uh, don't worry about it. It's fine. They'll be fine. Um. <laughs> Give me one second. You know what? Yeah, if there's anything else anyone wants to talk about this this scene. Because I just gotta... No, it just, it's, it's so much... This fight, if you compare it to the first one, it's still has that exciting aspect of it and of course the characters are different the location's different and you know it's, it's darker in terms of the lighting the music is different it's it's it there's a, there's a lot of variety in the action sequences in this even when they you know when they go out later and there's another fight that happens here in the building it just it all feels different all of the fights feel very different even though some of them are like it's the same characters fighting each other it just it feels so different the way that they use the environment and the props that they have at their disposal it it just keeps things fresh you're not just watching the next acrobatic punch thing and it doesn't sort of feel samey samey a lot of good variety in the action that's happening yeah um yeah because i would go uh, as far as saying it's not just jackie chan stuff we'll we'll get there like like certainly a strong influence and for lack of a better term, it's just that there's, uh, they in include some other stuff once we... In fact, it's like the following scenes, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just good to see good action sequences. I feel like nowadays, combat and fights and movies are done so lazily, and the choreography is... It's, it's not done well, it's not acted well, there's so many cuts, you lose track of what's going on, but... There, you just, you can just have fun with these, and it's backed up by the fact that it seems to make some level of sense in terms of the the style that they're trying to present, and the fact that it even has a style at all, instead of just oh, it's a good thing all the bad guys missed all the time, or oh, it's a good thing that our main character has plot armor. You know that they do work to describe how can she be in front of you know around all these people in this small area and she could still win. Like, well, because she does this and she does that, and we set that up later. It's a really good use of the power. It gets a lot of it's a lot of like reusability. It's a power that lets you do all kinds of different things and it has a lot of different applications. I agree. Very, and did you notice yeah. there's one guy in the scene who's wearing like a trench coat, a long black trench coat, a fedora, and he has a katana? Yeah, he's got the gas mask on. <laughs> 
Just a true gamer. It's nice He's to like have representation for still. Reddit users in this in this film, you know? Like they get, they what? get their own person straight up. What we love Reddit. Oh yeah, everyone does. Um Yeah. But yeah, uh we're at we just hit four hours. Um it's, it's not as it's not a bad a ratio as it was with Doc Strange too. But I was just gonna say, no. um it, it would seem cause Destiny here, for those who don't know. He has like a whole other thing that he does on online all the time, and it involves all Ooh. kinds of amazing events every day. So he's gonna have to have to leave us, I'm afraid. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to get back in time to talk about the, the stuff that's much more interesting about this movie. Yeah, Hopefully, so you much do. about Morbius we haven't explored yet. Um, yeah, when I uh, when I finish my stuff, I'll shoot you guys a message. I'll see where you're at, and then we can come back in for a power at the end or something. Yeah. If um. Like, cause I, I don't want to restrict you. Like, if it ends up being that you need to do your stuff all day or whatever, and that's that's mm -hmm. totally fine. I'll ping you for when we actually get to like the last act, let's say, so you know that it's happening at least. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can shoot me a message. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Well. Um, all right. Yeah. In case you don't make it back, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's been fun. I'll loop back in. Hopefully, I'll see you guys later, right? Okay. Great hearing from you, man. Take care. Toodaloo. Gotcha. See ya. Um, Off he goes. Right. So. The film is pretty much established that Evelyn's getting much better at this. She's uh, she's got her understanding. It's coming along. Yes. And so uh, they start. I already seen what's happening next. This shit, man. So they're just trying to move through the building, I think, to get to a safer area. And uh, then she hears a noise to her right, and you get this shot, which um. Oh, Damn. You know what, I probably should have turned the volume on for that, it would have been more satisfying. But hey, um, this is yet another one of those things of like, it'll test your ability to sort of run with this movie or to be like, nah, this is too ridiculous. Um, we didn't have much trouble with this. So she's attacked <laughs> by the lady from the beginning, if you guys remember it. And she has a dog on a leash that she's using like a ball and chain what is he, what is even the weapon that is that? Like a mace on a chain? It's a flail. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's essentially what she's doing. Um it is Sorry, what was the word? Uh you said flail. Uh, flail. Oh, okay. It is <laughs> fucking nuts. Yeah. Um We need chat. It's not a flail. Rise, you wouldn't have lied to me, would you? I mean, I I'm it's similar it's sim definitely similar to a flail. You're, so I want you to realize what you're asking me to compare a real weapon to. Oh, I said a ball on a chain has got a name, right? It's like a flail, yeah. Morning well, star. I was, think I was thinking mace, but I guess there's a difference between that and like something with a lot more slack to it, where the, yeah, so this, the ball is on this, the ground and you kind of fling it. So that's that's a that's like that's like a flail there, right? It's like a morning star, not to be confused with an evening star. So a morning star, it has it's like a the flail. It's got the chain on it, and it's got the the ball with the spiky bits generally. Mm -hmm. Then the evening star, I think it's just the shaft with a long mace head. Oh, okay. I didn't. And know I that. think in the in a flail is generally like a, it's it's the ball chain with the spiky bit on it. Right. Okay. The flails have like as many as multiple balls on chains as well. Yes, they. I suppose they could. But um, this is as absurd as we're describing it. She literally fucking is twirling him around, the little doggo. Uh, it's it is <laughs> it it hurt to see one of my people <laughs> used in this kind of a way, but it is just a movie, <laughs> not real. So, did you know that dog rags? He's a great uh, actor. <laughs> I did not know that dog personally, <laughs> but you, you don't need to. You We're dogs all don't, all, don't all just hang out? No. We don't all just hang out. Wow, man. <laughs> do you just hang out with all people? Yeah, what if I, I would see you? And, I mean, he kind yeah. of does. If I, if, I look, if I see a human in a movie, which happens a lot, I'm not like, hey, John, you, you know that. Uh, you, know, you know them, right? You hang out. <laughs> you you know, know that human, don't you? You know On the human. earth? Somewhere, that, yeah, you know, like human person. <laughs> um, so she grabs some uh, some soda out of the out of the fridge and drinks all of it. It's like two liters or some shit. So she can slingshot herself. She gets access to a um, fuck it, all this part where she just kicks the dog to start up the, the twill. <laughs> 
It's so absurd. Um, so yeah, she she gets access to like a chef world where she's uh, she's, she's cooking up a storm, but it gives her, I guess, familiarity with cutlery, which is enough to um, get her through this this particular moment. But uh, I think That's I will. That's why play. no one ever robs the hibachi grills. I will probably play the sound for this one because it's funny. But uh, all right, chat. Here we go. Okay. God, VLC work, please. That fucking dog. Oh, no. Now, my, my head cannon is that the dog is totally fine. He's just a little shaken. Just a little shaken. He's fine, though. He'll walk it off. It was a stunt dog. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, well, exactly. It was a stunt dog. They're trained mm -hmm. to know how to bounce off cubicles and fly through the air. It's fine. It's all part of the, the stunt. This is the stunt work. And yeah, I, uh, I love that her reaction to seeing that is, No, Johnny. It's just like so absurd, like it's like deliberately shitty acting or something that's going on here, or, or it's like super campy, I don't even know. This woman is crazy, uh, in the best kind of way, I think. But, uh, is that the dog's name, Johnny? Uh, I guess so, yeah. Okay. Which um, is only fair, you know? And yeah, Evelyn like spins up a egg timer, I think, and, uh, slams it right into the bitch's face. Great. Those, those are egg timers, so that means that even though there are many, 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 many things that you would want to time in a kitchen, eggs, they really, um, I guess they, the name, they took over in terms of naming. They decided of all the things to time, eggs, for whatever reason, they got to be the name for the timer. And I wonder how that came to be. Because a lot of people cook a lot of eggs, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, people cook all kinds of stuff, that's what I'm saying, but they chose, like, Eggs got to be the thing, you know. It's not like a bake timer or a. I guess because you need to be pretty close to the mark with eggs. Chicken time. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, it needs to be minute adjustments because mm -hmm. you know a minute. If you put chicken in the oven and if you're off by a minute, it doesn't really matter. But an, an egg, yeah, being a minute over, that'll that'll get you that your your I'll egg get you will in not trouble town. As you like it. Yeah, better to be over though than under. So um. What's funny is she goes back to the chef world a little bit and realizes that she fucking literally fired an egg at a customer and the guy is like, if you don't get better, I'm gonna give you shifts to, I think Chad is the, is the other chef there, but uh, you'll notice something when they cut close to him. What's going yeah. on? What's going on in the back there? What's that? Hmm. Hmm, very interesting. Uh, so yeah, um, but then... Uh, she, she like they think they're in the clear, but then another another lad from the I think the the, the Alpha Squad whatever shows up to fight her uh, with like poles, and so I th think at this point she's literally just using her skill with cutlery to defend herself. Um, Chad, is you know good enough. What what about Chad? I think it's, it's to be able to defend yourself with cutlery. I think that's pretty. That was a Chad impressive. move, yeah, yeah. Chad move. Um, so yeah, the, 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 she does pretty well against him, but at one point they they smash into their uh, little earpieces, resetting them, and th th that essentially means that they both now lack the access they had to whatever powers they they'd gotten from their jump points. So they're just normal people, and um, they even have a little slap fight to show it, and it's pretty funny. And you get yeah. what I guess is. One of the, like again, it would be one of the funniest payoffs, or it could again throw you out of the movie. I really would hope for the prior, but they're both trying to consider what jump points they could use. What what yeah. absurd thing can you do? And they're in the office building of these um, these IRS agents. We've all got oh shit, we didn't set a flag for that, did we? I forgot. So we forgot. I can't believe we forgot. I can't believe we forgot so. that. Yeah. So. There are trophies so that you can get as an IRS agent to recognize your hard work. And, uh, they, they both spot one, uh, that's on a table. Now, judging by the shape of it, um, there's, there's a couple of options you have here to do something absurd. Yeah, we did forget to, 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 to mention it, but, um, yeah, so they both Check realize... <laughs> Chekhov's, uh... Award slash. <laughs> well, you'll find out. Yes. Chekhov's 
Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. You just, like, you never expect to see a, a movie with this level of execution and budget have a scene where our protagonist is trying to prevent someone from shoving something up his ass. That is actually yeah, what this uh -huh. scene is. But it's all been set up with all of the mechanics that they have in this story. It's yeah. great. There is a reason for it, yeah. This all makes sense, dare I say. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is fucking hilarious. Um, or at least we found it hilarious. Uh... But yeah, she she manages to keep it away from him, and they actually like they start fighting on the floor. And um, Waymond and Joy start suggesting crazy things she could do to prompt a slingshot because they only have a brief understanding that she needs to do weird things. That's all. Um, yeah, yeah. From their perspective, they they just do a weird random thing, and it works. And so Joy suggests blowing his nose with like with your mouth to make him just feel weird. a little weird yeah. yeah it's just a really weird thing to do because uh wayman says do jumping jacks and she says that's not weird at all it's like yeah i guess that's not that weird to do jumping jacks you know it's not it's not that out of the realm yeah, not compared to all that other weird mm -hmm. stuff because mm -hmm. we saw we saw a whole bunch at once when they were fighting in the office uh when they all needed to adjust their skills when they got in the room and one like xeroxed his butt one of them was licking the column. One <laughs> yeah. of them was like humping a, a, a lamp. lamp. Yeah. 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 Like they were just doing all this weird stuff. And that's the thing. It's just the more incongruent with what you would have done, the better. That's actually something Wayman says when he first introduces this idea to her. He explains it all and then she says, that makes no sense. And he goes, exactly. This is like, the, yeah. this sometimes with that light is just bullshit. But like the way they do that is great because that's his whole point. You, you have to do things that don't make sense. Yeah, well, um, the, the framework is correct for a line of that, for a line like that to work, you know. So, while they're fighting, a third person gets involved in this in this battle, <gasps> and he this this third person is also aware of the potential jump point they've just highlighted. <laughs> just like the Deirdre one, where she's go with a knee coming out your like right at them. Like, when you see this image in the film... <laughs> Just seeing... This, this is a serious movie that it's, has very really important is. things to say about the human condition. <laughs> it really is. I was alone in the theater except for one elderly couple watching this movie. <laughs> and I was laughing like a fucking idiot during this. And they... I don't think they were laughing. Maybe a few, like, snickers. But it's just like... Dude, how can you not find this fucking hilarious what's happening right now, you know? I couldn't but, believe what I was seeing. He just slams right down, and he's, like, so very uh, happy with himself for, for having, you know, committed to that decision. And, and I really like the, um... I really like the, the sensor, how it's blurred yeah. in the... Movie here. <laughs> they don't they don't try to hide it artistically or anything like that or yeah. just cut off the frame at the side they're just like no nah, fuck it and they just censor it in a very yeah. obvious way that makes and it I funnier i love yeah. that it's funnier yeah i i can't even explain why it just is i was so impressed by how aligned my laughter was with the intent of the film you know because usually when yeah. i'm laughing at films nowadays it's like all for the wrong reasons because the execution is terrible well, yeah i was even surprised that uh there would be moments where they've got their absurd crazy bullshit and they've used the world established of the crazy bullshit to do something a little bit more serious like that happens a bit later a couple of times with one of some of the universes we're familiar with and it was working for me um it wasn't like i can't take this for what it what you're trying to say with what you mean um through it because it's so absurd it was actually getting through but it's the thing it's a really tough balance that they try and maintain in this film of this yes getting the right feelings across it's, it's a tough one um, totally yeah, and then they have their uh, big old fight scene while, and I think Rags, you were the first one to point it out when we were watching it, it's still in him. It's just hagging out. It's just dangling. <laughs> they still have it. <laughs> They're a little generous with it. He must be, his, his cheeks must be really squeezed <laughs> during this whole fight to keep that in. But it's so funny to see them fighting in this. They're fighting with stuff sticking out their butts. And that's well, just, just part um, of the movie. 
I feel like this is a really strong example of, I guess, uh, if like somebody's approaching telling a story, finding mechanics that you can that are really versatile that give you a lot of options for um whatever it is you're trying to achieve and in this case it's comedy so it's like what are our rules um if you want to gain attributes from another universe you need to do things that are so out of the ordinary uh that it will slingshot you into those universes and you can acquire those attributes it's like out of the ordinary what does that mean it's like depends on how imaginative you are but in this case yeah. well let me show matter. you because remember, this is the multiverse. You can essentially do whatever you want. Um, yep. And I think that's what they recognized while they were making this film. They had to have because this is, what's, this is what they've created. Is like, yeah, let's have them shove trophies up their bums and that'll catapult them into universes where they've got like crazy skills. It's just, um, I guess What's it's almost a- thinking about like uh, like your, your mechanics in your story and like a speculative fiction story or almost like a canvas and it's like the more the more breadth you can afford uh, those rules, the more um, the more you can fit onto that canvas. This is more what I would call meaningful creativity. If you compare yeah. it to Multiverse of Madness, Multiverse well, of Madness I mean, with a much 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 larger budget gives you so well, much less feeling about the multiverse. And this, with such a tinier budget, does it in a more creative way. Well, it's because budget is budget is irrelevant. It's it's the uh, it's the writing essentially. I well, guess it would I be mean, the budget would help you realize the, visuals, the ideas, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's realizing particularly with visuals, and because mm-hmm. if, if you go back to Multiverse of Madness, they had the paint dimension and all these crazy, just crazy shit, right? But we only saw a tiny little glimpse. We only of see it for it a second. Gone. Yeah, yeah. It was like and, a it was a cool sequence, but it was nothing meaningful when it comes to leveraging yeah. the multiverse. Is what we talked about when we talked about the film. It's like how many multiverses do we go to? So we have our universe, a slightly more futuristic universe, and an empty kind of breaking apart universe. It's like there is no universe where, say, like I don't know, Loki one, and there are a bunch of Tatari everywhere. Um, or like a universe where um, humanity didn't evolve to exist at all and it's filled with dinosaurs or something. We see a glimpse of it, but we don't spend any time there. It's like, so it's not really a meaningful exploration of any of these uh, these worlds. My brain just is like, ooh, it's just a visual. That world world is just a visual. That's that's neat. A noir world, that's kind of neat. Like, oh, a cartoon world, huh, fun. But you don't do anything with it other than show it. But the Um, hot dog finger world. Yeah. The hot dog finger yeah. Well, think when, about everything that comes dancing, from it. From... What, in the movie, when they're dancing, the king and I, the, that movie, they're they're making the motions with their hands, like that's how they dance in their world, and it's all that, and everyone's really good with their feet. Like that world, you feel like it could actually exist because they give it some time to get a little bit of details. And this, well, it's just it's cause and effect. It. Think about uh, when cause and effect belies everything. It's pretty clear in a multiverse story where how cause and effect is going to be relevant. It's like what would make this change, and what would be the um, changes that would stem from that one change. In this case, it's like well, if people have hot dogs for fingers, I guess they're going to get good at using their feet. But it's not only, it's like, so the hot dog universe could have just been a gag. It could have just been a little gag. And it's like, so what does it achieve? First of all, gets her out of the cuffs in a logical way because her hands like adopt kind of the attributes of the hot dog fingers. They go floopy, gets her out. And it's like, okay, that's good. So we've achieved that. Uh, we get a gag out of it with her trying to do the fight in um, in her world. and doesn't really go anywhere. We have the gags that stem from that universe, but we're also establishing that this Evelyn with hot dog fingers has a relationship with Deirdre. Um, that we're going to pull back in later, and then we do something meaningful with it towards the end. It's like you could have you could have just gone for layer one, but then you push it further to like layer two and three, and you start to get something really valuable. Uh, like you're extracting as much as you can from this idea. I feel like that's a good way to describe this film. I don't know that there's anything where I'm like, yeah, you didn't really explore that too much. You could have done more with that. It's just not an impression you get. And when you have something like the paint dimension in Doctor Strange, they show it briefly, and then America brings it up once. And I'm just like, you, you weren't ever paint. You were never paint. That would like, I can't even begin to un- to fathom how that would change your concept of existence if you were sentient paint. And you know, even if you reference it and show it with all the visuals and money that you have to throw at that, I just don't believe you. I believe the hot dog finger world. You know, I, I, believe I believe the hot dog finger things. world more than the Illuminati world, and we spend like half yeah. the movie in the Illuminati world. <laughs> Absolutely, it's not, yeah. e- it's not even a matter of time that really explains how these things. It comes down to 
because we talked about a lot, right? Expeditious writing in a sense of how much can you achieve at once that it's generally a sign of really competent writing when you're achieving two or three things like at a time, whether we go broadly like two or three things in a scene uh, or like two or three things with one line of dialogue where it's like it not only advances the plot, but there's subtext that tells us something about what the character believes or it's on theme or um, it's foreshadowing, you know, and um, in this case, it feels like there's so many instances you can point to where you're achieving multiple things at once, like, you know, getting a gag out of a um, out of um, this multiverse jumping and how you gain these attributes, but also tying it into like a mechanic that um, is going to be more meaningful and affecting like, you know, I guess scenes where the stakes are more real. Uh, not to say that like the fight here doesn't have meaningful stakes, but, um, you know, it's like kind of marrying comedy and drama. Yeah. Uh, someone had mentioned it in the chat, and so I looked it up. Uh, but everything, everywhere, all at once was filmed within about 37 days. It was a tough production schedule. That's short. Yeah, this was all this was all done in 37 days. The the acting, uh, or it was filmed within 37 days. Yeah. Uh, Took them so... a lot longer to film Doctor Strange. Uh, yo, yeah, and the grand so scheme of things is the first like or second time around you're talking about. Because <laughs> they, uh, they had to do loads of reshoots as well, right? Oh, yeah, they did. Ton I'm only talking about the first bout of principal photography. It was probably twice or three times as long, then plus yeah. reshoots. It, yeah. This is what Michelle, Michelle Yo, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Uh, she said, Daniels, I guess the uh, director, the, one uh, of the directors, I think there was yeah. two of them. They're brothers, uh, Daniels, yeah, Daniels. Daniels knew exactly what they were doing. They knew the script inside and out, backwards and forwards, up and down, and all the way around. It was like they were the everything bagel. They had everything inside those two heads. They're like the evil geniuses. I think the most important thing was they were so well prepared that they were able to find the time to try little adjustments along the way. Um, which is, mm -hmm. and and not, I guess that's super impressive as well to be able to make those adjustments and have it all slot in with what you intended from the beginning. And with Good so trip. much, with, with how much you have going on, this this is a this is a very well oiled machine with a lot of parts in it, mm -hmm. and it all works. That's incredible. That's that's, and 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 I think What's it's impressive talent, right? that all the Lord of the Rings was filmed in like a year. <laughs> you know, like that's impressive considering there was all three movies. Yeah. I think it was uh, fourteen, fourteen or fifteen months because it was like the end of nineteen ninety nine yeah, like to that. like the end of two thousand. Yeah, and like that shit's pr impressive, of course, with its scale and everything like that. And this, mm -hmm. do it shooting this in thirty seven days, damn. Well, I guess that's the thing is, um, it's kind of, uh, and it makes you think. Like, um, I guess maybe there is something wrong with the way that like a big budget Marvel movies work, where it's like just the nature of how much like post production and how much you need to account for during the shoot that it's like you've got a very long production schedule because i think a lot of movies used to be shot in like a month or two months at most um now it's like common for it to be four or five months sometimes like but then again lord of the rings managed to keep it all and lord of the rings has way more variables than the standard marvel movie yeah, yeah. at least Traveling narratively all the sets and getting everything yeah, well it's like, just because it's you know the, the lord of the rings is an actual cohesive story like the marvel universe now sure at this point is like story. a couple of well, it's just because people will be like, well, they're planning something. It's like nothing really in the same way that L the Fellowship of the Ring lays the groundwork for the payoffs of Return of the King, you know? Yeah. I mean, the Apparently set, the, di uh, the directors also aren't brothers. I said that, but it's not true. I think just, uh, there's one of them is Daniel. One's American, one. one's Chinese. Yeah. So yeah. one of the many th stupid things that I've said in the podcast <laughs> that I've done. <laughs> Hey, I apologize. That's okay. It's everybody one of those says, things where it's just like, I think they're brothers. Oh, no, I was just Everybody's got <laughs> goofs. Everybody's got goofs. There's no way that you can ever do, like, lengthy bouts of streaming without saying something really stupid every now and then. Yeah. I just thought I'm of just them as, like, the Coen brothers, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, they're a, yeah, they're a partnership. Yeah, yeah, like the Russos. Yeah. yeah. Or, um, wait, they're not brothers. I was about to say Miller well, and... Their, um, their and, first uh, names are both Daniel, I think. That's what they call themselves, uh, Daniels, as Daniels. like a group. So yeah. that's oh, why that's I thought a, That's brothers. a fun little meme. Double yeah. Ds, yeah. It's um, like, uh... So, there's gotta be another. 
I feel like that joke, uh, you were just like grasping, like, where's the uh, the name that can come in and help me out here? <laughs> for, like some sort of comparison, and it just wasn't there. It's like Unfortunate. Smith and Weston or Bartles and James. Imagine if there were a duo of directors called Smith and Weston, or like, I don't know, <laughs> Baron Stearns, that would be real awkward. <laughs> yeah, we're Baron Stearns. It's like, yeah. oh, I thought they don't exist anymore. <laughs> that is a really obscure reference. I, I, I don't even know why I brought it up. How many people here even know anything about Bear Stearns? Bear? My name's Goldman, his name's know. Sax. <laughs> you know? My name's nice. Morgan, he's Stanley. We have, a, over, we have some local lawyers here called Rainwater, Holt, and Sexton. So there's a trio there. What are you going to call your law firm? Uh, rainwater, sexton. That's got to be really no, no, unfortunate. No, if like you, you had partners, it's like, what do you want to call your investment bank? Well, my name's Morgan, and his name is Stanley. So it's like Stanley Morgan. <laughs> it's like, is that okay? Can we get away with that? Yeah, that's fine. Just um, hey, I mean, this is what you come to EFAP for: really shit references to investment banks. Well, there's the <laughs> brand Johnson and Johnson. There is. Why didn't they just call it Johnson? The Johnsons? Yeah, Johnson's brand. Because one of them would feel left out. The less confident one would have felt left out. Like who, who got the, you know how like people fight? Who's Who's got the first name? Who's the first one? You know, in the, in the like Starsky and Hutch. It's like, and Hutch. You wonder if they're like, well, I'm the first Johnson, <laughs> you know? I'm Johnson one. You're, you're not, the and Johnson. Because <laughs> I, I assume that they will... Because not all the time they'll work both forwards and backwards because some things just sound better than others and they roll off the I tongue think they, better. Yeah. But generally, so. you'd want to, if, if it's all things being equal, you'd alphabetize it, right? Or at least, um, I don't know. I, I, think a... that, uh, I think that there's multiple factors that come into play. Number one would be um, a level. I think number one is which one just sounds better. Like which one, roll, like Stanley Morgan. But then again, the problem is I don't know if that's because yeah. of the... I, but but I guess it's Stanley like Trey Morgan. And, that sounds like it could be an actual name, Stanley Morgan. It well, but and so does Morgan Stanley. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. It, well, here's one. Like it's always Trey Parker and Matt Stone. It's always um, that's generally how they refer to each other. It's like Trey Parker and Matt Stone. It's like is that Matt Stone and Trey Parker? It's like I guess that one sounds pretty much the same. So like, how do we distinguish it further? It's like Trey comes after Matt. But then it's like, I imagine the reason why it goes that way is because Trey does most of the writing and Matt's um, more involved on like the producer side, I believe. So maybe it's like you arrange it in the order of like, who is the, uh, I guess, the biggest creative contributor. Um, maybe. You know, like, well, I, I think guess there's the also is, a superficial thing where the name with the most syllables goes last. <laughs> Matt may, Stone and maybe. Trey Parker Matt is Stone what I've is always heard. Oh, yeah. you always hear Matt Stone. And, I always hear Trey Parker and Matt Stone. This is what I mean. Mm. I feel like it doesn't even. I guess it's um. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, how you would do it. I'm sure that there's an art to coming up with names where you combine two names together. Lilo yeah. and Stitch. Yeah, Stitch and Lilo doesn't like. It just doesn't sound. Ratchet and Clank. It's like Clank and Ratchet. I don't know. But then again, it's probably, like, <laughs> well, do you wonder if that's true? Yeah, I Jackson wonder if that's Jack. because of the fact that we've heard it the other way. I know. So long. Yeah, I know. That's what yeah. I mean. I guess the thing is, though, is that you think about those, it's like, well, the reason why it's called Ratchet and Clank is because Ratchet is, like, the main character, playable character. Like, yeah. da uh, not Daxter I was about to say Ratchet and Daxter. <laughs> Ratchet and Daxter, <laughs> um, make it happen. Well, it's, uh, I guess it's it's kind of interesting because I feel like um, Jack and Daxter are, like, the uh, like they're both the protagonists, but it kind of makes a lot more sense to call that series Jack rather than Jack and Daxter because you're mainly Jack. Like at least with that, with uh, Clank, he's doing stuff with his um, like his jetpacks and thrusters and all of the abilities that he'll add on. Whereas, like, I don't know, like Daxter doesn't really help that much. <laughs> he's just <laughs> kind of there, chilling out. Those games are yeah. awesome. Jack and Daxter. What like, about the anime? It's so cool. I love those games. What about Banjo and Kazooie? Which one is which? Because I'm Kazooie, just Kazooie Banjo. Not Banjo is the bear. Kazooie is uh, she's the um, she's the bird. Okay, yeah. and what's the one that you did the video on? Yuka Laylee? Yuka Laylee. Yeah. Well, is Yuka, Yuka is the... The, uh, the chameleon, and Laylee is the bat. Okay, Yuka, the bat. All right, is there, an, it, is there it... an instance of a of a character where the where they flip it's it backwards. around? Yeah, where, um, where, the, where the guy on the back, whatever, if it's, whether it's a purple bat or a red bird. I don't think there's when... ever been one where it's not the guy that's doing the running and jumping. 
Um, usually the guy in the back or on the shoulder is the sidekick. I guess the problem is now I'm struggling to think of any other examples of video games where you have dual protagonists like that. Wait, um, uh, just just because I clicked on it because I, I googled Banjo Kazooie just to make sure, but uh, apparently as of March of 2021, uh, Greg Mayles uh, or Mayles, lead designer and director for Banjo Kazooie, confirmed the relationship in a conference of the cartoon couple's conjugal coupling in Clanker's Cavern. Apparently, Banjo Jer and Kazooie are married, and they fuck. They did a sex. That's canon. Someone, I guess lead designer like, and director canon. Jerry and Tom. It's like, yeah, that that's just cursed. That's just Jerry cursed. and Tom. And as far as I'm concerned, the real protagonist of the series is Tom. Anyway, we all agree on that, right? Like Jerry's a prick. <laughs> or do we not agree on that? Um, um, I don't know. It's well, I guess Jerry, Tom's trying Jerry to eat is, him, right? Well, the thing is, is that Jerry... So, I've talked about this before. Chuck Jones laid out pretty clearly his rules for, like, Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. And one of the big ones is that, like, the Roadrunner never actively sabotages the Coyote. He never, like, goes out of his way to fuck with him. He only ever minds his own business, and uh, Wile E. Coyote screws himself over with contraptions or greed or, you know, or, like, selfishness. And so what that means is that for as much as you feel bad for Wile E. Coyote, you never, you never root against the Roadrunner, um, for the most part, because mm. sometimes he messes with him. Whereas Jerry is actively antagonistic towards Tom. There'll often be times when Tom is minding his own business, Jerry comes along, like, tries to fuck with him, and then Tom gets pissed off and tries to attack him. And then, um, and then you know, then and he gets And then suffers. Kicked. Yeah. Well, it's the reason why Itchy and Scratchy, it's always Itchy who's like needlessly cruel to, to <laughs> yeah. Scratchy. Yeah. Just malicious. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you feel bad for Tom in a lot of the episodes. I feel bad for him all yeah. the time. He's, he's yeah. the protagonist as far as I'm concerned. Tom almost Especially always aggresses. Cause... I'm pretty sure you're wrong, dude. Because you have a, um, because a lot of the time it's the, it's the, the housewife or the, the the owner essentially of the house is like Tom. You better catch that. You better catch that mouse, or else you're like we're you're out in the cold or something like that. And you're like, oh well. I mean, Jerry is squatting. Uh, <laughs> you know, to be fair. <laughs> so, like, you know, you you feel bad for Tom. He's, you know, he's I just say I feel a hell of a lot worse for Tom. Like and. Uh, and then, because I, I feel bad for Wiley Coyote as well, but like I find him a lot more. I think there's a level of like, man, Jer Tom gets hurt really bad. Like every time with the Roadrunner, it's like a funny sort of pain, like the kind of Looney Tunes pain where it's not like, it's not like, yeah, I just crushed your foot and you're screaming because of how agonizingly painful it is. It's like an explosion goes off and you just stare at the camera as you <laughs> disintegrate. I love yeah. Wiley. Roadrunner, that's like some of the best shit ever made. <laughs> like, legitimately. I guess it's what it said. Remember when Tom thought he was going to hell and like Tom is chasing after. Every episode. Oh, do you know, do you know the name of his, uh, do you know the name of his girlfriend? The, the white cat with a ribbon? I don't. <laughs> Her name is Toodles Galore. <laughs> nice. An interesting name. She's the, the white cat. She's got the long eyelashes, red lipstick, the purple uh, eyelid makeup thing, stuff, whatever it's called, Wait, the did, big ribbon. Does that predate Pussy Galore or no? Well, it's probably what it's referencing. I think it would, uh, I think it is referencing that movie. So it would be after that movie, right? All right. Pussy the, Galore. It's just funny because I'm. Japanese or something? Yeah, because I'm like, man, which of those two is even older? Because they could. I could Jerry started both. in the 40s, right? That's what I'm saying. Oh, like, yeah, you're right. Fuck. Here, Tom let me Jerry go to the official old. Tom and Jerry wiki and look at Toodles Galore. Uh, let me see. Is Gold Toodles is in the 70s? Maybe that's 60s. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me see. First appearance. There's got to be a first appearance here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. MGM, the Alley Cat debut. So this was in 1941. She first appeared in the Alley Cat. That's got to predate Bond then. I think so. Yeah, if this oh. was forty-one, the name for James Bond was inspired by this side character in Tom and Jerry. Either that, or they both first... have inspiration. This one I just don't know of. I guess maybe. Oh, yeah, I first yeah, forgot. It's, like it, it's all owned thinking. by MGM too, so it makes oh. sense. Oh, ah. hmm, that's right. 
Well, Tom and Jerry belongs to Amazon now, right? Oh, good. Yeah, it does. They did a movie in 2021, <laughs> didn't they? They did. It had uh It was like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit, except it was 3D animated. Like they do the cell. Oh, they, they did the like 3D, 2D thing. You know? Didn't they accidentally release the Snyder cut through that? Or oh, I yeah, that's, that's how I right, heard yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good meme, isn't it? When's the cat coming, mommy? Watch the Snyder Cut through Tom and Jerry 2021. Is, dude, that's so funny because the beginning of that film is Superman getting impaled <laughs> and screaming. It's just like, why am I watching this? Imagine that. You're like, hey, kids, you want to watch Tom and Jerry? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, because Bond was a book first. But again, I don't even know if those books would have predated Tom and Jerry's thing I there. I don't think... Well, it depends on when that character arose. Let's go. Yeah, the specifically, because that would be... Is that Goldfinger the Pussy Galore is in? I can't remember. Yes. Tom and Jerry Wiki. Let's see. Pussy Galore <laughs> is in Goldfinger, for sure. You don't have to pause on... on. Wow, the Tom and Jerry Wiki's got, like, many, many, many pages. <laughs> I bet there's... Well, it's been around for damn what's 80 the name years. Of the lady 81 cat years name? now? The Lady Count, what's her name? You say what? Tootles? Tootles? Toodles Galore. Oh, okay. So Toodles Galore first appearance was... I don't know if it's even going to... I'm trying to... Her first... Okay, so she debuted in Springtime for Thomas in 1946. Fucking hell. Which means that she probably does predate the James Bond character. Yeah, apparently Goldfinger was published in 1958, so... Yeah, so by 12 years, it got a 12-year lead. What a strange thing we've just, like, learned, I guess. <laughs> I'm yeah. yeah. I'm not even thinking about the books, I'm just thinking about the movie. Remember when we were talking about everything ever all at once? <laughs> well, let's get back <laughs> to talking about everything ever all that All that time oh, yeah, ago. That yeah, well, so, uh, while she's battling the guy who put the thing up his butt because she did the, the, the blow on the nose thing, the other dude, while she was fighting, also got something up his butt. So... They're nice. both, like, supercharged, and um, she fights him for a bit, but then she, she does this incredible move that allows her to pull both both plugs out of him. Um, and you just, yeah, you sort of at the point when you're watching this, that you're just like, this is the film that we are watching right now. This is what's happening. This, these are the events. Uh, and I understand it fully. Yeah. And I think Joy's face does kind of summarize the, uh, the shock, the awe. It's it's fabulous. Well done, yeah. Um, but they both crash into like walls after she does that as well. So, um, she gets a brief moment of feeling victorious. Unfortunately for her, she is then tackled by Gong Gong, who drives her into a wall and pins her against it and opens up a grenade and says, "We'll both we'll both die. That's the way we'll sort this out." Essentially, um, and if you notice. It's a, it's a little bit weird as fuck, but her hands are jammed in such a way that her pinky fingers are available. But, you know, what yeah. are you going to do with your pinky fingers, right? They're not strong enough. What are you going to do with that? Uh, I guess you can't do anything. Movie's over. Yeah, that's, that's just, just pinkies. Yeah, those aren't the strongest finger, I don't think. Or maybe they are, or something. Um, but then a fly lands down near the thing, which gives her an opportunity to do something weird. I think she either crushes it with her nose, or she like snorts it. I, I I'm not sure. I think she snorts it. Which is uh, it's the new thing. It's the new street <laughs> drug fly. And so she, she gets a slingshot, <laughs> and you, you can tell now because we're this far into the movie that they're sort of speed running. Like you, you know how this works. They'll just give you the parts you need. So she's like, Kung Fu is not just about combat. It's uh, Kung Fu is like it can be anything, even your pinky finger. It's like, wait, what? Because you're just like, what? What is this universe? Uh, and this universe, yeah, she she learned to get some gains on that pinky finger. All right, that's yeah. um, which I'm pretty sure there aren't any muscles in your hands, right? Or at least your fingers. Uh, no, your hands have just tendon. And so this bone. is this, this is muscles. tendon training, I guess. Yeah. Um, Which, awesome I kind of that was even possible. I have no idea, but yeah, those are those are the tendons right there. That's just that's just mm -hmm. how big they can get. Bulgy bastards. Never matter. Yeah. This and, is funny though. The, and then the with that power, she can split the chair down, 
and uh, flick him away. <laughs> 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 That's great. Great, because the movie has earned its way here. You know, it's like uh, absolutely. You do you do a multiverse thing. You acknowledge that there's an infinite amount of uh, infinite amount of universes where anything is possible, including a universe where everyone has buff pinkies. And there you go. You can use that. Yeah. Um. So Katana Man and the Jogger and SWAT guy, I think, are all here. She uh, just boops them with a uh, incredibly yeah. powerful finger. I mean, SWAT guy's probably dead, but he's not. <laughs> but he probably is. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like a weird physics thing of she... The force of that goes into his face and it sends him up like 10 meters in the air. So, um... He's probably very dead. But that's okay. Because you know what? She's doing self-defense, right? Yeah, yeah, he's fine. He'll be fine. Um... So after all of that, considering all the antics she's just been through, she's kind of kind of having trouble. And uh, Waymond comes in, but turns out it's Alpha Waymond. And he's like, you have been very impressive. You're doing great. And she's like, really, you know, happy and pleased that that's the point that he thinks of her sort of stuff. Because, yeah, it just feels like we've come really far, and it's, it's an hour and 20 minutes. I think I remember at this point looking at the timeline being like, holy shit, there's another whole hour left. Like, a movie. When, it's uh, at this point that I think you start yeah. to realize that this film has a lot more that it still needs to say. Yeah, because we've we're almost like through the, I guess a, a large portion of what would have been its own movie, where if, if it wanted to just go this direction, like she's mm -hmm. she's done a big amount of learning and training, and she can finally she's ready to take on the villain that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, uh. Alpha Wayman says, I'm not going to be able to see what you're capable of in full, because uh, he's dying. Jobu Dunn got him in, in the Alphaverse, and this is actually him coming in to say goodbye. Uh, which, yeah, it ticks the box of, like, I'm pretty sure Death of the Mentor is, like, one of the common um, Heroes Journey arc things. I think what you yeah. mean to say is fridged. He's been fridged! <laughs> dun, dun, dun. The mentor's Reference. been fridged. Which, you know, call back the great reference, right? That's, that's, Don't you hate it when that happens? I was like, were you on that EFAP, John? I think you were, right? <laughs> yes, I was. Uh, overly sarcastic was... productions video. Yeah, did. apparently, I saw someone talking about it on the Discord. Apparently, they really liked Doctor Strange. It's like, oh, oh, they did. Yes, so. Oh no. Yeah, I I argued sarcastic. with some people on Twitter about that too because I I posted like what a piece of shit this movie was, and I broke my rule. Where it's just like, if I shit on something, I provide some reporting <laughs> evidence. Like, this is why it sucked. But I just, I didn't feel the need at the moment to, like, justify why that movie was so fucking terrible. Because it's, Everybody's I feel like it's so self-evident. But, you know, yeah. like, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, Alpha Wayman is dead. And if he's dead... Which he has killed by her in the other universe. There's nothing stopping Jobu now from turning up, and she literally does. And so it's like, well, wait, so have you touched on like her her reaction when she realizes like Alpha Wayman's dead and it's it's Wayman's like normal Wayman's back? I guess so. Yeah, uh, there's a there's a couple of things I realize I'm accidentally skipping over. So feel free if anybody realizes I'm missing stuff. Yeah, that, that it's just shift, uh... it's like a tonal shift once again. It's just it happens and it it's. Well, I guess uh, what I what I like about it is it's highlighting something that will eventually be resolved, but it's kind of been happening this whole movie, which is that um, by circumstance, Wayman's been getting pushed out of the uh, like the conflict, um, but Evelyn's kind of okay with it because uh, she doesn't really perceive him as being helpful in this situation. There's nothing he can offer, um, you know, to, to to help her solve this problem seems indicative of an attitude that she has towards uh, him that we've seen throughout the movie of like his approach to things is just not compatible with her. She thinks it's stupid, doesn't help. It's a waste of time. Um, I, th I don't think she's quite completed that arc here because not, as soon well, as... Definitely not. Yeah, That's way... way right, okay, yeah, sorry about that. I, uh, well, well it's just... um. It's it's like it's happened again, but in the clearest because now Alpha Wayman's gone, so now it's just him, 
and she just pushes him off of him. Uh, exactly pushes, right. Yeah, she sees away. like the original like, version. Uh, She's you, like, oh my god, you, you can't help me. Like, yeah, this guy. Again. Yeah, Alpha <laughs> Wayman was a, a fighter, and he taught her how to, how to do all kinds of things. And now he's gone, and I'm just left That's with not the who he is. Yeah, yeah the, the useless guy. <laughs> well, um, as yeah. far as she's concerned. Yeah. Yes. Because the film still got loads of things to do yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, Jobu's kind of like amused by Evelyn's confidence. She's like, I can take you on. I've, I've learned all kinds of stuff now. And then she's like, all right then, do it. And um, she starts to just splinter apart into all of the universes we've seen. Just cracking up. And uh, pressure gets to her. It's too much. And she vomits. I guess that was probably all the, 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 the drank she had earlier, I imagine. But it's more so indicative of the fact that her brain is fucking her brain broken. Is melting. Yeah. Um, it was too much, okay? She went to too many universes all at once. That was something that was happening in the middle of her fight with the, the two uh, butt plug guys. Was, um, she was like, every time she took a hit, she would end up in a different universe and she had to refocus to get back. Like... Just the idea is that it's just not working out. She's her brain can't take it. The clay pot, it's smashing. And uh yeah, she actually gets a, a flat line because uh couldn't handle it. And the implication I think is the uh this is what happens when any Evelyn, or really anybody, uh does this too much. And I think that's what happened to the first Evelyn we saw whose head like exploded in the beginning, or near the beginning. It's um mm -hmm. Jobu can like expose you to the to the multiverse or you could do it yourself and i think that's what she was doing but yeah she's like oh well we were so close and they even do a little, little meme here of, of convincing you that maybe that's the end of the movie it would be a little bit of a depressing ending i guess yeah he's uh it's quite sad as well because jobu walks off and waymond is just like desperately fucking losing his shit because he doesn't understand a thing about what's going on and evelyn's just dead in front of him mm -hmm. like th there's no way to you know, not address that. This, this, this rough, but uh, yeah, end of the movie, the short one, hour and a half. <laughs> um, a bit like, wait, what? But it's uh, yeah, they're just having a bit of fun because we actually move. She moves into the uh, the Starlet universe, the celebrity universe, where this film was actually the one they were watching, and it is kind of cool because if you look at the um, when she heads in on the red carpet, there's posters for the film, everything, everywhere, all at once. So it's like they're going in, in their universe. What she's doing in the film is a film in their universe. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but their, I guess their version of it ends there, or at least that one. Um, but yeah, that's that's really weird. How is she here? What does that mean? Um, of, and then she starts like bumping into other universes, like the chef one or the the pizza uh, salesman-y one. Yeah, it's Rakakuni. We see him. Yeah. And uh, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa! This is this is terrifying. What, what could what could it all mean? She even gets nearly gets hit by a car. Damn. Oh yeah, and she like falls over in the singer universe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's she's funny when, she's... when you get the uh, the artifact fuck up in VLC. It's actually helpful for copyright. It's like, oh, ah, yeah. do it, distort. Yeah, the Rakakuni one. Uh... Um, <laughs> it's just a, it's such a fun because like in in Ratatouille. It's a funny image, right? Yeah. If uh, if he was f found out by like whoever else, it's, it's the one thing you wouldn't expect from this very wholesome and chill, fun little thing is that Rakakuni is like she's seen too much. You have to kill it. <laughs> it's just like wait what? Uh, and he makes the guy pick up like a I think it's like a spatula. Something I I forget what he picks up. He picks up a here. Let me look here. We are about to find out. I'm sure. It is oh, it's just like a little. Yeah, it's essentially a spatula. Yeah. That's not sharp. It's a weird that that's the tool that he'd <laughs> use, but then it goes into this the the hot dog finger would land where she's got a relationship with Deirdre. hot dog. Yeah. I just uh, about the the, the racket cootie thing. It's so fucking absurd and uh, yet so it just fun. The uh because like there's a whole puppet shit going on there. Apparently, I think it took like three people to organize and operate that thing. Um, and you must have when they pitched it, they must have been like, "This is uh, this is gonna be weird." They were like, "Yep, this let is me, gonna be weird." Yeah. Let me explain to you the puppet I need. This isn't a sex <laughs> thing, I promise. 
And, uh, well, there, there's a function to this that's so effective, I think, where, like, in a story of multiverses, you include a universe that's based on the dumbest possible thing ever, which is, in this case, it's like a one-off joke that feels like an improvised line. You know, and later in the movie, you find out, like, oh, they're actually doing a universe with this. This is so ridiculous, right? But that's the multiverse, right? It's It's, like one boundary of stupidity all the way to the other like it's yeah. just infinite possibility and uh it's important too that it may come across as like a bit of a meme but the hood knowing that rakakuni is under that all hat of his is important soon enough um the imagery here as well is that there is started up their little little sausage dance in this world and she <laughs> pushes her off to get her away from it which is it's really, I think that as the audience, you'll be laughing at the absolute absurdity. You'll be like, this is fucking nuts and insane. What the hell is going on? But, like, yeah. stuff is happening here that is Yeah, there's, meaningful. like, a story and characters and people are reacting to events. And, it's like, it's something. There's substance behind it. It's not just, hey, hey, funny visuals. There's something yeah. for your brain to actually latch on to. And you get, like, they hang on a shot of uh, Deirdre sausage version. Yeah. Just... Like crying basically because it's just not working. Everything she tries doesn't yeah. work. That's what I mean. This is like a complex emotional situation in terms of an audience member. It's like, am I supposed to strictly laugh or am I supposed to laugh while simultaneously understanding this is meaningful for these people in this world? Yeah. I think um, it's definitely very deliberately playing with that. Yeah. Like the audience's reaction to that. Like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Laughing, feeling bad. Um, but yeah, in the uh, Celebrity Universe, she says, like, any ridiculous thing I think of, any whatever, I, I, I believe it's out there, it exists. And I can get there, and her head is going back, four, back, four, and then she ends up in a much more neutral, normal tax world where she's dealing with the taxes. And it would seem, the implication there is that's what she wanted. She was trying to get back here. So um, something that's more normal. Yeah, because... Uh, She's like calming down a bit, and, and then. the idea being, oh well. So I guess uh, textually, he's like, "Hey, make sure you send off the uh, the paperwork, the taxes, and don't forget to give him the, the cookies. She likes the cookies." So it's uh, the implication being, of course, the this is like a timeline where none of the insane shit happened. They went home, they redid all of their receipts, and they're ready for submission now. And yeah. she's just got to hand them in. But she's taking control okay. of this universe. For a moment, um, but go ahead. Well, it's just here's where we get part two everywhere with the exact same framing uh, of part one. Uh, everything it's like that is that is so deliberate. That like yeah, everywhere in the exact same situation that you were before, where you're sorting out your taxes and like you're getting ready for your uh, uh, New Year, like Chinese New Year celebrations. Um, and there's Wayman, you know. It's like. Hmm, what are we going to be getting at in part two when it comes to theme? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'd want to like highlight this visual it. as well, where she's choosing where to put this receipt down particularly, and it splits into two. Uh, yeah. And I think it's supposed to represent the fact that she now has an understanding of all of this. So this could be considered the equivalent of when Neo stops the bullets. Uh, he's got a full understanding of his power. And I know there's another time you might consider more applicable to that, but that's kind of the point of this movie. Her getting to the point of understanding her power is not the end of the road for her at all. It's much more... Um, uh, I know what you're referring to. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. But she's... Yeah. So it's, so she's pretty happy now, because she's like, I've got the ability to take on Jobu properly. And, uh, yeah. So begins part two. And so... Uh, and, and then she gets alerted then by uh, the, the notification of like, customers downstairs. I guess it's amusing. <laughs> um, so, so this is when the, the New Year's party has started, right? This yeah. is what kind of frames the second act, or the second chapter in the way this movie kind of frames it. Yeah, which they mentioned a couple times that it was, it was going to be happening, and that uh, it's just kind of like everything's carrying on while we're dealing with all the insanity. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it looks like if you imagine this from Joy's perspective, who doesn't have anything to do with this multiverse shit, I'm Becky. After the fight in the morning, they have now come back. 
and they're hoping obviously to try again to get Becky and Gong Gong to probably meet. Meanwhile, our our Evelyn is just like, it's Jobu, and I must defeat you. Get out of my daughter, I think is what she says. Um, mm. Which is like, and then she, she has no idea what the fuck's going on. Um, but she does something which gives the audience a good old clue, because Jobu probably is curious enough to be looking for, um, for Evelyn, but she's not, like, it's not the same as being, um, I guess, fully active everywhere, because I don't even know what that looks like, as in, she has to cycle through things she can hear and, and detect across the multiverse, and the way we saw her do that before was uh, tilting her head, and then yeah. um, when Evelyn's talking to her, She's like, sounds baffled, Joy. She doesn't know what's going on. And then we see the tilt, and it's like, ah, oh, she's here. Yep. Right. I, I love this, uh, the visual tension that's been established here, right? Because we know that she is inhabited by this chaos demon. And we've seen what she can do, like turning people into confetti and just tearing reality to shreds. And now that we, we see that this demon has inhabited this person in her what the movie regards as the default universe right and it's playing with that tension of like you know this character could tear this reality to shreds if yeah. she wanted to this but she's just like a movie toying with it yeah 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 i love that there's just i can't remember exactly where the movie where in the movie it is but like there's a scene where joy is possessed by topu tobu she like uh, limbo's under some police tape. It's just like really quick shot, but it's just like playing with that the imagery of the police tape. It's like as soon as you see that somewhere, it's like a really grave situation, right? But she's like just treating it with such she's trivializing it by kind of well, dancing it under it as if it's her. like a limbo game. Yeah, just like it's just kind of embodies that character so well. And this confrontation in the laundromat works. It's just like, oh my god, is she going to do something that's just going to tear all of this entire reality to pieces? Kind of like... Yeah, because we don't actually know, as the audience yet, exactly what she wants to do to Evelyn. What, what is, you know, what is going on? What is the reason for all of this? Yes. Um, because Evelyn believes they're supposed to fight. Uh, and, you know, if you follow Jobu's actions throughout all this film so far, they don't necessarily seem that way. It doesn't, it doesn't seem that's what she wants. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I do love that they pass through the, uh, the doorway and it moves into, like, a, like, I picture this is more inspired by, like, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, um, this world, yeah. especially with, uh, the sword that she ends up with, it looks kind of like the, the, the Sword of Destiny in that film, uh, except without yep. the patterning, I guess. Um, but yeah, she says, everything is just a random rearrangement of particles in a vibrating superposition. Mm -hmm. um, while cycling through loads of different props and uh, it's like there for one frame but she holds an Oscar at one point <laughs> and I was like really? That's I awesome. hope so movie I hope so <laughs> <laughs> that's funny we'll see um, dude if this doesn't get at least a nomination for editing I'm going to be very disappointed it deserves something something yeah it needs something for sure um, yeah, and then uh, I think uh, Evelyn is like, I have no fucking clue what you're getting at. And then she says, um, don't you see how everything we do is washed away in a sea of every other possibility? Like, I think she's getting at the idea that the decisions you make aren't really of any meaning because you almost made all of them. Like, there's no yes. difference with anything anymore. Everything's the same. Everything is nothing. Um... This is something I think Rick and Morty always captured so well is the like the absurdity of multiverse theory where like if we're really taking it seriously the idea that there's an infinite amount of universes where anything is possible they have this one scene where it's like people sitting on chairs ordering pizzas and then it changes into like pizzas sitting on humans ordering yeah, chairs right, right, yeah. and then <laughs> like just every kind of variation of that where it's just like there's absolutely no intelligent design being factored into this <laughs> universe here like would this universe ever come about like you know of its own accord you know if you were just to let the universe just unfold into its infiniteness 
would a universe like this actually exist? I'm not so sure. And with this uh, being established and the, the, the sort of entities they are now, we start getting a little bit crazier with these universes. They go beyond the smaller variations like did you become a celebrity to the greater variations like did you get sausage fingers all the way over to this is literally a coloring world where they are pictures on a page. Um, Crayon drawings, yeah. Because these two now are so high in power and they've spread all over the place that it, there's just like no limits basically. And it's, uh, this is the kind of thing, it's contextualized in a much more meaningful way I think than Doctor Strange 2 basically having just the one moment where it's like, look they passed through a bunch of universes, did you recognize any references? Like, oh yeah I guess I did. All right. Anyway, yeah. back to the story, because like that, it was never incorporated all that well. But um, yeah, she slices herself, and then it cuts to her being a pinata that's been hit open. <laughs> uh, it's like a world where your pinatas, I guess. It's just like yeah, they're just moving through all kinds of um, worlds where she's just trying to make a point. It's not really about fighting her, but like Evelyn keeps assuming it is. Yeah. Um. Until she eventually says, like, I'm gonna beat you, I think, and then she's like, alright, punch my face. And, um, she does, and it starts this mechanic that I assume is actually repeated. It's not entirely clear what's happening here, but when you, I guess, as a being like one of those two, if you connect with another one, it, like, almost in, in a single moment gives you a bunch of variations of all of the different things that can happen. Because it, like, spams through... Uh, she goes from punching her to like strangling her, to playing games with her, to pulling each other's hair, to doing each other's hair. You know, like, and I assume it's just yeah. running them both through all kinds of uh, choices that could be made. Yes. So, um, yeah, and, and it's all experienced at once. This comes up again uh, a couple times, actually. We go, but uh, yeah, and then it stops with the punch. Jobu just starts going, ow, and, like lays down on the couch. It's like, it's, it's kind, of, kind of fun and amusing. It's like, because it's so fucking baffling at this point. You're just like, aren't you like the super demon? Why are you fucking around? What's going on? <laughs> and uh, yeah, because Wayman's in, and he's just like, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, I just fell on the couch. Oh, yeah. He's like, okay. And you're just like, what is she up to? Yeah, you know, what is going that? on? What are, what, are you, what are you doing? What's going on here? This ain't right. You're up to no good. And he, um, he that's asks, what I like so much about that character is in, in some skinny. instances it's like appropriate for that character just to just sit in the moment and enjoy the chaos of it all. Yeah. Just, and just like having fun with this one person she's talking to in this instance. Knowing that she could be anything in any universe in that instance. She's choosing to like enjoy the moment in this one universe with this other person. She's curious about this, this, cause she sees, you know, the unique individual, we can do this. So she's like, Oh, I mean, she wants to study, see, you know, yeah. Take her time. Yes. She can. Right. Um, yeah. And he, and he reminds her to drop off the paperwork and she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Don't worry about it. Take care of it. And kind of funny that that keeps getting reminded cause it's about to become super important, super soon. Mm. Um, and he's just trying to help, you know? Good old Waymond. Um, so yeah, she drags Evelyn into the, I don't know, the, the Bagelverse. I don't really know what this place is. But she's, uh, she's introducing her to the idea, the, the bagel itself. And she says that uh, she's felt everything her daughter has, as in like, this is basically her saying Jobu and Joy are the same. Um, there's no real way to... There's no removing Jobu from Joy, uh, which is what Evelyn's goal is. I agree. It, it should be Jobu and Joy, because Joy and Jobu just... I don't know, it just doesn't have the same ring to it. Um, yeah, and she said, I felt the joy and pain of having you as my mother. I was like, damn. And... Um, they have like a flashback to the uh, to Gong Gong being told that Becky is a best friend, but like it's a strange kind of flashback because it's apparently one that's shared, as though it's being played by Jobu as a reminder. And then um, uh, Evelyn is like, 
well, he, he's a different generation. And she said, you don't have to hide behind him anymore. That, um, that what is right is a tiny box invented by people who are afraid. Which, uh, I think, in this context, is probably actually re referring to Gong Gong directly. That he would have decided that, like, like, the assumption is that he thinks that, I guess, being gay is wrong. And he's created the box of what is right after, as a result of fear of what he doesn't understand, I guess. Um, okay, yeah. But of course, um, that same logic she's using can be extended to just everything. Like, r doing what is right is just a tiny box for people who are afraid of the reality of what she's now preaching. Yeah. And this is the thing, gotta give the film its due. It, this portion is basically the best argument they will allow Jobu to make, the writers now, for in favor of nihilism. He goes through a lot of... Uh, realities and you know if you stop the film after she makes all those claims i feel like you'd be missing a super important component but i guess we got to go through Absolutely. this in that way um well it's really interesting to think about like what is what is a small box drawn around a particular set of behaviors mean in an in a multiverse where literally anything is possible so like this, the whole movie plays with this idea of form and void, right? Like you, you lose form. What are you left with? Well, it doesn't mean anything. It's just like everything infinitely in all directions for an infinite amount of time. It's how do you even like, how do you find meaning in that? And can you live without meaning? Um, that is the point of the circle, like the bagel is a symbol. It just keeps going, like you follow it around. It'll just keep going. It's like going in a circle, right? Just yes. It's a it's a loop. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't have an end. Um, and this like, the circle is used very cleverly in this movie overall as like a common motif. Yeah. Whether it's the bagels or like drawing the circle around the receipt the head, or the washing the machine head, or all yeah. these different symbols, right? Everything going around, around, around. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. Um, but yeah, and so textually, right, because this is where the film starts to really not care as much, I think, for the surface level mechanics, but I still think that we'll we'll point them out for as long as I think they are still there and still working. Um, Jobu's brought her to this special area to show her her bagel that she created by putting everything onto it and it collapsed into this thing, and by being exposed to it, it like it'll do a th it'll do something to you. It'll it'll introduce you to an idea. Um, meanwhile, like I guess. You could say subtextually, it's more so she's giving her the, what it, what nihilism is, explaining it almost, um, and it's it starts convincing Evelyn basically. Um, she says, "All this time, I wasn't looking to kill you. I was looking to see, uh, looking for someone who could see what I see and feel what I feel." Basically, that um, she's the only super being of this level, so she was looking for someone else who was capable of it, and uh, that's why she was just wiping through all the Evelyns until she could find one that, that could make it. Um, yeah. Which I think really fallen? nicely... Sorry, Rags. It, like, cleverly ties back to the more grounded story here of, like, a daughter on the brink of nihilism who just wants her mother to understand what it is she's going through, right? And, like, relative to, like, all the, the infinite possibilities of the multiverse, it's just so, like, contained that grounded story that's kind of framing everything because it is used as like a narrative framework, right? Like every, this entire movie is framed by the, the one day of like the taxes coming to a boiling point at the laundromat and the Chinese new year's party later that night. It's all framed within that one day, but you have all the sheer chaos kind of framed within that. Um, uh, sorry, right. I didn't mean to interrupt you, man. Go ahead. I was wondering if, why why would she need to kill the Evelyns? Well, she's not trying to kill them. She opens up their mind to the multiverse, and then oh, they die. Okay, and okay. she's like, oh, okay. you're not a valid sort of variation. You can't handle it. And yeah, it seems that the theory is correct. The one that was capable of being able to sustain the multiverse is the one with the least realized potential, I think is what Wayman kind of explains. Um... Which, you know, is, is as good of a justification as I think you're going to get when you get to these kinds of mechanics that are so abstract. Like, what you, like you know, it's hard to derive rules in something so crazy and fictitious as, like, 
becoming a godlike being spread across the multiverse what is it that mechanically would allow you to be able to become that it's like I don't know. it's really up to you at that point as the writer <laughs> yeah um yeah, so she's she's uh, Evelyn is rung during the party by Deirdre. Uh, De 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 Wait, is it Deirdre or Deirdre? I think it's I Deirdre. Know. I was about to say, well, I've I've heard people say Deirdre before, right? That's like a way to pronounce that. Well, I I, I, I thought Deirdre's Deirdre. a name. That's what I would have thought. Oh well, are they are they not? Well, I know it's a name, but like, yeah. I don't know how you pronounce it. I don't know. I guess De 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 Mama D. <laughs> well, okay. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, so Deidre calls her to say that she should have, but why the fuck hasn't she given in his stuff? And she just says, shut up. And then she goes, what did you <laughs> say? She says, you don't matter, nothing matters. And it's almost like, I think there could be some people out there in the audience being like, yeah, fuck the IRS lady. But of course, this is actually more of a, like, second act low point in actuality. It's like she's actually being convinced that why the fuck should I care to solve all these fucking problems? It's whatever. It's all the right. same. It's all everything. Nothing means anything. It's Nihilism. Like, yeah. No. <laughs> if, if nothing Second means anything, why, why orient yourself towards anything in any direction? Yeah. Hey, we're going to get Which there, don't worry. One, <laughs> one response, one of uh, the responses that you can have to this information. Oh yeah, well this film goes over a whole bunch of them, but we gotta, we gotta get its full assessment of uh, Nihilism out first, which is you get like a reflection of it in each universe. Um, in the uh, in the Starlet Celebrity Universe, she says that. Uh, Do you really want to like experiment with the idea of us actually getting together? Do you know what would happen? We would end up uh, living above a failing laundromat, doing taxes, uh, for, like forever, basically. Like telling him there'd be no point in them hooking up because that would be their fate, sort of thing. Um, yeah. Taxes forever. I wouldn't worry about that one. And then she starts giving a little speech after it, it does intercut with how she's basically broken up with Sausage Fingers world. She, <laughs> she, she, they're like, no, nah, we're not doing this. We're done. Yeah. And uh, and her eyes go fully black in the in the bagel universe. It's like it's, it's all it's all coming down. Oh dearie. Oh dear. And she says, um. Another year pretending that we know what we're doing when really we're just going around in circles, doing laundry and taxes, laundry and taxes. Just like, oh man. He's also drunk at this point. And he just, uh, it ain't going well. And then she, uh, she, yeah, she puts the mic, mic down and signs the divorce papers. Which again, I think, uh, what we were talking about, you know, five hours ago, uh, I think it's true that I, I could see that the divorce papers were more so his way of opening up the conversation about it, see where it would go next, not necessarily just ending the conversation with her signing immediately and it being done with. Because he's, yeah. he's, he's clearly not happy that that's happening. Um, but fuck it, right? Nothing means anything. So, um, in a sense, like this is all the, the villains coming close to really winning here. And then, or I don't even know how you'd categorize it exactly. But uh, Deirdre yeah. turns up to claim the laundromat. And um, out of frustration, then Evelyn just fucking grabs a bat. And uh, she, I think she says, uh, I've always hated this place, and starts breaking shit with the bat. She's had enough. And I think it's, it goes through a couple universes. One where, uh, look, what, look, look at this. Look, this is horrible. He revealed Rakakuni to the world. <laughs> Which, um, you know. Is that's... this the first reveal of Rakakuni? To the world, yeah. Like, she knew about the it. World, yeah. but, um, now, you know, now... Sounds uh, like a Dark Souls boss. The first reveal of Rakakuni. <laughs> Maybe yeah. it is. The health bar appears at the bottom. Um, I think she screams in the, like, the Singer universe. And, um, and it ends with one that's, that's probably the, the harshest in terms of just, like, damn, she, uh... He stabs Waymond with a, a shard of glass in like the main one that we've been with in main universe sort of thing. Um, because yeah, she's basically like fully committed to nihilism. A great uh, visual metaphor too for like, oh, you actually signed the papers. Like, oh my god, you might as well have stabbed me in the heart, right? 
Well, luckily she doesn't stab him in anything lethal, but uh, she'll stab him. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and then I think Joy says, Not a single moment will go by without every other universe screaming for your attention. Never fully there, just a lifetime of fractured moments, contradictions, confusion. With only a few specks of time where anything makes sense. Just, uh... Very depressing part, because it's just like, everything sucks. And uh, they arrest her, obviously, for attacking the place. And once she's in cuffs, she just falls to the ground and turns into a rock. Which, um, you may think I'm, I don't know, saying something non-literal, but I mean, it kind of looks that way. Just goes boom. This rock boom. scene was another plateau for me, where it's just like, I cannot believe what I'm watching right now. But yeah. it, it's, wor you, it's you, working you so well, plateau. you know? Do you mean... Peak, or do you actually mean plateau? Uh, well... Because they're kind of on, like, a plateau, so... What? Well, yeah, I, I don't mean it literally in that sense. I just mean, like, um, you know, like, this has reached an other level of unbelievableness where it's like, I would not yeah. ever expect to watch this in a movie. You know? Or, like, I can't believe the movie is doing this right now. Where, like, you're you're entertaining the idea of them just being on this cliff edge for like what like three minutes solid of just like no dialogue or anything just ambient sound and just like subtitled dialogue over top the rocks because the rocks are like talking to each other and it's almost like Arby and the Chief in a little bit where I'm reading the subtitles and they're like lacking in grammar and punctuation a little bit where like they're saying ha 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 ha. I'm just like I cannot believe I'm fucking watching this right now. It's a theater. fun way to present this. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think that they even bait for a little bit. Like, they show us the rocks for a while, and then a subtitle turns up, as if for, for a moment there you might think, are we just going to see them as rocks for a while? And it's like, no, they're actually going to talk. For those who are yeah. like, how do rocks That's talk? Please. They do, but in this universe. They, well, amazingly, not, it's, it's just... It's gods. thematically appropriate. It feels appropriate to me because, like, we've you're juxtaposing all this crazy multiverse, mul martial arts, chaos, yeah. action, whatever, and then all of a sudden they are two rocks just sitting for minutes straight, and they are just complete potential energy, and it's like they are completely inert. They're not. They have no form but just to be there, sitting rigid, not doing anything. And that's the point. And we're just sitting there watching that for minutes on end. And then, uh, and then action follows after that, obviously. But just, I just appreciated that one moment where it's just like, these are two completely inert objects, but they have like personality ejected into them through this like subtitle device that they're using here. You know, the white uh, subtitles are Joy, I think. The black subtitles are uh, Evelyn. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, change of pace, considering that it comes right off the back of probably the most intense, like, moment up until this point, because we just had her jumping through, like, a million different universes. Yeah. And now we're just hard cut to two rocks sitting on a cliff. It's a, gr it's, it's a, it's a great background as well. Like, the scenery is is uh, is nice. Yeah. It's... um. I it was it was a great choice, like to have it, and and yeah, what you said there about like potential energy, I hadn't even thought of that. It's like, yeah, I mean, I guess there's that that's true, and we, I mean, we see it later on when they come. Well, no, jumping ahead, no, we'll get there. <laughs> well, I was I was trying to think of it in like the because it's been a while since I took physics in high school, but like when a a, a, a an object is positioned above uh, whatever the determined like surface level is like a, an object is placed x amount of however whatever units of measurement you want to m use as a measurement like where it's separated from the surface to like wherever the object is positioned you can calculate a certain amount of potential energy that that has to like fall to that exactly. point and then when it falls the potential energy becomes like realized energy that's being expended Exactly, um, yeah. So there, the rocks are on this cliff right now, but if you were to take away that cliff and the rocks were to just drop to a certain 
surface level point, whatever it is, it's like because because it's all like relative, right? Like because you can determine yeah. multiple points about where the base level is for them to be striking hard ground, like because you could like go down infinitely to the Earth's core, I guess. But like, um, I just think that ties in so well with like the the idea that this Evelyn that we're seeing in the movie is like the the quote unquote worst Evelyn because she has done the least to take advantage of her potential, but that gives her the edge to jump to these multiverses and gain these abilities to accomplish something truly, um, what is it? Ex excellent, I guess. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I, no, I got you. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I think it's just a nice, she like treats it as though it's a pocket universe or rather a universe that she's aware of that she can go because it's so peaceful. There's not a single thing to worry about. Nobody's doing anything. No one's going anywhere. It's just a... You just be a rock. Yeah. Which um, I also think sort of doubles up as like... It's um, in a sense like that's all anything is. We're, we're all just stardust floating through the universe. No different necessarily right. than a rock. Depending on how broad, and how, how, how broad you want to go. But... I uh yeah it's 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 quite a scene and it's funny because I uh a lot of people I saw when they were first comparing this and Doctor Strange were like two rocks managed to achieve more than like Doctor <laughs> Strange as a whole movie could do. Yeah, it's Power, true. It, good it writing. Really did. Actually, wanting to tell a story. God forbid. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then so Joy just starts talking about how as a rock, that uh, everything we discover, the more we learn, the more we spread, the more we realize just how small and shit we are. Um, mm -hmm. just, all of it is just a big reminder. And uh, I think Evelyn says, yeah, it's a big fucking joke. Um, and then Joy says, I've been trapped by, like this for so long, experiencing everything. I was hoping you would see something I didn't, that you'd convince me there was another way. She says, uh, you know, what are you talking about? And she's like, the, the reason she built the bagel wasn't to destroy everything, it was to destroy herself. Uh, could going in actually give her an escape? Could she die? And at least this way she doesn't have to do it alone now. Um, and yeah, and yeah. so that is sort of the, in, the entire portion for Evelyn being fully convinced, I think. And now it's time to just enter the bagel and end it all. Uh, is is the idea. And um Yeah, Evelyn comes pretty close, except you know, being aware of, of all universes at once, she starts to she can just hear Deirdre and uh, and Wayman talking in the in the party. Which is a curiosity. It's just like what in the world would he be saying? Why even bother? Um and uh, it looks like it's actually, like, having an effect, it's working. Because if you imagine, right, if Deirdre is the kind of person right now who's just been ignored and screwed over by these people and they're trying to take advantage of tax information stuff to the point where she's already had a lien on their, on their place and now she's having it seized, what in the world could Wayman say to her to get her to stop? Like, and I think even uh, Evelyn says, like, that's, that's like, impossible. And uh, Joy says, it's a statistical inevitability, it's not special. <laughs> it's just like, okay. Yeah. But, um, curiosity nonetheless, right? It's just like, what What did he say? Right. Um, and yeah, he walk and it's cool because Deirdre looks really like she's struggling with, with the information she was just given. And she's just like, I don't know you, you guys, but at this point in the movie, I was just like, what did he say? Like, what would yeah, have worked? Yeah. Um, well, I, at this point, I, would, I, would, I don't even know if they'd ever tell us. I was ready for, to have them just say, "Yeah, you'll just you you won't know what he said, just that he said something." But at the same time, was you never know. And uh, yeah, we, but we have been given all of the available tools to know what he could have said. Mm. And um, yeah, he says everything's going to be okay, and she's like, "The fuck? Like how?" He says she's going to give us another week one last meeting, which is a hell of a long time compared to what they had. 
And uh, and she says, how? And look at this guy's act in here, right? Gosh. Where mm. have you been, sir? Where have you been? Really? Yeah. I mean, uh, he's been learning Kung Fu. Dude, he must have been like martial arts training or meditating or something with all that time. Because like he has a remarkable control over his like his physicality and his men his emotions and his mental state. Like and, and it's and just actor. yeah, it's like the acting. Well, we see him in the uh, other universe where they meet at the you know meet at the theater. Just the fact that he can be you know in a different. A different outfit, behaving differently, you know, with his hair slicked back and everything. He just seems like an entirely different person because he could make us believe it, you know. Totally. Yeah, some impressive. this thing you can you can do, like really good actors can, where they can get the the tears flaring up. It can make the eyes really believable in terms of because I can just it can just be a screen. Look at him. You can detect so much about what he's feeling. Uh, because yeah, he doesn't even he doesn't even want to tell Evelyn what he said to get them more time. Um, and so it's like, hmm. But then he starts talking in another world that she gets distracted by, and it's it's Wayman in Celebrity Land. Uh, who says uh, you think I'm weak, don't you? All those years ago when we fell in love, your father said I was too sweet for my own good, and maybe he was right. Uh, and then we cut over to the universe where Gong Gong is trying to kill her with his with his alpha cult, and Wayman stands in front of her to say, "Please, everyone, stop fighting." And it's just like you start to get a vibe. It's like, oh, we have Wayman's coming through in a lot of ways right now. What's what's going on here? And He's he says, a good guy. Um. Yeah, uh, back in the celebrity universe, he says you can you can tell me it's a cruel world and we're all running around in circles. I already know that. I've been on this earth as many days as you. Um, but when I choose the good side of things, I'm not being naive. It's strategic, necessary. It's how I've learned to survive through everything. Just like, oh, we're introducing some new points of view here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um. Yeah, to the, the Alphaverse people, he says, um, I know you're all fighting because you're scared and confused. I'm confused too. All day I don't know what the heck is going on, but somehow this feels like it's all my fault. It's like, I don't know, it, it feels like such a, an appeal to uh, the, the world, in a sense, right now, the better surrounding it. I suppose this message could come out at any time. But um, yeah. there's, there's, there's quite a bit of tension and turmoil in the world at this point. Our one, and um, I appreciate I this would say so. <laughs> on that level. The uh, the yeah. fact that he's saying like everyone's angry, everyone's confused, everyone wants to fight, and at the same time, you can feel like it's your own fault that, that more things aren't being done. Yes. Um. Yeah, and he says uh, he has no idea what to do about it. He has no idea what what the solution is. He just knows that you need to be kind, especially when you don't know what's going on. Um, again, so much that applies to in a detailed way that, that that would be really meaningful. But I just like that it's broad enough that anyone can read into this however they want. You know, we we're gonna make another that that uh, another Doctor Strange comparison where America just gets a little cheap pep talk at the end and she saves everything. And this is similar, but it's just so much more earned and well done and you know established so much more impressive yeah uh we have a wayman simultaneously in several universes committing to different actions that are all incredibly meaningful but follow suit in one strong through line about the way that he believes you should operate in the world and it's kind. and it simultaneously is in opposition to the thing evelyn just concluded so mm -hmm. like we we ain't done yet and, um, yeah, he says, you see yourself as a fighter, I see myself as one too, this is how I fight. Um, meaning by being kind. And if you think about everything we've been going over in this film, it matches up. He doesn't just, like, do kind things because of what Evelyn thought, which was that he's kind of an idiot and doesn't know how to solve problems. It's because he believes that's how you solve problems. 
that is his philosophy right. and his approach. And the fact that it's an approach that seems to be consistent across several different universes has to mean something. Yeah, it's yeah. very important to who he is. It, it, it Like, yeah. of all the choices he makes in his different universes, that's one of the ones that stays constant, or at least more so than other ones. And part of the reason why it's so poignant is because this perspective hasn't been... It hasn't been able to be expressed up until this point in the film. It's only been like conflict, sort of open direct conflict and then nihilism. And then you don't just have a much more positive outlook, which is be nice to people, try to be kind and considerate. And like that's the way to try and, I guess, fight for more broadly a sense of meaning and purpose in life. Yeah. Even when you're confused and, and scared and angry and blaming yourself, it's like even in the face of those confused emotions, you know, you can still choose to to be kind. It's a nice yes. wholesome message to come out, especially in the face of such abject nihilism. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, and, and, you know, what's interesting to me as well is that it's not even... The film, I think, is like, that's not enough. we got to go further than that, because she even says it's too late. Um, which is, so it's like, it's got to be more, even more than what we already have. But Because uh, he says you can still turn around. Or you, you can still do, like, do something about this, but then Jobu's the one that says you can still turn around and avoid all of this. And I think what she's kind of going with there is like, look... There's obviously a pathway there you can take, but it's full of stuff and things and, and trials and all kinds of pressures and stuff. It's like you can avoid all of it. It's a very interesting way to put it, as opposed to escape it. Like, like, just don't yeah. don't deal with any of it. You just don't. You don't have to, so don't. Mm -hmm. And um, but then uh, Evelyn touches his hand. And then we get a big, like, montage of all of these happy moments in these mundane settings with him. Because he's such a nice guy. Yeah, because their life may... Has meaning to them. It may be in a bad place right now, but it was never because of him. Don't lose... Yeah, and I guess it's like, don't lose sight of the good things, you know? Like, all of these happy memories. Well, I think this is the... Person the completion of one of the many sort of arcs that we, we had set up is that she had erroneously concluded that it was him that took her down a bad path. Mm -hmm. Like being with him, was, it's, it couldn't have anything less to do with him. It's much more complicated than that. And I think this is her realizing that finally. Yeah, yeah. especially when you have him say like, yeah, I would, you know, in a different life, I would have been happy to just like do taxes with you, you know, and do laundry. It's um, It's kind of like, trying to step away from, I think, what is probably something that can be easy to slip into when you think of other possibilities in life is the externals, the things that you can get and accrue, money, fame. Um, whereas in this case, even in that world, he's just like, yeah, I mean, even me sitting here wearing a suit, like, it's not really, it's about experiences more so than, than, um, than like attaining things or like trying to, you know, like appreciating appreciating what you have rather than what you could have in like a world that isn't yours, you know? Yes. That was the line in the movie that made me, it really amazed me, you know? And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, this movie is actually about something, you know? Like, it's about something um, meaningful. Right, because it's like telling you, like, count your blessings and to find... Like there, whatever your predicament is in life, there is something to find to appreciate. And that if you had, if you were able to live out whatever your fantasy life was, you might very well be yearning for aspects of the life you thought to be insignificant. You like know the, what I mean? I like the color well, so change on their faces, like to imply their, that, that multiversal nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's the effect they go with, just to imply that she's cycling through a whole bunch of universes with him in it. I think is what we're getting from that, and that he's a, he's a really nice person in all of them. Yeah, and, and particularly from kind of this ish point forwards, you have a lot of these very meaningful emotional moments, and they make the the fanny pack kung fu and the dildo fight seem really far away yes like it's almost a different movie like you you've just you finished that movie yeah. that movie's done and you're watching an entirely different movie 
This is against totally. the real fucking meaningful stuff instead of the we're having a little bit of fun here stuff. Yeah. Because yeah, like that the, really all starts coming together here. Genuinely, Sorry, the ahead. power of fiction. I was like, what is all for? Is like to, to you, when you have like a classroom and they're like, today we're going to learn about meaning. I know it sounds broad. And you might get bored by the textbook, but we gotta learn about, as opposed to, guys, you wanna watch a crazy movie that's a sci-fi fantasy where a woman is trying to uh, hunt down a person that's trying to end the multiverse and kill her by learning more powers? You just be like, that sounds fucking crazy, let's watch that, yeah. And then by the end <laughs> Good, of it- because I'm like, the teacher, I wasn't asking. <laughs> and by the end of it, um, they will have understood, theoretically, more than they may have from the textbook, because it's all about that delivery, you know? Yes. And that's what storytelling, that's that's like the power of storytelling is it's a vehicle for lessons and um and and a method of posing questions in a way that can be just I guess just leverages empathy, le leverages our uh understanding of like the human experience and that other people have these experiences too. It's yeah. just a good vehicle for conveying these messages, like through characters. I think it's a lot better at instilling those ideas than just being told about it. Exactly, dude. For like human beings, I think there's no more effective delivery method than and narrative. Story, narrative. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's how people absorb wisdom. I think so. Well, it makes sense. It's a foundational part of like human culture. Human it's one of the culture. earliest things we would have been doing. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's really just and, being able to process. Well, I mean, and, and you can see it here, right? We tell stories about ourselves, and we have stories. Evelyn had a story about herself here, like multiple stories about herself that kind of conflict what she wants versus what she thinks she has versus what she has. These are all like different stories in her head of who she is. Um, right. And she doesn't have like a clear grasp on probably the most important one, which is what you really have um, yes. and the value that that gives you rather than what you wish you had, what you want to make people think that you have. Um, yeah. That that moment where uh, in the universe where they're both actors and they have both gone their own way and they've become quote unquote successes in their own individual paths where they presumably have ridiculous amounts of money or whatever. They're both successful actors, but then they come together together in this instance and they that the guy Wayman says, uh, I. I could imagine a universe, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, I could imagine a universe where I would just do taxes and whatever the other thing is with oh, you. Oh, don't worry, just... yeah. We can, so that, that line's right here. He says, um, even though you've broken right. my heart once again, I wanted to say that, in another life. That was, the moment, that was the moment for me that won me over. I was just like, okay. Oh, dude, that's great. There's a couple I, of quotes in this that I love. That one might be the best one. There's, there's a couple of other contenders. Um, yes, but yeah, it's so human to be like, I would really have liked just doing laundry and taxes with you. It's like, right? Aww. Like that's that to them in that universe is everything to them is just imagining in a universe where they are just living together together keyword in the most boring existence possible. But they're together, so it doesn't matter how boring it is, right? So it's just this like overarching message of like it doesn't matter what you're doing, but like who you're doing it with, kind of thing, right? It's just like it, it, what matters is the people in your life and the joy that they bring you, just their presence, and uh, that that blew me away in particular. Just that one line, I was just like, oh, this sold me. This is fucking great. It, cause, because it's not just positive. I, it's true. I believe it's true. It's not just the movie blowing smoke up my ass. Because, like, oh, this is just a fake thing that's just trying to make you feel good for a couple hours. Like, no, I feel like this is fundamentally true what this movie is trying to tell me right now. And uh, I love it for that. You know? It's like, I get it. Yes, you're right. <laughs> like, there, you have to count your blessings and realize like it's it's more than just what you've accumulated in life it's you know in terms of like material wealth or belongings or whatever it's just like who, who are the people that you've met how have they kind of magnified your your life and uh how do they complement your life in a meaningful way and 
And just the, uh, I mean, this all climaxes in the scene we haven't even got to yet. So I'll, sh I'll shut up now. Go ahead, Mahler. Sorry. Um, well, you know, it's all good. Uh, so mentioned like, wouldn't the message be better conveyed if she wasn't struggling so much? What's so bad about an alternate universe where the laundromat is successful instead of almost broke? I think that's important as an element here is that she believes a lot of the material circumstances of like determined that the, the pathway is worthless. Like, it's that that makes it all. There's nothing of value here, when it's clear there's something of great value here. A lot of things, actually. Um, you need, like, a, her material circumstances to be really shit um, for, I think, for this story to work as well as it does. Because yeah. if, if everything is going well and she's really down, I, I feel like it's... Um, it doesn't make the point as clear. Um, because it's supposed to be that the character believes it's those realities that are making life not worth living, almost. Um, and it's even bled into her blaming these people uh, who are with her, as opposed to realizing there's something more complicated going on. I think it it opts us into being able to explore more about this. It's a little bit more complicated, but I, I guess we'll just we'll, we'll push on a bit more, because why not? Um, she, like, I think embraces him in a couple of universes, appreciating the value he brings, and uh, I just like that it ends with a shot of He's got like a strong, balled up fist ready to fight at the beginning of the scene, and then at the end of it, it, it just relents and becomes a chilled yeah. out hand. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, she's got a reason now already, at least one, uh, to, to, to remain in a complete alternative, a response, if you will, to the, the concept Jobu was bringing up. And now that that's over, Jobu comes back in, and she's like, oh, so cute. And she says, yeah. let me make this easy. It all eventually goes away. Nothing yeah. lasts. You know, just, just why, why not just die? And, um... Yes. Man, is, is there ever going to be a better line than Age of Ultron to summarize the response to that one? I can't believe it's that movie that yeah. gets to have this line, but it does. Well, and it was said by a character brought back from the fucking dead, because they needed yeah. more TV shows. Retroactively, yeah. That's such and a fucking it, joke. Yeah, in that yeah. instance, I was expecting a line of dialogue to, that was a little more overwritten. You know what I mean? But it 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 like has that restraint to just keep it as brief as it needs to be. It's just like sometimes it all goes away, and that's it. That's all you need. You don't need to write it in any more detail than that. You've encapsulated it already. I appreciated that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the line I'm referencing, though, for anybody who doesn't remember, is. Um... In Age of Ultron, which is a garbage movie for the most part, uh, maybe we'll cover it someday. Uh, but there's uh, the whole, obviously all the Ultron bots are getting wiped out, and there's only like one left, and Vision goes to get it. And I think the Ultron bot prompts him by saying, "Like he says, they're doomed." Uh, yeah. To which Vision says yes, and then he says, "But a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts." Which yes. is, I think, the most succinct response you can get to the idea that everything dies. It would be like, yeah, but that's not why we value it, yeah. is it? Exactly. The, 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 Ultron, the Ultron puppets are all avatars of Ultron, essentially, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, so you're talking to Ultron, basically. And yeah, the, there, were, there were moments in that that I actually liked. I like the whole idea of like moments, uh, yeah. puppets on strings, you know? Oh, dude, this yeah. uh, movie has... Shame. That movie had potential, yeah. man. It had potential. Yes. Yeah. It certainly had potential. But yeah, it's just a great line. Because there's a lot of content that deals with this topic that everything every world at once is going with as well. Um, it's a bit of a fundamental one. It's almost like a starting point, and then you start looking into other things. Got to get this one out of the way, you know? Like the whole, yes. what is the point in living, and what is the meaning of life sort of thing. It's like, yep, we get those, and then we'll move on to the more specific ones, but... Uh, when this is executed really well, which I think it is in this movie and other bits of content that I quite like, get uh, it, it becomes quite a favorite oftentimes. Um, so yeah, uh, she activates the bagel, and it even sucks in some of her followers straight away, and it's 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 it's, it's pretty grim actually. <laughs> like they're just this screaming as like they're getting ripped into it, and um. I don't know if that's like on purpose to to try and show another layer of why it's something you shouldn't do. Or, um, I was getting South Park vibes off it. 
you know like just like the guy who's like getting sucked into the bagel and he's just like getting torn up yeah exactly this frame right here he's just like ah! <laughs> i could i could definitely picture the standard south park um it's like when global warming attacks that yeah. one guy in that episode <laughs> Parody of the, the day after tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> someone said that's some. Um, someone said that's also a line from Troy. The uh, because it lost the one. Brad Pitt Troy. I assume that's what they're referencing. Or like, or like the original story of Troy. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to know though. Um. But yeah. So this this is what I feel is like the full on. I, I don't know if I'd call this the third act at this point, I guess, because it would have started it, it's, earlier. Yeah, it's hard to I, tell where the third act really kind of starts, I think. I, to get I, what I'm honest, I would say it is. I think this yeah. movie has a very conventional structure, but if you were to analyze it in like the the way it kind of on a surface level divides itself up, where like you have part one everything, part two everywhere, part three all at once. It's a very uneven structure, yeah, but underneath that, huge. I think there's a very conventional three-act structure. The reason why I would pick here as the beginning of the third act is just because it feels like it fits in with my understanding of a lot of stories where second act low point and then whatever thing that happens at the second act low point to bring the hero back in um, is you, like, it, it, I can't believe I'm, this is where my brain's going, so here we go. Team America, when he gets completely uh, despondent and told to get the fuck out and doesn't want to do it anymore, and he gets encouraged to come back, talks to Spotswood, and gets his uh, tools and knowledge, and then has the mission to head to the the place to save everybody. That feels like the break for me of going from second act to third act. And to me, at this point in the film, we've got everything we need to um, to conduct the solution, basically, to get everybody what they they need to have. And all the factions are about to like clash hardcore. We've got. The, uh, the Alphaverse crew are going to... They want Jobu dead. And they see now that if Jobu enters the, the bagel, that might kill her. And she wants to do that. So they need to ensure yep. she gets to the bagel. She needs to ensure she gets to the bagel. So both factions belonging to those like cults, if you will, are all going to be aimed against Evelyn. And we've had Waymond bring Evelyn back from the brink and arms her with the idea of don't fight them to fight. Be kind. And so that's like yeah. our stakes. And it's as simple as there's a series of stairs that Jobu is going to be walking up and you got to stop her. Yep. Um, and so I mean, you have all of this absurd fucking surface, all this crazy tech and almost magic and all these mechanics going on, but, you know, what's going on underneath? It's like, please, daughter, don't include the, the, the action you're going to do right now. And this is... This is Simple as that, I guess. Is what I'm getting at, right? Um, which is really cool. Uh, well, I guess it's it's. This is the point when the symbolism becomes like super duper strong and overpowers. Like, I guess the the more like, I guess the straightforward mechanics of how everything is working. Like, this is the part when it starts to transition into like this is like the point of the movie essentially. Like, these yeah. are the themes and the symbolism yeah. and imagery all like coalescing. I would argue we're about to machine gun payoffs like this is this yeah. is where the whole film has been building up to um <laughs> yeah. also Which is why it was necessary to lay down all that groundwork for as long as it took apparently yeah. the quote is and i don't know if this is from the original or from the movie but um because it does sound familiar but the gods envy us because we're mortal because every moment might be our last everything is more beautiful because we're doomed which does sound like a like that line could inspire the one in age of ultron actually like a different version of yeah. it yeah a good line yeah I yeah like that. um so yeah she starts heading off and evelyn goes to attack them to prevent them from doing it but waymond is like please enough like not fighting, not fighting. and but so she listens this time yeah she does and she looks for a moment like well, what, what what the fuck am i gonna do then like yeah. we're gonna lose and um deirdre gets a weapon ready to hit her with he goes to swing and we cut back to the curiosity of Evelyn in the old, uh, in the party universe, the, the laundromat universe. Why did Deirdre give them an extra week? What did Wayman say to her? And, uh, she asks her about it, 
And Deidre says she, he told me about your situation, being that he's served you divorce papers. And then she says, when I got served divorce papers, I drove my husband's car through a neighbor's house. And uh, she did mention an ex about earlier. Well, it's just, but it wasn't wasn't on our mind. This feels to me pretty potent in terms of, um, you know how it's often said, like, you don't know what's going on in someone else's head. Like, you have no idea what they're dealing with in their life. They yeah. have mm -hmm. any manner of problems that, uh, that they're dealing with that you're just completely unaware of. And, like, even just a recognition that they may well, you know, a recognition that they're another person who probably has the same thought process as you and the same struggles as you. Just realizing that and, like, acting on it can make a world of difference to that person. Yeah, this yeah. is genuinely great stuff, because up to this point in the movie, Deirdre is kind of characterized as just being the annoying, useless, asshole IRS agent who doesn't understand the struggles everyone's going through. And that's when you're not even including the fact that all the alternate versions of her have just been aggressive and trying to kill us, like, as, as the main character sort of thing. Uh, and yeah. now, it's like you find out, like, maybe a lot of her anger does come from the fact that that happened. And then she says, mm -hmm. um, it's unlovable bitches like us that make the wheel go around. And it's just, like, yeah, so the reality underlying Deirdre as a character is the fact that she thinks no one can love her. But of course, right. in the multiverse, that can't be true. There's so, got to be some in some place where she's loved. Well, we know of a universe where someone loves her. That's right. Mm -hmm. The love <laughs> universe. And that's that what, meme, uh, remember? That's what I'm saying, it's so meme. great that we, we're fucking around with sausage fingers, but it's like, no, it's, it's like making a point. Well, uh, yeah, sure, it's sausage fingers, but yeah. there are people who live in this world who have like real struggles and real relationships. Despite the absurdity of the universe, it's still populated by people. Like well, the, Deirdre. This is where this movie really amazed me, is where you have this extreme juxtaposition between the ridiculousness of hot dog fingers universe and like using that to actually make a legit point about existence you know this is uh this scene is probably it's one of the strongest examples like i've ever seen of marrying comedy and drama right and i think most directors would shy away from this because they know when it comes to awards season if they if their movie is perceived yeah. as being too funny, then they you will be omitted nominated. from an, uh, earning certain awards, which is fucking bullshit, right? Yep. So like the the idea that comedy doesn't s play a role in award deserving films is fucking ridiculous, right? Yeah. Because it's so intrinsic to existence. I mean, like people have a sense of humor as like a partly as a defense mechanism, right? To kind of fend off the nihilism. The grim I mean, what, ironically, world. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys are, just, yeah, you're right. Like humor is not. Wait, what? You, you guys are convinced me not to see it because it sounds real schmaltzy. Like, well, <laughs> I guess it is <laughs> schmaltzy. Referring to like it's super, um, almost like 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 uh, what's what's what are the words I could use to emotional? describe emotional? I don't know if that's quite right. Uh, almost like children's type of emotional where it's just like we all make it through in the end we all do happy blah blah and i'll just be like i mean it is to a degree um it's trying to be very very real about uh some of the realities we we, we should approach life with it's a lot a lot of this is advice recommendations and uh insight yeah i w i wouldn't want to you know rule out uh well someone said juvenile see i'd be like oh, i i don't yeah, think that's no, fair at all no 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 Right. Definitely no. <laughs> not juvenile. It's not. Well, comedy and juvenility are th are are thought of as synonymous a lot of the time when that's really not the case. It's the same attitude that makes people think cartoons are for kids. Um, right. You yes. Know? Whereas it's like, no, holy shit! Like these are, these are universal. Like comedy is universal. Yes. Um, but I mean, as for like this film, I think that what it's trying to say is simple, but it's uh, like. As in, like, the point at its core is pretty simple, but it's, it's like, that, that would be omitting so much of the, uh, the texture of it. And, like, the fact that it is, in, in a sense, honest, as we'll start to see, like, as we, like, it's shortly after this scene where we start to get, like, some real honesty on this subject. 
even even within the context of a, a much more positive and upbeat, uplifting uh, message, which is what the film has. Yeah, so like said, yes. the film is quite optimistic. To clarify, right, like what they're showing is the, the hot dog fingers universe, but that these two, we keep seeing that their relationship, whatever it was, is getting fucked up by Evelyn constantly, temporarily traveling to this world and being freaked out by everything and moving away from her when apparently these two are in like a full relationship in this world. So, yep. like, it's damaged as a result. Um, and she's repairing it right now by listening to her play the piano with her feet because she can't with her sausage fingers. It's like... And what I find pretty interesting here as well is the song she's playing is the song that plays when uh, she first attacks her and she gains the, the kung fu moves to stop her. Do you remember it? Uh, I missed oh. that. That's interesting. Oh. I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, and what's happening in that scene is her professing her love for Deirdre. So... Right. Wow. There's, there's, a, there's a connection. Wow. Yeah. yeah, Adam. <laughs> well, it's, it's as he said, right? He was hoping, I guess, that it would be more uh, of an original soundtrack, themes that, that spread throughout, as opposed to sort of choices that match for... Like, he was hoping for songs that were built for the film specifically, as opposed to ones that have been chosen to be put in for a meaning that goes beyond it or something, right? Yeah, because um, we were talking about like the difference between something like Star Wars or, um, uh, like the, the Suicide Squad, the Suicide Squad, which does the same as Suicide Squad in terms of including loads of songs. But I feel like this that's actually good to bring those up. Those are two ways of doing it. Yeah, one a little bit better than the other. <laughs> Claire de Lune <laughs> is that the song name? How beautiful. Cloud de Boussy. Um. And yeah, and so we cut back, and she has stopped her with her foot. It feels weird, but it's obviously just a, a familiarity she will have drawn from being aware of that universe. And she says that uh, you're not unlovable. And Deidre's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And she's like, there's, uh, there's always something to love. Even in a stupid universe where we have hot dogs for fingers, we get very good with our feet. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just, again, it's just like, ah. Oh. Good stuff. Wisdom of the ancients. And uh, to solve... The, the, tr the truism of there's always something to love, even in a situation that's so absurd. As absurd as playing the piano with your feet, like you were saying. Yeah. Well, they show up at one point she's knitting with her feet as well. Like <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> and see, they have this image where she's you know, wiping away a tear from her with her foot. Yeah. Like, my my <laughs> like, God, we are on a tightrope of drama and comedy. It's just like, you will ref you're you refusing to commit to one or the other. You're having both. Y yes. The fact that the foot clearly is not, you know, it's just rising up like that. Like, yeah. it's, it's its own joke. This embraces drama and comedy at the same time so gracefully. Like, more gracefully than I've ever seen in a film. And uh, that's what I appreciate about this movie, I think, more than anything. It's well, just like how, it, how well it walks that tightrope between comedy and uh, drama and seeing something actually meaningful. So do you think this beats out Jojo Rabbit in that regard? I, I, I would happily say they draw. Um, it's, uh, I like the Jojo Rabbit. A lot of it is about that specifically. Um, like the idea of clashing tones uh, or experiences and emotions at once. This film, I think, is is in somewhat uh, in some ways about that, but it's just a, about a lot of other things too. And I don't I don't feel like either one. It's really hard to say, right? Because there are going to be people who see this and they're going to say this was ruined by the the the, the childish jokes. Like everything is no. trying to get across. Fuck no. But um, yeah. There's there's just that that element of like, isn't that a part of life though? The uh sort of messing around playing like i said the first line in this film is stop playing we don't have the time i cannot stand the pretentiousness that seeks to exclude comedy from greatness you know like it, like as soon as you have like funny material in your thing whatever it is it's like not considered as like award material yeah or this is a lower profound. form of art Exactly. Yes. Yes. You nailed it. 
it's a lower form of art because it incorporates humor and it's incorrect fundamentally. I just, I think that's just a, such a gross way of looking at it. Yeah, I'd rather listen to a stand-up comedian before any fucking free verse poet. Yes. Um. Yeah, she hugs her. She just gives her a big old hug. And, uh, and the the crazy bagel cult worshiper person that she is says, "I feel nothing," and she tries to repeat that. But she doesn't quite get to the word nothing. And so instead she says, I feel. Oh my god. Which gives you a little clue as to how we're going to defeat Mr. Big Ol' Nihilistic Perspective. Yeah. You see, Mahler, that's how we're going to win this. Not by fighting what we hate, but by saving what we love. Yeah. Yay. Laser Yay. fires and blows up everybody. Um, but yeah, so that's just sort of like, I guess, the experiment, that's how it happened, she managed to do it. They all aim their guns at her to stop her, literally fucking everybody, because they want to, and it, what's neat is they actually have a little thing of, of, uh, Deirdre's trying to stop them. She's like, don't do it. It's because she's, she's been converted now. She's, she's been radicalized in the other direction. And we get what's possibly the most overt and recognizable Matrix reference, I would imagine. Yeah, <laughs> I think she turns right, to the yeah. she turns to uh, what's her face Joy and says, "I know kung fu." <laughs> show me, show me. Um, but yeah, she stops all the bullets, and she uh, uh, and and and. In the other universe, she's picking up the baseball bat and spots the uh, the googly eyes on him. Gives her an idea. Turn all the bullets into googly eyes. And then she fires on him on everybody's forehead while attaching one to her own. Are they yeah. are they googly eyes or google eyes? Because uh, she says google eyes in, this, uh, in the film. Yeah, uh, is yeah. that supposed to be I wrong? Or? They're used synonymously. I assume, part. yeah, I, 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 I've always just assumed they're called just googly eyes, but maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't even know. They, they don't come up often in conversation, but I think, I think that's what they normally are referred to. They're googly eyes. <laughs> like, it's just, that's what they're called. All right. Rags being, they're called googly asking eyes. questions, no, confusing I was, me. I'm, I'm just asking questions. I just want to get okay. to the That's okay. I've just provided you with the answer, though. They are called googly the, eyes. Uh, get into the bottom of things. Um... Maybe Google Eyes is what happens when you spend too much time researching online. Well, Did Michelle Yeoh's Eyes? character says the word Google. Like, no more Google Eyes. Like, that's the word yeah. she well, uses. Yeah. Maybe that's because it's just more evidence that she does get the little from the words confused. Because she even mentions Google Translate, I think, at one point. Mm -hmm. So maybe she's just mixing right. up Google and Googly. Yeah. Maybe she should have said Googly Translate. Use Googly Translate. Like she gets googly eyes and the company Google mixed up and reversed. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know something, Google, give it a go and go to Googly. <laughs> uh, so, hopping in uh, one of them on everyone's heads, I think it's safe to assume we're gunning for uh, opening up your mind's eye, wouldn't you say? We're getting a whole new viewpoint yeah. for all these characters now. Symbolism, as they say. And uh, Gong Gong just said, <laughs> so stupid. Which, uh, see, this movie, the film is very aware of, of taking portions of it to be stupid, because I don't think it would even shy away from that. I'd be like, yeah, some of this is really stupid. Yeah. Um... Well, I think when you're when you're trying to visualize something like chaos in film, you have to incorporate stupid on some level. And I think uh, a lot of filmmakers would shy against that because, like I said before, they would be afraid that that would exclude them from like some kind of, you know, prestige or like earning awards or whatever. It's like, no, it should be funny to some degree. It should be even hilarious. To some degree, and that's what this movie pulled off more than any kind of film I can think of that deals with this similar kind of subject matter. Right? Is it's, it's willing to go to that really funny territory? 
where I'm just like doubling over laughing in the theater. Like I cannot yeah, believe and, watch. This and it's not hilarious. like it comes out of nowhere. It's um, we've seen him a couple times on different items in the laundromat because Wayman likes to put them on things because he finds them fun. Yeah, from the very first scene, yeah, in the room. If you if you mm. look, you will notice them. They will be on the bags and everything. Like on the exactly. thermostat, there are the uh, Google eyes uh, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, she even puts googly eyes on herself as a rock. Yeah. Because why not? I'm gonna get you. Let's just like, don't come near me. Yeah. Now that, that, was, that was yet another plateau way. for me, you know? Like, the rocks alone was one thing. And it's like, you put googly eyes on the rocks? <laughs> like, are yeah. you fucking kidding now me? <laughs> God, I was laughing so hard. So now hard. that the rock has googly eyes on it, it is officially a character. <laughs> Yeah, she's, um... <laughs> as soon as it has eyes, yeah. She says, I'm learning to fight like you. But to Wayman. Because, this is the thing, man. The Reddit user is coming right at her. He's full charge, full power, full force, you could say. And, uh... Gotta deal with him. So, yeah, she basically cycles through all of these people, providing them, via her crazy powers, experiences. And they, they're assorted from stuff like falling in love to... Like smelling perfume, uh, she fixes up a guy's like nervous system because it's all fucked up because of, like she gives him like chiropractic or something. Um, there's a guy she gives BDSM uh, some fun times. That's that's what he's looking nice. for. And uh, oh, I guess I gotta save the universe. And that, by the way, is what YMS was talking about fucking six hours ago, where he mentioned the uh, the director plays somebody. That is the character. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Now we know why this movie was made. Yeah, that's true. Um, it wasn't to tell a story, it was just to get his King Kong. <laughs> but like, you know, what do you think is being said with all of the crazy nihilistic people trying to prevent her from stopping like them all from being able to, to, to essentially end their uh, existence? And she's, she's converting them all by giving them experiences. Yep. Uh... You know, how else do you put this? It's like, as, as Free was mentioning, it's just like, this is getting to the point where um, there's no more, like, like oh, mechanically, the multiverse sci-fi, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, well, no, just describing what she's doing, you've now, like, linked both the subtext and the text at the same time. They're pretty much yep. explicit. Um, well, and it's earned. You've earned this yeah. by doing a lot of work ahead of time to support this material. I love that this is like uh, like an anti fight scene, basically. Yeah, like it's the, a the, love the, scene. The, traditionally, the conf the the climax here would be like just epic martial arts stuff, right? Which has already been seen earlier in this movie. But in this instance, it's like she is doing things to fill the void in the lives of whoever she's like conflicting with in that instance. So it's like. The suggesting the idea that all hatred in the world is kind of just an illusion, basically, and it's all manifest of um, a manifestation of things that people are lacking in their own lives and they're angry about it and they're taking it out on someone else. And she's kind of fixing that one person at a time. It's like, you're missing this thing from your life. Okay, here's this thing. I'm going to tap into the multiverse to fix this thing in your life. And then they're fixed, and then they, she moves on to the next guy, and then making an epic f third act fight scene out of that, where it's not about like punching and kicking, but just like resolving people's personal issues. It's uh, it's very creative and uh, action therapy. It's uh, it makes you feel good to watch it. Yeah, I I liked yeah. how uh, anti. I guess anti-conventional. I guess it was. You don't typically yeah. see that kind of thing. Um, and an important part when she's doing all this is they show Joy turns to look at it and smiles, which yeah. uh, <laughs> got to be got to be getting through to her a little bit. Uh, yes. Well, they're they're kind of mirror ref like funhouse mirror reflections of each other, right? Like the the person who has completely embraced nihilism, which is like the Joy character. And then, like, the, the Evelyn character, which is kind of taking advantage of those crazy powers, but not quite diving into the nihilism as the other character has done, right? 
Mm -hmm. Because fundamentally, this is a story about a parent pulling their child away from the brink of the abyss, you know, nihilism, which is, which is a very common and relatable thing, I think, you know, like what parent hasn't dealt with a teenager that hasn't, that has said like, I wish I was never born, that kind of thing, you know, I feel like that's very common and very relatable. I agree. Uh, and she pulls it down from the staircase to obviously delay her approach up there. And um, as she falls, her like clothes get all tangled and out of sequence, sort of. And she is now wearing something that's completely disparate in terms of materials, colors, and even like her her hair is done in a really weird way, and her makeup is like all disjointed. Um. Because yeah. this is like the most she's just been, at least when she had the full belief in nothing meaning anything, there was some level of control under that, I think. This now, she's like at the peak of confusion and anger. She's not entirely certain on what exactly is fucking the next step, because her, uh, her mum was on board, but now she's not. And a lot of these other people who were on board with this we're aren't on anymore. Board. We're not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because like Jobu thought she had the right answer, but it's like maybe not. And what does that mean? Um, yeah, and, and we cut to the universe where uh, Rakakuni was was taken away by the uh, I forget who it was like Animal Control, I think. Um, animal Control, yeah. And she says like, "Let's go get him." And she climbs on top of his head, controlling his head to make him run after Rakakuni. While in the universe where they're having the fight. Her control over him manages to deliver more um, bullet experiences to all of the different foot soldiers. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, uh, as is often with big fight scenes at the end, it, it like respects the same act structure in a, in a sense, in a, in a minimized way. There is usually a low point in a, in a fight sequence. And uh, we reach it just after this. The, um, the, the dad gets her. Uh, he's got, like, a, a mech suit, as a f thanks to his, like, modified wheelchair. Yeah, I like the little, <laughs> little exoskeleton thing he's got. Though, sorry, I actually He's got, it. like, microwaves taped to his body or something, doesn't he? Oh, like, it's, just... it's such a, like, B-movie outfit. It's so cool. Like, <laughs> yeah. So absurd. Um, but one thing I, I, I went past by accident there was just that, um, uh, the Rakakuni guy says, like, without Rakakuni, I... I didn't even know how to boil an egg. Like, I, I'm useless alone. And then she says, uh, well, good thing we aren't alone. Like, which I think is another fundamental point this film's making. Don't, um, don't be doing all this shit alone when it comes to life itself. Try and, uh, There's a lot of people out there. Experience, yes. expand, grab them up, friends, family, all kinds of folk. Experience the world with them. But yeah, um, He's, uh, Gong Gong's, like, outside of Jobu, he's just the only one left now, uh, in terms of getting in her way. And at the same time, they show us that, likely because of her fucking destroying her own laundromat, he says in the other uh, universe that, uh, you are not my daughter anymore, because he's, like, presumably d disappointed, and it's not entirely, like, I guess unexpected, probably, from her POV, but, um, I want to say... He's just mainly fun throughout the movie, right, James Hong? But the the way he delivers yeah. the "You are not my daughter" line, it's just like, man, keep an eye on the the acting for that one. I'll show it on here as well. Um, he's even doing a lip quiver, which is not, you know, it's not the easiest thing to fake when you. But that's that's what you can do Yo, when you're um, lip. yeah. When, when 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 you're a seasoned actor, he's uh, everyone is just doing a really Yo, great yeah. job in this movie. Oh yeah, I couldn't even begin to. Point to the weakest link. Everyone just does such a great job. You you just forget you're watching actors. You know they just totally you, you totally buy into everything, every character, every person. Yes. And so um, at the same time this is happening, obviously he's grabbing her to prevent her from getting up the stairs. In another universe, Wayman says um, to to Evelyn, you know, in relation to the, the, in the celebrity universe, he's like he who loves the most regrets the most let's not live in a fantasy like basically let's not let's not be together if it's never gonna work like the, um 
Because she did run after him after he said the, the first sort of thing that she talked to him about. And, and then Jobu says, uh, you see, it's a matter of time before everything balances itself out. Which is, uh, didn't we talk about this in the last stream we did? Kind of? Yeah, the... Um, the jog my memory, what, what so are you referring to in particular? When she says... Halo, it's only the one, last one you did? Not Halo, no, it was a catch-up stream, I think. But the fact I she said... A balanced out. Yeah, matter of time before everything balances itself out, referring, of course, to no matter what's built, it'll all come crashing down, essentially. Um, and the thrashing against it. Like the universe it. is heading towards entropy or something like that or i think so i think that's what's being implied here is like that's a component of support for for a nihilistic worldview because she keeps repeating that not everything lasts forever um and yeah I mean, uh, if that's even a thing that matters i i i, I just it's your attitude and perspective um well, yeah, that's what this film's going to do, right? Like, this is yeah. part of its response. Um, but so, that said, and then uh, he, back in the universe where he's got, like, the, the, the printer microwave suit on, says, um, let her go. And she says, I'm not willing to do to my daughter what you did to me. And uh, how on earth would you let me go so easily? And it's like, oh, shit, that's being brought up? Because that did happen. The, the Remember that thing? And it's like, ooh, oh, universe, yeah, that world. Quite a, quite a sting there. Um, I let you go so, so that I could live my dream of having a robotic battle exoskeleton made out of '90s printers. Hell yeah. The directors are very aware of all the different character conflicts. It brings them up at like the appropriate time. It's it's so well done. In yeah. That way. Um, and she says, you may see in her all of your greatest fears squeezed into one person. I spent most of her childhood praying she wouldn't end up like me, but she turned out to be stubborn, aimless, and a mess, just like her mother. This is yep. going back to the, um, the laundromat. laundromat. Yeah. And she says, but now I see it's okay that she's a mess, because she, like me, uh, the universe gave her someone kind, patient, and forgiving to make up for all she lacks. And... She says these different things in the language appropriate to the person she's talking to, like English to Joy, um, Mandarin to when she says the kind, patient person directed obviously at Waymond, and then back to her father when she introduces Joy's girlfriend. Which, yeah, um, yeah that's what, what Joy wanted. Okay. And uh, his reaction is unclear at first. But uh, Joy leaves anyway, because um, it's it's almost like I think this moment for Joy is just like, like yeah, okay, fine, you did you did the thing, you did what I wanted, but that doesn't change anything, like, um, in terms of making things more meaningful. But he does let it go in the in the crazy universe, and uh, she ends up trying to grab Joy. So begins the final boss fight, if you will. Mm hmm. Uh, fight. Well, it's kind of, um, you know, pretty, pretty intense. She grabs her and they start, like, having a little bit of a, a fist fight that just spans across universes. Which feels like some form of a natural endpoint for a film about this sort of thing. Well, I mean, I don't want to gloss over it. I love the fact that, yeah, Jobu is there doing all the crazy, like, poses ready to fight. And then Evelyn does the crazy poses, but then it opens out into a hug. It's like, damn, it's really great. It's like a juxta- you know, this is where they're at now. Yes. Yeah, they both- Her arc is essentially being realized, like, right before us. She's, uh, she's realized what she needs to do, Well, and think about what they've been doing once they both reached the peak of their power. Jobu's been arbitrarily destroying people and worlds, just because why not? Yeah. There's no reason not to. While uh, Evelyn's Meanwhile, been helping everybody find meaning, because why not? Yeah, they you know? they're both why using not? the same motivation in a sense. But the the interpretation of what they've come to realize is essentially they're polar opposites. Um, this will be drilled home very soon. I don't want to jump the gun. Yes. Um, and so they fight, and you get your 
the kind of shit that it's like nothing like this was in Multiverse of Madness, man. <laughs> Across mm -hmm. multiple eras and like f filmmaking genres, and, and makeup uh, and like costumes and the soundtrack, yes. it's just like you you utilize in all of it. Yes, it's an adventure. Just this fight scene alone is uh, a journey, mm -hmm. and it's kind of the opposite of Doctor Strange in the sense of Doctor Strange's specific characters traveling across multiverses, and this is almost like it's it's the opposite where it's different characters in their own you know kind of places doing this and like it, it yeah it, you no know, it gives a vibe that this is not the only i don't know it's hard to it's hard to say like this can happen across all places you know if this is the attitude that you want to have it doesn't have to be you know you don't have to be locked in it I, yeah it, it's tough to explain i don't know Yes, I think well, that, that movie didn't have anywhere near the imagination this movie does. No, I think something of a an observation to be made as well is, if you remember, um, the dad is encouraging her to abandon the daughter. You remember why he abandoned her? It was because of the person she chose to love, being Waymond. Right. And you can't help but like see that the the mum is like being given a choice of accepting being supportive of her daughter's like realities uh or she could abandon her like her father did to her and it's, it's like man you tied all how did you do so much work in so little time like you you tied all of this in it's like damn a tight script, good script dude good script yep um but yeah she keeps trying to beat her they even she even sends her through some of our familiar universes we've seen before but she can't win she keeps like losing in terms of uh dealing with evelyn in a more definitive way um they even end up again in the uh the pinata universe they just uh chill it out for a second but yeah. she uh, she says um ah oh, you said chilling out instead of hanging out yeah missed opportunity Such shame oh you haven't trained me well enough i need to learn more from you <laughs> the pun master yep. yeah you go to the top of the mountain where the dojo is, and it's just rags and a little. Uh, <laughs> what's the, what is it that they're they wear? It's not a gi, right? The what's the you know like Ryu? I have no idea. I don't know why you'd look like Ryu, but in any case, it's rags, but Ryu. And it's like <laughs> I'll, I'll show you the ways of pun. That feels like a episode of a Treehouse of Horror Wait, thing. Oh, I think that's <laughs> I think that's actually her quote as well. By the way, I think she says. There's got to be a universe where I beat you, or one where we tie, or maybe we just, oh, just hang around. Hang around, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, hanging out oh, and yeah. hang around are not quite the same. That's true. So. Um, and yeah, and then they, they, they phase into a different one, as she said, because it's all just a pointless, swirling bucket of bullshit. The bagel is where we find peace, Evelyn. And you get a, you get a literal, I am all the Jedi moment, okay? But there are ways to do it that aren't <laughs> shit. He says, stop calling me Evelyn, I am your mother. Is, uh, is, is good, because it's like re-establishing the dynamic between them isn't that Jobu is some entity beyond understanding at this point. They, they, have the, they share the same power level, so the only difference now is, is really back to normal. And it's like, yeah, I'm your mum. Shut the fuck up. Um, and you get this, this incredibly meaningful moment of they're, they're both worrying about being sucked in, but um, both Wayman and Gong Gong are both pulling them back, which uh, working as a big old family now. Yeah, if everyone does that thing that Waylon said, yeah, you could produce good results. It's kind of a team effort helps. Yeah, we've got everybody on board. We're um, all in this together. Yes, yeah. it's thematically important that it's not just the mother. Like the mother, the mother is being pulled by uh, Wayman. The Wayman is being pulled by the grandfather. I think that's the order. But like they're all working with each other to pull each pull all of them away from the abyss. Yeah, yeah. it's an encouragement that not don't just tell some don't just think someone else will take care of it. Someone else will do the good thing. Then you need to you you need to do it too. Right. Even if you don't know if you're working with someone, you kind of are. They all play a role in counteracting the meaninglessness that that can take over sometimes. 
And what I found interesting as well is when we were at this point, um, her crazy costume's been like sucked off and now she's wearing a normal yeah. costume. Normal outfit that she's wearing when they're in the uh, the laundromat. Like we've basically gotten rid of the, the, the major portion of how she feels and now she's just desperate, which is to uh lead us into the probably the most important scene where she just says stop and they have their big discussion out in the parking lot, which is probably what should have happened this whole time. I think that's what this whole film was leading to, is like they need to have an actual discussion. Yeah. Ideally what would have happened in the first act in the parking yeah. lot. Yeah. So what I mean, you you go through this insane nonsense, crazy adventure. Like not then, not for the movie, but like for them as characters. Like this yeah. should have happened earlier, and now we're finally having this discussion. Yeah. And, well, and that's what I'm saying. Like we've we've we like climaxed in the insane portion of the text of fighting across the whole multiverse, having robot grandpa suit try to stop you with all these different <laughs> assorted members getting the experience. It's like it's like what is all this crazy variable? And it's like we we've now come all the way down back to, to, to the point of two people talking just about something. It's, it's like a mother and a daughter having a very important moment. Um, yes. Yeah, and she says, uh, I don't want to hurt anymore, and whenever I'm with you, it hurts both of us, so let's just go our separate ways. Let me go. Um, and for a moment there, she says, okay. But then I was wondering her. what the film was going to do at this point. I was wondering, like, are you going to try to know, give a message no, 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 no. here? Is like, it's this other message of sometimes you have to let go, no matter. Sometimes that's just how it has to be, or you got to keep trying no matter what. Or what are we going to do here? What's, what's gonna they happen? would have a couple of options. I think we get. Um, he's falling into the, the 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 bagel in the in the hyper sort of sci-fi universe, and she almost chooses to come back out of it. But it's as a result of the conversation they end up having in the uh, the most grounded of the universes, I think. Which um, Evelyn says, "You are getting fat. You never call me, even though we have a family plan and it's free. You only visit when you need something. You got a tattoo, and I don't care if it represents the family. You know I hate them. Uh, the tattoos of all the places I could be. Why would I be here with you? You're right. It doesn't make any sense. And even Weyman is like." You know, stop. And then uh, it's like, no, 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 no. She's about to make a point. And she says, uh, maybe I could go somewhere to find some new discovery that would make us all feel like even smaller pieces of shit. Something that explains why you still went looking for me through all of this noise and why I still want to be here with you. And uh, I, I, I really like that the daughter is being called out on her crap. Yeah. On this instance, because yeah. it's not all one sided. Up until this point, you're kind of thinking that's the case, but it's like no, there's blame on both sides, both sides here. But once you've heard both cases out, it's like it doesn't matter. Like they they both love each other as people, like warts and all. You know, it's it's not, but it, it's not just all about the 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 mother screwing up and the daughter is completely faultless. Like there's things the daughter does that pisses the mother off and that's what kind of antagonizes her to yeah and it's, it's never been discussed it's clearly the problem they've never yes really had that talk and uh, right. i just think that's a really sort of strong theme for this film is the communication is so important uh, yeah and it's so difficult sometimes and just it makes it get to the point where we no longer even see each other as remotely rational we're just like nah, you're just crazy yeah you have to be stopped sort of thing um, this is what I mean. It's it's kind of incredible how many things they achieve at once in this film because there's uh, there's so many references to support the idea that communication is like key. Experience is the response to different. It's lots of um, lots of really good stuff. And and of course she's calling around another way. I think which is if you really believe like fully that nothing means anything, then why the hell were you so obsessed with having company when you kill yourself? Basically, what does that mean? Right. What does that imply? Like it is, yeah. it, you wouldn't have done that if it meant nothing, would you? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, this is enough to pull her back to the point of uh, Joy asking, so you're just going to ignore everything else? You could be anything anywhere. Why not go somewhere where your daughter is more than this? Yeah. Um, here all we get are a few... She, she like, throws the quote like, at her again, because she said this one earlier. She says, we only get a few specks of time where anything actually makes sense. 
And then she says the response, which is, then I'll cherish these few specks of time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because, uh, yeah, it's less about what we don't have and more about what we have. Yes. Uh, you know that meme in movies where it's like, uh, as a joke, it's like you reinterpret scenes of a movie to say, like, the name of the movie in the scene? It's like, I have become everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. <laughs> if, if there was a scene where somebody were to say that, it would be this fucking scene. Yeah. But Well, uh, right now you have to go inside and talk to the <laughs> Godfather. Um, and then they do something that I quite love. It might be one of my favorite visuals to throw in so quickly. I appreciate it beyond what you could imagine. So... Earlier they were talking about how, she, you know, she mentioned, like, Wayman to her and Becky to Joy is evidence of, like, the universe providing something that was missing. And y you combine that with all the other things they've been saying about meaning and how we, we are where we are and how we should appreciate what we have. When she makes all of these last speeches to fully convince Joy, we get a lot of visuals. We get um, Deirdre sharing her vape with Evelyn and just laughing with her because it's just like, yeah, that's just they're just, they're just getting along now. Uh, Deidre um, vapes, horse character. In the hot dog world, Deidre and Evelyn are doing their sex dance thing. Because again, like we don't care about how absurd or comical any of this is. We're making one point with each of these visuals, or rather, a unified point with each of the visuals. Uh, the Rakakuni guy, he wasn't able to continue running, but then uh, he gets on top of Evelyn and controls her with hair, and they're able to reach Rakakuni. Like, working together. <laughs> um... Gong Gong reaches out to and, and actually, like, has fun with Becky. Which is, you know, huge, considering a lot of this was based on the, the assumption that he wouldn't be accepting of her at all. But he was. Um, yep. uh, Evelyn asks... And the subtle implication that Becky's life gets better ap after she stops buttoning her, her top button, is a, it's interesting to think <laughs> about. What does that mean? What does that mean? I don't know. I don't know, but the question's been asked. Um, Evelyn asks Waymond in the celebrity universe to give her a chance, to give their relationship a chance. Mm -hmm. The the rock universe, the rock smashes into the other one. The singer, Evelyn, is just on the stage laughing with her dad, presumably because she recently screamed. That was part of like the, the second act low point stuff. Um, yep. To like bring all the universes down, but they're going, they're going back up. They're okay. And... Um, they show the choir singing that Wayman set up, the raccoon singing, and it, the, the images start getting faster and faster and faster and faster, and we see um, a lot of imagery for two, two things colliding, and they have uh, a red apple and a green apple, right before a really fast flash of showing uh, Thea, the protoplanet, smashing into Earth. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I which saw that. is such a beautiful way to summarize everything. Yep. Everywhere all at once. It's, um, I assume this is pretty common knowledge, but the idea is that there's a good chance life wouldn't have formed on Earth the way that it is in any way, shape, or form if not for that event having happened. Yep. Yeah. In all likelihood, the moon is super instrumental in the way that Earth is. Yeah, like it's it just fucks with all the comp like the it's it's uh it's the start of a lot of um different shows about science. It's just like this theory of like because there's evidence of the as a as an entity in pieces of, of around the Earth. Earth is like absorbed it and it, it changed the composition to a degree that enough uh, oceans and, and life could form and stuff. And it's just like, damn. What a beautiful yes. way to tie absolutely everything and down to the fundamentals of life forming. It's so, mm -hmm. it's so terrific. Like you've got this musical buildup, you've got the image of planets colliding, which is just like, like the, the, like the sheer magnitude of that. And then you juxtapose that with them, mother and daughter, hugging in the parking lot with no sound design or music at all. It's just the dead ambience of standing in that parking lot. There's no other sounds going on. And you just sit in that ambience. And you listen to them hugging it out, basically. Like you, uh, I feel like a, a lesser director, not necessarily a bad director, but a lesser director would have scored that scene with like a bit of music or something to like, oh, the audience needs something here to like make them 
know we need what to make sure that they know how to feel yeah exactly trusting them to understand what's happening right um, but no that's not the answer you have to have nothing just ambience that's all you need here and they well, get just, it it's people it's a get it system balance throughout the film of really broad events happening like a where we're presenting essentially like the entirety of existence and all <laughs> existences and everything that that entails. And then these hard cuts to um very small moments with people, because that's yes. kind of, it's, it's kind of like embodied in a speech to, to joy there where it's, it's like, even in the vastness of the multiverse, where there's all of these crazy variables and things that you try and account for. And just the, the nature of how, uh, existence being so expansive, it kind of means that everything is, I guess, meaningless in a sense. Nevertheless, like people still f- are bound to each other. Like people still have things that they value. It's kind of like hard to to like not be a human being, essentially, even when you're confronted with the vastness of reality and the cosmos. Um, right. It's it's why I think it's such a good idea to juxtapose those crazy events and the vastness of existence in the universe with very small quiet human moments um yes. it just sort of emphasizes that even in the in the mess of everything all it is to us all the time is like those human moments that's like the important part that's what helps us make sense of everything that's what we care about even when we're confronted with the vastness of reality yes and in in that instance it becomes clear to them the characters that that is everything it's mm-hmm. everything, everywhere, all at once, like for those characters in that scene, where it's just like they're there together, hugging, nothing else is going on, there's no music, it's just them in wow. that environment, just sitting with each other, hugging, and that's everything to them. When and we, it's like, you we, get a sense of, oh, this is the movie, I get it. Well, that, I, that's what uh, I was about to say, that's, uh, if there was any way to boil this movie down into a, into a core... It would be that the pers- the the antagonistic perspective is nothing matters, and the yes. uh, protagonist perspective is nothing matters. Like it's kind of it's 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 the same it's the same uh, perspective. I guess if you were to take away all of the substance behind it, but it's essentially yes. one side is nothing matters, so fuck this. Whereas the other side is nothing matters, so let's like get as much value out of life as possible. We can do whatever yes. we want because nothing matters. It's a much more optimistic framing of um, yeah. It's it's so easy to sink into the negative, basically nihilistic one, rather than I guess lean into it's existentialism, right? Where nothing matters, so make of life what you will. Um, which yes. I think is basically the point that the film is espousing is kind of existentialism. Not even okay. kind of. I feel like I'm downplaying it. That's basically the perspective. I know what you mean. The 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 nothing matters line, I think, can be interpreted potentially as like counter to what the scene is trying to say. But what I interpreted it as is nothing matters except this. So like the, the inference is the except this part where it's like, well, I nothing matters uh, except this moment that we're sharing here together right now. Nothing well, else I th- matters. I, th- I think uh, she says, cause she's like, uh, Joy says, this is awkward. And Evan's like, nothing matters. It's basically saying, who cares? Like this is, this is valuable. What's happening right now. This is That's, meaningful. Yeah, like, think... Get out of your uh, your head on like what is you know awkward or like who cares? Essentially, that's kind of the attitude. Who gives a fuck? Like this is this is good. What's happening right now? Yes, equally valid. I think. Yeah, I agree. It it seems to me a lot of the, the what the film is saying is the components that make up the nihilistic worldview that Jobu had. Uh, they, they're just how they were compiled for her when you don't have to compile them that way you can come out with all kinds of different conclusions um, in, like in the same way that life life having meaning is made from your own perception like someone could see that as like oh well that's not as it's like yeah but that's the same thing as finding a lack of meaning as in like that is yeah. still down to your own perception they're so, both from your perspective because the, the truth is nothing matters but like what you make of that is entirely up to you. Right. And I like, guess unless you have a different fundamental worldview of reality. But yeah, like, and, and at least in my I case. think that's the logic for a lot of things in this, where it's like, it, it, you, you go, life is fleeting, and it's like, so we shouldn't care about it? It's like, no, that's why we should care about it so much. And it's mm-hmm. like, yes. you live 
to experience, you experience as much as you can, and with other people, um, and, you know, don't believe the, like, experience that you value is just an impossibility. Like, you keep fighting, you keep living, you keep looking, you'll, you'll, you'll find something, because I think, I think to a degree this film has a, a, an aspect of, like, fighting is living, and making sure that you uh, you fight, but expand the definition of fight to include being kind, assisting people, supporting people, because almost every action you take is against just sitting down and accepting, like you know, disillusion and falling to pieces. Or entropy, you know. Yeah. Like, like life is essentially fighting against entropy. And it feels like this film tries to tell us like being confused and angry is totally normal. Feeling like you know, you're tied down in your life through a lack of the correct actions or poor actions or th other people's actions upon you or whatever, like, it, just try to understand that the the biggest sort of <laughs> problem for all of us is that it's just a, a lack of understanding that we're all in the same boat sometimes. Yes. And, um, yeah, that's that's kind of like I don't know, this this, this film doing all of that it's, uh, it's incredibly meaningful. I love that this, uh, this feeling that Joy and Evelyn are having right now in this instance in the parking lot where it's just like pure, I think, joy. Where, like, they're embracing each other and they're so... Like, I think five seconds before this moment, they were sad. But I feel like in this moment now, they are happy beyond... beyond any moment of happiness they've had recently, you know, this is something that's completely lacking from the lives of the Evelyn and the Waymond in the, um, actor universe, you know, where they have achieved, they've gone their separate ways. They've achieved quote unquote success. They've starred in movies. They have a shitload of money. They're wearing tuxedos and fancy dresses and all that, but they are missing this. They don't have this. And this Evelyn, who is the quote-unquote worst Evelyn that has achieved nothing relative to all the other instances of Evelyn throughout the multiverse, has managed to achieve this ecstasy of just, you know, I'm here with my daughter, these people in my life, my family, they mean so much to me, and this is just pure happiness that I'm experiencing right now in this small moment in the parking lot. And uh, they have that to be thankful for, you know. I love that about it. It's just like so, such a positive message, and I think it's it's true, you know. There's there's joy like that to be found, whatever your predicament in life is, you know. And you just got to learn to count your blessings, be thankful for what you do have in life, you know, because. I mean, there's there's bound to be a bunch of people in life, or there is that have life much worse off than you do, you know, in any instance. And they still and, try uh, to make it work, because that's the thing, it's, it's yeah. more of a, it's not like it ignores the idea of material realities, it's just trying to give you a better point of view to be able to work with yourself on, like, this is all, it's like a form of therapy that could act for a lot of people, something like this. Yes. And uh, I've seen people describe it as like, this movie is important, and it's like, I, c I can see how something like this can really help somebody out there. Uh, Very yeah. therapeutic, I think, yeah, for, for to watch, yeah. Definitely makes you feel good in the end, and it does not feel so cheaply. Uh, that, that idea of everything, quote-unquote, being embodied in your family and the people that are around you and whether it's like bad or good that you're going through on that particular day you're experiencing it in the proximity of people that you love you know and uh, it's like an adventure you're going on with them like that's the joy in life that's the secret if you if you can be lucky enough to attain that and they perceive themselves as unlucky because they think of themselves as like, oh, I'm stuck in this dead-end laundromat doing fucking taxes and getting audited by the IRS, but they, they have everything there under their nose and they don't see it. You know, that's, that's what I love so much about this. 
Um, yeah, we, we cut over to, we're back where we were, square one again, doing the taxes on the table, and it says all at once. Because now it's like, with everything we've come to learn, where does it take us next? About, about all this different stuff. And uh, first and foremost, when they get to the IRS place, you see that uh, she's like, I think she says like, uh, grow your hair out to Becky. Which, um, again, just in line with the whole, like, she's saying that stuff because she cares, not because she's yep. being a bitch or anything. Um, they've got their cookies as well, ready for Deirdre. And um, as they're going in, she gives Waymond a big old passionate kiss, which I think reflects what he saw when he was first year with those other two, that he, he yep. made him feel like there's a lot more potential there and, you How know, in his well. Uh, Can love bloom at the inter Internal Revenue Service office? It can indeed. Yeah, this film's <laughs> definitely arguing so. Um, yeah, and then and then they're there, and and uh, Deirdre says, "So things are better. You listened, but you didn't listen. You didn't account for some kind of section C." And she starts trailing off, and and we hear a whole bunch of sounds and distortions, presumably from Evelyn listening to other universes. And it starts to fade a little bit, and then she says, Evelyn, are you listening? And she says, yes. And it ends. Which... Well, she says, uh, could you say that again, Ryan? Oh, right, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Feels uh... pretty emblematic of something that is kind of being reinforced consistently in this film, which is to focus on where you are right now and your situation. Because at this point, I think you can look at this last part and be like, wait, so did any of that happen? Like, did any of, of what we just saw before with the crazy multiverse stuff happen? when we have essentially kind of like this is this is what happens in in the real world like what we would consider being these crazy multiverses are just you mentally drifting off and thinking about what if what if i had done this what about this world like what if i was doing that um but now she's paying attention to the world that she's in you know it's like oh sorry like she she puts that out of mind and focuses in on where she is right now um as opposed yeah. to allowing herself to just drift off into all of these different alternatives that aren't her life, um, rather than fully being immersed in her life right now. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I think in, they, they went very deliberately without, instead of having it be, your taxes are great, you're all great, everything's great, woohoo, this is literally, things are better, but there are Making problems. progress. We've got to deal with them. progress. And yeah, and I think yeah. that with everything... With everything that was established in the film, um, is 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 like you might think that the it's like happily ever after, but the film is like, well, life has its challenges, and you got to deal with them. You can't ignore them, and that's that's yeah. okay. I like that it's like a a newfound perception on life within the the same framework as before, where you've still got these problems, like being audited. Yeah. But she, I appreciate that the problems didn't go away. She still yes. has problems. Yeah. But this time around, she's looking at the members of her family and she's getting lost in the infinite complexity of each of them individually. You know, it's just like, oh, there's my daughter. She's got her own life and all these different things. There's my father. He's got her, his own story and this, he's living it out. And this, that's his story. And then he, she looks at her husband, thinks the same thing. And but she's uh, without going into the multiverse thing of it, she's kind of uh, entranced by the complexity of all the lives of her family and appreciating their presence. But then also like looking at the the um, insurance agent and going, "Oh, sorry, what what did you say?" Like, so I I I tuned out of this in universe for a small moment but i didn't jump out of this universe i was staying within this universe but just appreciating the um the near infinite complexity of my family members but now i'm like focused on you like what was that again i appreciated the uh like the the scale and yet the minutia of that at the same time and i think that's kind of the magic quality that a final scene of a movie should try and capture you know yeah, um, I see. It's like it's just, just everything is. What well, everything that was said of this movie was true about motivation and stuff, but it doesn't make the taxes go away. That is a problem to be dealt with, and don't 
Like, because it was the springboard for the whole story in a sense. Um, a lot of it happens, uh, it revolves around the taxes. The taxes are, are consistently are brought in. It's such a great sort of. It's just everyone knows taxes to be fucking lame. Everyone hates taxes. It's They're terrible. annoying. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, just the film is just like, fucking take it head on. You can do it. You'll be okay. And uh, hence why I would go as far as saying I hope this film never gets a sequel because it's, it's done. It's made all of these points. <laughs> yeah, complete. wait, wait for it. It'll come. It's everything, everywhere, all at once, too. Nothing, Electric nowhere, Boogaloo. never. <laughs> oh God, that's like the opposite movie where everything's really like sad. <laughs> yeah. You gotta like as well at the end where they never. stretch out the title, and the only letter that doesn't is the O. Yeah. O. <laughs> Noise. Um. But yeah, that's that's the end of the movie. Then that's the credits. We did it. Mm-hmm. Hooray! We did it. Man, we managed three to hours... cover a very dense, we, very we, dense. We were three hours off doing the same as Doc Strange Two. Man, yeah, but I oh, it's hmm. Both of those movie, both of these movies are very, very dense. Yes. One is dense with badness. One is dense with goodness. I agree. They really are just like opposites of one another they kind of deal with some similar topics but their quality levels are just one is phenomenally good one is horrifically terrible it's literally it funny night that and day i could the not believe time, the know? contrast well it's just this is a fucking film this was like this is a fucking story someone had a story that they wanted to tell you know yeah um because because uh, i guess it's because i guess we're gonna start like putting a bow on this on the discussion about this film i think um I'm becoming more and more convinced that the the sign of something that's great, um, like a great story, whether it be a film, a book, or whatever, is uh, a level of deliberateness um, in 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 the crafting of it. You know, like you can you, when you watch like a film and you get the sense like you thought through pretty much every facet of this story, from like the characters, the things that they say to each other, their backstories, and like their uh, their traits, and how they um, will mesh or clash with other characters, yes. symbolism, uh, cinematography, like uh, even music choice, and the fact that like you can have like a lyric that something that you can easily miss that just has a lot more uh, depth to it. Even the the use of language, like different languages in the film, when you can like see all of these and just get the impression that everything about it was thought through. Like usually, you've got something really great um, that you're that you're watching. I don't know that you accidentally achieve something like this. You know, I don't think I don't think that's possible. That you accidentally yeah. haphazardly write a script and create something this fucking excellent. No, um, like I just don't think that's the case. This is like such a deliberate, thoughtful, like well crafted um, story. I yep. think it's fucking great. Mm-hmm. It's very great. Which about right. it's not it enough to up, just yeah. have a neat premise. You gotta follow all the way through. Be deliberate with all of your lines, all your connections and your details. Well, <sighs> the, the directors had studied a lot in this field. I can't, there's a term for it. It's modular something. I can't remember, but it's the idea that there's universes like this universe where like every kind of absurdity you can think of exists at, in a way that's as real as this universe is real. And, uh, I mean, I don't know if I'm on board with that because like, it's like that Rick and Morty thing where you have like couches sitting on pizzas, ordering people to the house. Like, it's like, this makes zero sense. Like I, I can never believe the universe would like be formed this way of, you know, on its own. Um, but like they had the discipline to kind of like navigate through that and uh, not just completely embrace the nihilism and the abs- absurdism of the subject matter. You know, they actually told a grounded, emotionally resonant family themed story and f- and used that as a framing device uh, across all this complete absurdity. Like this, this is one of the most insane movies I've ever seen. Like just like how crazy it was and how funny it was. I've never seen anything like this before. I was really delighted in the theater. 
like, fuck, this is, I'm having such a good time with this and I'm probably never going to experience this again in <laughs> years, you know? Something isn't beautiful because it lost, though. <laughs> yeah. It's John Cheese. <laughs> um, yeah, I say that about does it for the movie discussion. Um, unless there's anything else anyone want to say about it? Oh, no, I'm, uh, Running out of steam here after all of this conversation and sitting and focusing on this movie. Watching it play through on my filer Reno. Lots to appreciate. Good. Well, in that case then, uh, is everyone alright with me to go into the super chat? See what messages we've been yep. sent. Yeah, sure. Sweet. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just, I'll just start from the beginning. First one says, Mola. I don't know if you've seen Men, but it does have a six minute long graphic M-Preg inflation birthing body horror sequence at the end. Um, I know that Capital Opinion said it was bad, and he's very familiar with Alex Garland's work, so I'm willing to believe that it is bad. I fucking um, love that movie Ex Machina that he did, so oh, like, yeah. I'm very tempted to watch it. I I didn't like love devs, I didn't love Annihilation, and Annihilation. I, from what it oh, sounds like, I'm not going to love this. Oh, yeah. Oh, well. Uh, I hate Jake Kenobi. Well, we're watching that tomorrow, so... Jake uh, Kenobi, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Who knows? Uh, I'm not joking, look it up. Jared Leto has a cult on an island, it's weird as hell. Uh, yeah, I've heard about that. I don't know the specifics of it. Um, Maybe. Yeah, it seems pretty weird. Swedish chef, morb, morb, morb. Alright. Um, morb. Please have a two hour tangent about Obi-Wan on EFAP. Oh, you'll get, you'll get your full coverage. You'll just get a plenty tangent. of tangents, yeah. yeah. Uh, Kenobi proves how little destiny... No, Disney, sorry. <laughs> I'm reading the title. Um, cares about their own canon. Seriously, what the fuck? You're all going to look in on this, right? Or did Book of Boba Fett break you? No, we'll get out of there. We'll get we'll out of there. We'll watch that one. we to organize one, yeah. our team, right? To break it down. Mm-hmm. Um, for any thoughts about multiverses, game looks fun. Uh, oh, that's the, uh, yeah, it's the Warner Brothers, like, Smash Brothers thing. It looks fun, but I don't really know a whole lot about it. Hmm. I might check it out. Uh, have you seen Love, Death, and Robots? Do you like it? No, I haven't seen I it. I haven't. I assume the other two lads here haven't either. I tweeted about that multiverse thing, because the trailer that came out, it had, like, Batman and Super Saiyan Shaggy fighting Bugs Bunny. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, yeah. where the fuck are we as a culture? Right now? <laughs> where are we? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what does anything mean anymore? Like, this is so absurd. Uh, it annoys me how some movie reviewers say, shut up and listen to me talk, or don't tell me if you disagree without even realizing it. Uh... Don't tell me if you disagree. Oh. I guess, like, they're not interested in hearing the negative or differing perspectives. But, like, what if it improved your understanding of a thing, you know? I Well, I mean, of course it could, but I don't know. Like, depends on if you, yeah. Damn. don't know. Uh, finally, EFAP will explain the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. I've been eagerly awaiting this moment for years. Hi, Rags. Hi. Well, yeah, We've hopefully. talked about nihilism before, don't worry. Oh yeah, I, 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 I hope uh, those who watched the movie felt this was everything they were looking for in coverage of it, because, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we, we talked about a lot of the scenes in the film, I think. Quite a few. Many. Uh, EFAP, FNT, and It's a Gundam have inspired me to follow my dream. I've put together a rock band called Grass Wolf, and we just released our first album, Moonshine. There are covers of Tell Me oh. Why from Berserk and Escape from the City from Sonic, mean a lot to me if you'd hear it. <laughs> it's streaming most oh, places. Yeah. Thank you for everything. Good boy, Rags. No, oh, thank you. And it's it's grass what? Grass? Uh, grass wolf. Grass wolf. Yeah. Um, good job, grass you know? Mm -hmm. Getting that shit I mean, done. Album. Yeah, here we tossed. go. Yeah. Grass wolf on... Because when I Google it, I... Obviously, what pops up first is wolves in the grass. Mm -hmm. But yeah, here you are. And the uh, watches wolves chilling in grass. <laughs> yeah, just wolves in grass. You know, just yeah. 
but then it has yeah Amazon Music Unlimited. Yeah. I see. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the ambition, but it seems a little hard to break down everything that's ever been. Good hustle, though, guys. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, why not, right? We were gonna just just cover everything. Once yep. this is done, that's that's the last EFAB episode. There's no need to do another one. Uh, read Pixar's Twenty Two Rules of Storytelling and tell me if you agree with them. Hmm. Uh, damn it! I'm playing Mario Kart. Say, say uh, Pixar's Twenty Two Rules of Storytelling. Well, I mean, this is probably something we would we don't need to read save a different thing you, for, right? Yeah. You might put a note for like uh, episode two hundred, something yeah. like that. We can go through some of those. That that sounds like it. Well, would be maybe a maybe idea. it might be worthwhile to point out. This is number one. You admire a character for trying more than for their success. True, I think, which yeah. is true. Yeah, I think when it comes to the idea of storytelling being that there's some sort of plight to overcome, the success itself is kind of secondary to them putting in the effort to do it and the trials and tribulations that stem from it. But we can we right. can go through that another time. Mm -hmm. Um, this movie was phenomenal. Loved every minute. Yeah, I kind of did too. I thought it was great. Yeah. Um, I thought the gold standard was Bioshock Infinite for multiverse stuff. Oh no, <laughs> no. Oh. Are you fucking with us, or? I hope they fucking. They must know I if they've watched the show that we're not fans like, of Bioshock Infinite. Yeah. We hate. I hate Bioshock Infinite so much. I love Bioshock 1. I really like Bioshock 2, and I hate Infinite. Talk about a series that went off the fucking cliff. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I haven't played it yet, and I'm looking forward to it, and I've, it looks inter so very shit. interesting to me. So I'm very curious. It's horseshit. Um, From <laughs> gameplay and story perspective, it's just ugh, such a downgrade. Get ready for the fourth game. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be great. <laughs> hmm. Um. Hello, Mumbles Bong and crew. Thoughts on Interstellar? Heard on previous streams that you thought it was awful. Could you give me some reasons? Hi, Raggle. Hello. The film is complete fucking nonsense. Uh, the newest update for that, for people who who care, I guess, is uh, I was speaking to Duma Media like a few weeks ago, maybe two. I'm not sure. And we were comparing our thoughts on Nolan movies, and we lined up on every single one except Interstellar. He was like, hmm, I'm pretty sure if you if you hate too much on whether or not things make sense in that film, it's going to damage a lot of the value of like what's in it and the good stuff that's in it. And, and I was like, all right, let us do something crazy. We will watch it together and uh, we will we will literally EFAP it. I, I actually like went through it with him and paused to have literally. discussions. Yes. Damn. And um, and don't worry. It's actually all recorded. Uh, that was the premise of doing it, because I said it would be oh. useful if you can um, argue me out at some positions. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a video someday, probably. And um, I think by the end of it, he said... Like, he'd gone from saying it's a movie he quite loves in, in different ways to he hates it quite a bit, and he thinks it has oh, possibly no. the worst ending in all of movies. <laughs> uh... When he, Anne Hathaway just goes off on her own. This I'm not even going to bother trying to explain it. There is so much. <laughs> I legit after watching it with him and discussing it with him, my understanding of Interstellar is less than it was before. I thought I had a handle on it, but now I no longer have as strong a handle. It's so bad. Did you know that black holes have oxygen and the temperature is at a place that a human could survive in it? No, in the, it's like like one of a hundred things. It's I did so... not know that. It's so well, so bad. Well, told me that when <laughs> <Matt> movies <laughs> black hole <laughs> where no logic <laughs> can escape. Yep. Um. But yeah. Uh. We legitimately we we went through the ending. Like I'm talking about the last like few minutes of the film several times, and we discussed for a while what the fuck the ending even is. And I thought I used to know what it was, but I no longer know what it was. And then I asked a few people... <laughs> ending that I used to know. I, it's it's kind of fascinating, and I'd like to to, you know, make something for that someday. I'll get there. Um, it's it's quite a movie. It really is. So, you know, more on that at some point. Yeah. Also, um, yeah, Bioshock Infinite shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, crew, I disagree with your takes so far, but let's see if you can change my mind. I look forward to hearing your what? arguments. 
Uh, what well, takes? Well, well, hey, that's, we, that's, that's good. Right, I think. Because I remember seeing our, that one coming. Oh, our opinion on uh, everything everywhere all at once? Yeah. Well, not only good, but great. But hopefully, after laying out everything that we think is valuable about it, Maybe we will have convinced them, but I just like the idea that they're willing to listen to the arguments at least. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, what is this? Fuck Mary, Unalive, Morgan Le Fay, Medea of Colchis, and Medusa. I, I, so, uh, what's who's the second one? I don't. I don't even That's know. I don't, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it, it correctly. Medulka. Um, uh, we don't. We don't need to entertain it, Rags. You know, we can. We can just. We, we can just move on. I'm much more invested in the second question. Do you wipe sitting yeah. down or standing up? <laughs> can't fucking believe. <laughs> it's a canine secret. Oh. I can't divulge. <laughs> hey man, brave people try out both, I suppose, but uh, definitely not. Um, that it's not it's like, yeah, 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 you know I don't think that there's this this just definitive we just went over a film it's all about experiences I think there's plenty of ways to wipe one's bum and there are many correct ways and there are many horrifically incorrect ways whatever you do well and what works for you whatever keeps you clean back there man just go you go for it no one no one's watching you in there at least they shouldn't be. Maybe that's your thing. I don't know. But no, that's you time. That's you time. Don't bring other people into this. Just be be yourself. Mm -hmm. Just be yourself. Wipe your ass. Hi, Rex. Hi. I'm going to be back for the VOD, but I love this movie. Can't wait to hear what y'all have to say. Also, this is my first super chat. Hello, everyone else. Oh, thank you very much. Hello. Uh, well, hopefully, you will get a very substantial answer. A chonkla. Oh, I know you got yeah. yeah. You will get a chonky answer. That's right. There's a lot to talk about. This film is layers of good. Uh, I meant to say this several streams ago, but I never got the chance. The rate of speed at which Hassan reads comments reminds me of children who read as fast as possible to impress adults. Oh, yeah, because he's like... He doesn't really read them like a sentence. He'll be like, like for instance, someone says... uh. Uh, Rags will still be fluffy, fluffy, no matter what. Like, that's how he'll fucking read, like, a comment that comes up. And it's like, awesome. I didn't catch any of that. Yeah, and it seems so unnecessary. You know? Just slow down. Like, he's deliberately yeah, read... obscuring everything he's saying. You want to, when you read something out loud, the idea is you're not just reading it for yourself. You're reading it to that's the what, yeah, thousands exactly. of people watching. You Here's want the them thing. to follow along with your thought process? If you're going to read fast, at least enunciate the words correctly holy shit if you're gonna yeah if you're gonna if you're gonna read it fast at least speak with some level of clarity you know yeah it's like Reading a dismissiveness not... embedded in the speed that it's read out as if to like yep. discard it right away before you're not you gonna dedicate much it, time to right? it you know yeah. yeah you can you can read quickly but clearly or you can just read like a normal person i suppose it's not a race it's not a no, race. true. Mm -hmm. Destiny on Maybe EFAP? This. this is the multiverse I needed. It is a bit of a strange crossover, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, mm -hmm. it um, started listening to Destiny while welding at work, and you're pretty enjoyable to listen to as well as the people he debates, as dumb as they are. Yoinky shploinky. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> well, we're more than happy to help you <laughs> weld. Yeah. I hope your welds are... How would you describe a good? What is it? How would you describe a good weld? I hope your welds are secure. Yeah. And yeah, if it doesn't tidy. all fall apart at the end, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> May your welds forever be secure and tidy. But you know what? If it does <laughs> fall apart by the end, that's okay. That's okay. That was always a possibility. It's all right. You can, you can build it back up. Um. Very yo, well, Destiny, yeah. some center right love from me. You cool? Oh, I'm sure he'd appreciate that. I'm sure he would. Um, if you could have a game of any franchise you like, what would you like to see? I, for one, would like a Souls-like Lord of the Rings game. I think it could work well. Oh, yeah, I think so. It oh, could, uh, yeah. I think that could yeah. work really well. I want my Daredevil would... game where you are uh, you go out at night as Daredevil and beat people up, and then in the day you do court cases based on the evidence and stuff that you collect during the night and information that you can acquire. I, I want oh. that. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Mahler? Hmm... So, 
I guess I'm gonna aim for like IPs that don't really have any video games of them, but have lots of potential to, and then some kind of like game format that I think would suit it. I guess that's what I'm aiming for. Like probably a pretty intense and very well executed uh, RPG that relates to um, like something Lovecraftian. I've I've talked about it before, but it's the game I really want to exist, and it comes close every once in a while, but then they always fumble it because it's not very well detailed, and it's made for a niche audience, so it can't have much support. I'm hoping one day we get the kind of thing I would really like, and just r really well executed uh, representations of the kinds of things you may experience, but in the format of a game. And, and then, you know, replayability, being able to go through and succeed with different builds and stuff. That would be something fun, I think. But, like, I would have also pretty generic answers as well. Like, it would be really fun to have some more Star Wars games that are, like, really fucking good. Um, because I guess we're getting another one of the Fallen Jedi games, right, or something? Yeah, Survivor. Which, um, yeah, you know. Die. Yes. What about you, John? Oh, jeez, uh... Just a good Halo game, please! <laughs> A good Halo game. Um, I don't know. Like, what it is I, I seek most out of video games. I guess I like third-person adventures and shooters. Like, those are the genres I prefer the most. I'm a big fan of Sonic, like old-school Sonic, before it went 3D. Even though I kind of have a soft spot for the Sonic Adventure games, even though they're glitch buckets. But, uh... Yeah, I... I, I I really don't know. I'd have to think more about that. I myself, um, I think instead of going a route of a game that doesn't quite exist, one of the things that comes to my mind is a, because it's been tried in the past to not, gen, not really good degrees, but I think it would be really nice to get a, a more slower paced and survival focused Fallout game. But like really, not like like oh, you have to drink the water every two hours, and you would no, no, like a like a, a nice kind of a, a, an atmospheric, slower pace survival focused Fallout game. Uh, I really like that world. I love the aesthetics. I am a, a big fan of what you could do with that as a backdrop for a game. But really managing. You know, health and hydration, radiation, resource management, uh, not having super bullets, you know, bullet spongy enemies, not having those, but working within the small amounts of ammo that maybe you have. And I, I think that would be really neat. And if it had a good cooperative element where you could play with you know, a friend or two, I think that would be really neat. Um, I've always kind of enjoyed those uh, adventure -y sorts of games where, uh, you can play with a friend or be alone and just kind of just, you know, lose yourself in a world. Yeah. But I think that would be neat. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, uh, Wings quote of the day. He comes back Ooh. from the bathroom in quotations. Uh, ban anyone saying, did you wash your hands? That shit is so played out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should uh, wash your hands regardless yes, of... Yes. Your posture when you uh, wipe your derriere, you should always wash your hands. You should just wash your hands in general every once in a while. I agree with Keeps you. Keep your peripherals clean. Wash your hands, gamers. Yeah. You don't want to get gamer gunk all over your oh, mouse and keyboard. No, that gamer gunk. <laughs> gamer gunk trademark. Yeah. Uh, bonus quote, I'm very not toxic. <laughs> it's true. It's true. He's, 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 he's one of the best. Wings, it's a great guy. Oh, it's funny. I'm very not toxic. Also, a quote from him: "Ban anybody who asks if I washed my hands." Ban anyone who asks if I washed my hands. I am not toxic. <laughs> <laughs> Look, those uh, quotes could be separated by weeks. Who knows? Personally, or seconds. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. I could. I could tell you. Personally, I don't do sub because if there are words on screen, it causes me physical pain not to read it. Also, hi rags. Watch Black Lagoon. Um, hello. Probably won't, honestly. But you know, if I ever do, it, that's an anime, right? Black Lagoon. I don't know, actually. I guess I could be let me, either. Let me let me take a look here. Uh, 
Black Lagoon. It is an anime from a year that is, some people would say, is about 2006. I've heard of it, but I just, I just, I'm, I just don't really have an interest. Um, but I'll keep it in mind if I ever get in the anime mood. Uh, as for the whole, I don't do subs because if they're on screen, it causes me pain not to read them. I guess everyone's different on this uh, with their experience yeah. with subs. I, I just like, yeah, I like them. I like subtitles. They, um, I've always found I can. Like, I take a bite out of the film, it's a more thorough bite when I have subtitles on. I don't know how else to put it. I like having subtitles on as a way of studying the dialogue. Like, uh, especially on, like, um, when I've watched the movie once, and then I'm watch I'm rewatching it, I like to turn subs on and just, like, analyze word for word what's being said. Well, fair enough. Um, yeah, I find it's helpful. So oh, this one says, "Watch normal meme compilations, not meme faps." I'm not sure exactly what they're saying, but um, it's kind of just sparked something in my brain. I'm like, "What if?" Oh, this would be much harder, actually. I think I'm trying to think of how it would work, but you know the way I usually do it, where I cycle up like a hundred images in a row, and they're actually in tabs when I do it. Um, it's like maybe I should make a video out of them instead. But then I was like, wait, would that actually take longer? Because I'd have to save all the images, then drag them all into the timeline, make the video, upload it, and then have it ready to be used. When, at that point, I'm almost, like, doing more work, I think, than having it just in tabs. But um, anyway, the, the more relevant is that there are meme faps on the way. We're going to be getting uh, one done, I think, on Wednesday. Lots of different things happening. We'll talk more about that toward the end of the stream. Um, I have gotten ads for this before. Um, yeah, I think Destiny mentioned that A24's advertising is not very good. I, I know that I heard about this through advertising, and then I heard about it way more a bit later through word of mouth. Um, Likewise. So, like, it wasn't I, invisible to me. I think this movie is their highest grossing film. It is. Is that what they've it done? Is. Yeah. And it's the one that I think I've heard of in the most normal sense. Like, I, I think I just saw, like, a movie poster for it while I was at the cinema going to a different film. I saw a poster for it or, like, an ad for it in front of another movie. But it was, the like, the, the, the first one that I think I've seen that was a typical advertisement. Mm -hmm. I forgot to ask Destiny, though. What he thought about the Green Knight because I kind of hate that, that movie. That was A24, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm curious because I love The Lighthouse and I really, really like this movie, but I hate The Green Knight. So, hmm. I mean, I've always heard about the A24 movie, so I wouldn't say personally that their marketing campaign for strategy, whatever, is a failure. Like, I learned about Hereditary and Midsummer and Uncut Gems and all that. I just, I, I can't remember exactly how, but I just found out about them. And maybe it's not in, like, a mainstream way where I saw it in, like, before some, you know, in the theater, before some big Marvel movie was screened on the on the big screen. But, like, you know, I would just find it on YouTube somehow. I, I don't know. I, just, I don't think they're mismarketed or, or anything. I don't think their marketing campaign is bad necessarily, but I guess it may be lacking in some regards. I don't know. Um, out of curiosity, you said you hated the Green Knight. I thought you always felt kind of eh on it, like that was your feelings. Me? Yeah. I I like like I seriously think the only parts that I. When I, I, I wouldn't have said that while I was watching it because I would be waiting for the like waiting for things to happen and be, you know, thing. Maybe I totally misread everything in that movie, but I, I legit don't think I did. But yeah, apart from 
like I wouldn't watch it again. I just I don't think I would I, either. I, um, but I don't know that I like, feel that strongly about the film. If you know what I mean, like I'm kind of just like it was. Yeah, maybe I'm being a little hyperbolic, but I I really dislike it. I think for wasting a lot of potential and what could have been a really cool story. And I really like Arthurian stuff and fantasy stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I I so it just really uh, I really just do not at all like uh, really don't like it. That's for sure. Fair enough. Uh, Yu Yu Hakusho is wildly known for having a better dub than sub. Cowboy Bebop is in a similar boat. Dubs can be good, if not better, when made with love. Yeah, oh, I'm sure that's Yu the case. Yu Yu Hakusho. Um, that's the thing. I would. My general advice is opt for whichever one is the superior, gives you the superior audio, I guess, right? Like, that's just, yeah, that's what you want. You want good delivery. Um, yeah, well, it's it's easy to imagine like the the dubs being relatively fucked because it's like it's done in a booth where none of the other actors are present. Probably, like they're just alone in a booth. It's not the same environment, so the acoustics are different. And there's also the proximity to the microphone. Like if they're too close or too far away from the microphone they're speaking into, that can really throw off the sound. Like, where it doesn't sound like the voices are coming out of that environment that you're seeing on the film, you know what I mean? So, uh, I've always opt for, like, the in-camera version. Like, whatever was done by the actors in the scene, that's the, that's the version I want to listen to. Yeah, exactly. same. Um, especially if I have no way of, like, being told what the superior version, quote-unquote, is by anybody or a community around it. If it's just a shot in the dark, I'll go with the whatever the original track is. Yes. Um, we all know that Kimber is proof that Dubs are superior. Oh, do you remember <laughs> those clips? They're fucking great. Yeah. Um, Destiny on EFAP? I'm soy pogging right now. Oh, no. Hope you're okay. <laughs> soy pogging. Mm hmm. What a, what what a, a fate. terrible phrase. Sounds kind of gross. Yeah, it does sound kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> soy pogging yeah that's like like a vegan getting pegged by a <laughs> albino bald lady i don't know like something really out of uh, soy po pogging yeah. hey y'all i just graduated high school and want to give you some of my money oh that's very nice oh Here, thank you congratulations on graduating high school yeah uh, the random language switch-up you're referring to is called code switching. Is it? Oh, there you go. In linguistics, code, code switching, switching or language alternation occurs when a speaker alternates between two or more languages or language varieties in the context of a single conversation. Okay. I mean, switching languages or code switching, it seems like you may as well just say switching languages because it's like it's much more intuitive for anybody who doesn't know what code switching is and it's about the same you know real estate in words we had yeah. to oh, uh, i know bef before efap started uh and it was you know Mahler wolf and i uh we had to really train Mahler because Mahler would do this all the time Mm -hmm. He would code switch between English and Welsh. Yeah. And it was really distracting. And we missed out on like half of the stuff he was trying to say. So we really had to train him. We took him to, you know, oratory boot camp and we had to really, you know, <laughs> really train him up. And so now he sounds how he does today. But boy, man, back some of those words slip in was, here and there. Oh, you got to <laughs> shoot him down whenever you spot him. Yeah, it was uh, it was something else. Mm -hmm. But days are behind him He's yeah really... hopefully 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 we he might slip back into it uh look up marlon vera co frankie edgar on google images man got turned into mo from simpsons what you just copy paste it so i cannot type in all that out uh okay Unless you can't, in which case read it. Well, I, uh, apparently, he's a UFC guy, so now I'm worried that what they what they're referring to is that he got. Well, I, I'll look up if you wanna. I'll. Oh shit! Images. Oh my god. Yeah, there's no need to put that on screen. That's unfortunate. Oh damn! Yeah, look at that. He got a. Uh... Yeah, that 
Because it's, yeah, it's like a kick from below that came up, and it. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's it's like your mouth. There's no, there's not much of a chin left, if you know what I mean. Your mouth is like the bottom of your face I, now. Yeah, I think his face just went up really quick, so his skin is catching up with the, you know, the skeleton, and it just looked because you could tell by the ears, right? You could tell by the ear that it's like the head is moving upwards, right? Yeah. Uh, and maybe he just has loose skin after years and years of being punched in the face. So he but just... Yeah, hopefully... Uh, I can't tell from these images, but hopefully there's no permanent damage. Hopefully he's all right. Yeah, like, I I, I hope he's fine and he's okay, because, you know, that's... Ouch. That's quite a blow. That that freeze frame is... That's... Uh, mm. uh, also, glad you're reviewing this masterpiece. Oh, well. We were happy to do so. Um... Where are we? Just watched Stranger Things season four. Wait, is it all out? No, it's part of well, it's out. From what I they're understand. doing the two-parter thing that so oh, many okay. other shows are doing now. Uh, enjoyed it, but there were a lot of problems. Overall, better than season three, at least. It's a solid four. Fair <gasps> enough. Everything, everywhere, all at once is a solid four. No, Strange Things. Oh, okay. out of ten. Okay. Yeah, that's oh, what they're saying. <laughs> four out of four. Four out of four. Four out of four. I want to know what they constitute a ten out of ten. If they um, so wait, is Stranger Things because I I've never seen the show is a four out of ten? Is that highballing well, it for that? Or I was gonna say we don't discuss all of our takes with John, so maybe maybe we have all kinds oh. of disagreements to be had. But season one I think is pretty good. Season two I thought was awful. Season three was a complete disaster. So season four being a four out of ten is, if anything, a compliment to how it's been going as far as I'm concerned. Uh -huh. But Sorry, I should clarify. I thought they were saying everything everywhere all at once was a four out of ten. Oh. So I misheard. So Stranger Things, yeah, I uh, I'm not that blown away by it. I think it's I th I feel like I get the feeling they're writing it as they like they're making it up as they go along. Oh yeah, definitely. So I don't really have faith in them concluding it in a satisfying way, but I'm curious enough to check it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, time to check EFAP. Quite late, but I'm sure I didn't miss anything important. Wait, what? Destiny? What? How? Well, I mean, you know, he likes this movie, so I asked if he wanted to chat about it. He's been begging us for decades to come <laughs> on to EFAP. Men is the most disgusting, pretentious, and insulting movie I've ever had the displeasure of seeing. An affront to the viewer's intelligence and perverse imagery only to convey men, am I right? I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it. And I have no what? idea what, what this thing's about. Uh, it's called Men. Men? Never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the new Alex Garland movie. So that's, that's all I got. Um, not hearing good things about it so far. I don't have. I found much... the the trailer so funny. You know, it's like I mean, Men it was, is. I the was intrigued by this it. movie. Like, what? <laughs> uh, but I don't. Yeah, I don't know what you actually get by getting it. You know. Yeah. Um. All right. Baggins of the day, Falco Chubb Baggins. Falco <laughs> Chubb Baggins. What a what That a sounds legend. like a man who has a short but thick penis. Yeah, yeah, I could see how. And gyrate see particularly quickly. It's Falco Chubb I almost said Falco Chubb penis. Falco Chubb Baggins. <laughs> Let's see. Falco Chubb Baggins on the Tolkien Gateway. He was the son of Bilbo Baggins' uncle, Bingo Baggins, and Chica Chubb. <laughs> he lived a long life, reaching the age of 96, but not quite long enough to attend his cousin's farewell party, which was held two years after his death. He was survived by a daughter, Poppy. Uh, five, let's see, in, oh, in The Hobbit 2003 video game, Five portraits are clustered on a wall in Bag End. One of them is Falco, and one of Bilbo's lines when looking at the portraits is, Ah, Cousin Falco! All right. Oh, my God. P.S. It wouldn't let me send that super chat if I had spelt it uh, without the M-E-N normally. So you couldn't send it with the word men in it? Weird. Really? They said, "What the fuck, YouTube?" I, 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 I 
I got nothing. <laughs> I think someone else has sent a super chat with the word men in it. Maybe it's about the word surrounding it? I don't know. Men. I'll never understand YouTube's uh, limits. Men of Borton. Um, yeah, I was afraid Destiny would ruin this conversation and use it to state how smart he is. Top 1% reader is relevant to subtitles distracting from seeing how. Um, I... I think that I think he's totally fair to have that perspective. I totally understand where he's coming from. I don't have a problem with it, but I, it's not unreasonable that someone feels that way at all. Yeah, because the first assumption, this is why they had the whole conversation, because the, the first assumption that everyone would make is like, damn, how long does it take you to read? And he's arguing, I think, any time spent not staring at the screen is time spent missing things on the screen, no matter how quick mm. you are. But like, seriously, I... I don't know how else to explain it. It's not something everybody has, obviously, that's fine. But I would say, um, sometimes I'm watching a foreign language movie and I forget that I'm watching a foreign language movie because I'm so immersed in reading the subtitles so quickly while also taking in everything, if you know what I mean. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing his input. Like, I, I don't yeah, usually yeah. hear media takes from him, so it was interesting to hear that. I can't wait to hear his media takes. I want to know which one is his favorite. <laughs> I can read incredibly quick. A lot of people can absorb those sentences, like single sentences, pretty fast. I, I don't think he's got a, tr a trouble on that. He's just saying that it draws you away from other stuff he could be looking at more thoroughly, I guess. Mm, and, yeah. and, you know, I wouldn't deny the fact that you could misread a sentence and read it again, and then your eyes are taken away for a little bit longer, and it's like, oh no. <sighs> mm. uh, Destiny's 100% right about subs. They are atrocious. Alright, you're taking it too far. Atrocious. No. Evil. As an alternative to dubs, I wouldn't describe them as atrocious. I mean, I think it's the better option. Dude, if you have a bad dub, like, uh, subs yeah. are a hero, you know? Yeah. There can be some good dubs. I guess it's important to say, but usually no. No. Um, as someone who is forced to either watch movies dubbed or subbed in cinema, I despise subtitles. They not only always distract you, but when you're watching a darker movie like the Batman, white bright subs can outright be painful. Oh well, yeah, oh, that yeah. that I don't even yeah, disagree with that. That's yeah, just yeah. yeah. That can that just needs to be. It's like the the Austin Powers joke where the subtitles blend into the background. Yeah, that happens <laughs> yeah. every once in a while. Where it does. They're just yeah. Like, Fuck it. Just slap what's the subtitles um, everywhere, regardless of what's behind them. Fuck. What was the latest thing that did that? Because that's something that happened. Oh, it was something. Black yeah. Widow. What? It was Black Widow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it's yes. only a multi gajillion dollar Marvel film. It's fine. Fucking white subtitles. All white subtitles in the middle of this fucking snow scene. And it's like, why would. You, why? <laughs> like, like, unironically, you couldn't read what was. Being some said. of the sentences you couldn't make them out as easily, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's yeah, the yeah. classic example in Suicide Squad where they have black text on a black background temporarily. I think yeah, it runs yeah. past it. It's just funny. And uh, that that's the kind of thing where, especially when we're talking about screen space and theaters, where um, it because I have monitors that you know my my monitors are twenty seven inches, and I don't think I'll ever go bigger than that, just because it's too much physical space for my eyes to keep track of without having yep. to start moving around to the point where I just can't, I, I just don't want to do it anymore. So I just I just don't think I'll ever get a monitor bigger than twenty seven inches. Uh, I yep. just don't want more. Yeah, I don't want more space. In my country, we also have cheap dubbing in which one person reads all the lines and you can hear original sound in the background. Oh, joy. That's even a thing? Ugh. Like, one person voicing every character. That sounds like fun. I suppose, yeah, is good. that better than having nothing else? I don't even know. I guess so. I guess maybe for people who can't read... <laughs> And if I heard correctly, they're also doing the Foley, like all the sound effects. <laughs> oh, I think they were saying you have the original soundtrack for, like, the literal soundtrack is in the, the track for all sounds in the background, and then you have them on top of it speaking. Oh, right. So oh. It just sounds like painfulness. Oh. <laughs> You'd have to balance... Yeah, I... Mm-hmm. Mm. It just sounds pain. like it's just... Uh... Uh, in discussion, subtitles or dubbing, there is a third way. Lector. In Poland, most movies have original voices with Lector translating, so you can enjoy acting and understanding everything. I... I... It sounds like the last thing. What's Lector translating, like... though? I don't know. Uh, let's see. Lector translate. 
Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know, because Elector is just a speaker. Uh, so I... Oh. I thought maybe it referred to some kind of style, or... Well, I, I'm thinking if, if... Like, maybe it is. Maybe that's what the previous Super Chat was saying, where someone essentially voices over the words, but you can kind of still hear the actor in the background. I don't know. It's definitely suppose, not how I would want to. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I can see what you say, but, like, damn, that sounds like a clash, Why, doesn't it? You know? Yeah. You get the worst of all worlds. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I've got the words from the English, so I understand what they're saying, and then I get the emotion from them to get that impactful thing. But it's like, yeah, but at the same time, like, I don't know. Uh, but maybe there's something more to that, because I just tried to Google and it didn't seem to come up with anything in specific, so I'm not sure. In the Netherlands, we subtitle everything. Can be funny, Klingons translates as sticky people, but very annoying in cinema with 3D glasses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sticky, sticky people. <laughs> oh, fair enough. You know what the worst insult is in Klingon? What's that? Your mother has a smooth forehead. Damn. I'm going to have to cut that out for the final. Uh, does Destiny have ADHD? Um, I mean, I, I, I think he might have said that it's a possibility, but uh, I don't think that's why he has his position on subtitles. Uh, you know, he, he gave his arguments. Oh. Yeah, like, I totally understand where he's coming from. It's not, un, it's not unreasonable. I get it. I, you know, I'm not like that, but I, I get it. I'm so proud of... Destiny for coming out as part-time dyslexic. Literature is overrated. Burn the libraries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I reckon we should keep them. Let's keep the libraries, though. It's, it's yeah, fun. why not? Hey, you can't spell libraries without lie. Oh. Libraries, where they keep the lies. The lies. Yeah. It's a whole brary full of lies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we live in a world where Winnie the Pooh is getting a horror movie. Everything went to crap when Harambe died. Oh No, fuck it. Winnie the Pooh horror movie. Give it to me I was going to say, that sounds like it could Inject be funny. Inject it into my veins. Why not? Because that's in public domain, isn't it? So public you can do whatever domain. you want. That's why That's, that's why right. movie's happening. Fuck I'm surprised yeah. Disney let that happen. Because my wow. understanding can't was do anything that about Disney it, right? would constantly recycle their properties yeah, so that they uh, exceed the statute of limitations, right? I think it's the, too well, old. So now. you can, the idea would be that like any, any of the films or stories that they made, you know, like in the last 20, 30, 40, however many years stretching back, those are protected by copyright. But like Winnie the Pooh, the character is public domain. There's nothing you can do about that. And eventually Mickey Mouse will be public domain. Eventually. Do you, um, you don't have to know when a lot, but... Winnie the Pooh was created, do you? Uh, I don't know. I can. I'm just curious how old he is. Actually, what I mean, I guess he's older than Mickey Mouse. Then, or well, is he? I don't know. I realize that the way it's supposed to go is that after seventy or so years, something enters the public domain. But like, I, the... I understood that Disney had a way of circumventing that, where they would not just forever keep their properties in perpetuity. It won't be forever. Um, even Mickey Mouse will eventually become public domain, but yeah. they pushed it back a lot. Uh, Winnie the Pooh was created in 1924 as Edward Bear, and then he was Winnie the Pooh in 1926. Wow. Um, and it would be because of uh, the, the author who made it, right? It wouldn't be because of Disney. I think because uh, like yeah, it's I, I yeah, know. it says Disney licensed film rights from the estate of A.A. Uh, a. Milne um, in like 1961 using the unhyphenated name Winnie the Pooh because his is actually hyphenated. Um, so, yeah, I don't know all of that. I just know it's something to do with um, public domain. Oh. Well, I'm yeah, glad they well, go into public domain eventually. That's cool. Yeah, yeah and, and like I said, forever. what if this horror movie hit Winnie the Pooh thing is, like, amazing? I know it won't be, but still, what if it is? <laughs> it sounds pretty funny. It I'll does. See it. Um, People in chat are pointing out, it depends on which country you're in, how long it is. America's got different ones than Australia, than the UK. Hmm. It varies. It's usually some amount of time after the, the creator has died. Um, but sometimes it can just be a fixed number of years, regardless of uh, when the creator dies. Yeah, well, I thought it was a fixed amount of 70-something years, like about like the duration of somebody's lifetime, like on average. I don't know. 
Uh, I like subs, but I feel like you can miss facial expressions or other small details. It's a little bit different from being able to just watch their face. Like, sure. Um, I just, I would then appeal to the format that you miss stuff all the time when you're watching a movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, the time spent reading the subtitle, for me it's like fractions of a second sometimes. I, I don't know. Um... um. I d Sorry, this is on the- because uh, I found it on Wikipedia. Um, the US copyright of Winnie the Pooh ended in 2021. It was 95 years after the publication of the first story. Uh, it's public domain in America. Disney no longer hold exclusive rights in the United States. Um, and the UK copyright will expire at the end of 2026, 20 70 years after Milne's death. Okay. So, it's expired in America, but it's not expired yet in, in the, uh, the UK. I love that this is just like the first thing you do with a public domain property. It's like, like horror. Winnie the Pooh. Okay. Crazy, yeah. Horror Winnie the Pooh. Well, dude, Eldritch like, Winnie uh, the Pooh does sound kind of funny. I, don't know. <laughs> I would have expected <laughs> like the meme. day of Winnie the Pooh and Fortnite. You know that YouTuber Meat Canyon that just takes yeah. Yeah. beloved yeah. childhood things <laughs> and turns it into nightmare fuel? Like, it reminds me of that. Uh, whomever brought up Lecter voiceover thing and thinks that's a valid alternative to subs or dubs, you are fucking wrong. Oh my. Oh, that was in a super chat as well. Alright, well, I don't know anything about this Lecter thing, but if it is si as simple as just you record your voice over the the thing, which I, I'm starting to trigger my memories. I'm pretty sure I've seen movies like that, like really old ones, where that was an approach. It's not what I like, alright? Not what I like. Today's animal of the day is the spitting cobra. Oh well. Wow. Spitting cobra. Look at that, he spits. Yeah, these boys. Look at these spitty boys. Look at that. He spits fucking venom. So wait, is Is it like t contact with your skin is enough for that to just do its job then, I guess? Um Presumably. I assume. Yeah, I assume it's a bit. Cuz it looks like it's coming out of his uh I guess the, it's just like two shoots. Fangs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well. I'm glad I don't live in a place where snakes can squirt venom onto me. Yes, I agree. I was, you know, it's about. I was about thinking just the other day. You know what? You know what snakes need? Ranged weapons. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um. All right. Please read the Pokedex entries. For Sandigast and Palosand. Sandigast and Palosand. Sandigast. Let's go to... Are there any non-cursed Where... Pokemon descriptions at this point? <laughs> like, they're just all <laughs> horrible. It's probably just like Metapod. A good order. You're like, yeah. yeah all right, then. Palosand. Let me line these puppies up so I can read them both. I know the site to go to now that has all of the things. So... Sandy Gast. Uh, buh, buh, buh. Born from a sand mound, playfully built by a child, this Pokemon embodies the grudges of the departed. Oh. It, oh shit, it takes control of anyone who puts a hand in its mouth, and so it adds to the accumulation of its sand mound body. What? Wow, that's legitimately fun. So first off, here's a picture. Is it gonna be all wholesome and happy? No. Oh. Okay. If you... <laughs> Let's see. Jesus. Got a little shovel on its head. I bet that's organic. Yeah, Sandy Gast mainly inhabits beaches. It takes control of anyone who puts their hand into its mouth, forcing them to make its body bigger. So, why is this in Pokemon and not something Lovecraftian? It just seems to be where it belongs. And then we have Palosand. Which is what uh, the fucking last one evolves into. Sandy Gast evolves into. Here's right. a picture of him. Okay. <laughs> but, it's just a sandcastle, but that's fine. That's but cool. if you interpret that as a mouth and those bits as eyes, he's just like in pain or something. He doesn't seem like he's having a good existence. Let's put it that way. Oh my goodness. Buried beneath the castle are masses of dried up bones what? from those whose vitality it has drained. <laughs> they each really... of its grains it's from Ultra Sun. Each of its grains of sand has its own will, 
Palisand eats small Pokemon and siphons away their vital essence while they're still alive. That's nice. Oh my god, it, these other ones. Palisand is known as the Beach Nightmare. It pulls its prey down into the sand by controlling the sand itself, and then it sucks out their souls. Again, that's nice. <laughs> Man. I have a friend who's so up to date on all the Pokemon, like however many, like 800 there are now. Like I'm still stuck in the 90s. I only know the 151. Yeah, I know, know like originals. Beast That's it. Lapras. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lord Longbong of Muslington Abbey. Have you ever given any more thought to a Kong fab of Peter Jackson's Long Kong? When there's less going on, it'd be a movie fab for the ages. Yes, how well Wagsies scritches for the good boy. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. I think we're going to give that a shot at some point. Sometime soon, probably, maybe. Who knows? Make it part of an arc. It'd be great. Imagine your kid sticks its hand just haphazardly, or haphazardly, sorry, haphazardly into a, 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 a sandy gast or a palace sand, right? And it gets, like, possessed and sucked in, so... You know, and you, you, you can't stick your hands in to save it, because if you do, it'll... Then you'll get... You know, like stuck in your you'll, you'll get you'll you'll get your soul sucked out of you. Me, you gotta. I don't know. Find an alternative thing before it sucks out your child's soul. Pretty much, yeah. That's the goal. Shit's fucked up. Uh, factor where you keep your wallet. If it's in your front pocket, coins won't matter. But if it's in the back, lumpy wallets are annoying to sit on. Yeah, that's why you never put why? your wallet in your back. I just ever. don't put it in my back pocket ever, yeah. You can't win this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this says, A pear character stretching his arm forward, raising his thumb up. Thank you very nice. much. Hi, enjoying all your critiques? Does EFAP review documentaries? Lauren Southern American Mirage documentaries, pretty good and informative. Give it an eyeball gaze if you can. I doubt we're gonna. No, I don't think review. we will. I just don't really don't have. I just don't have any interest in. Well, uh, that. look, we'll do Kenobi. That's like a documentary. We'll, we'll, we'll watch Kenobi. Yeah, we'll go to Tatooine. Yay! Again, and we'll watch whatever. We'll watch Jake Kenobi do his thing. <laughs> EFAT needs to get political. Okay, no. it's about time. No. The time is now. Uh, watch Rush Hour. Funny. Watch it also. Hi, Raiden. I guess, is that Rags? Raiden is close enough, Maybe. I guess. I don't know. Raiden? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because that's, but, um, yeah, Raiden's like a video game character. He's from Mortal Kombat, right? Mm-hmm. Right, guess, Raiden. Yeah. yeah, that one. Uh, yeah, and Rush Hour is, I remember liking Rush Hour a whole bunch. Uh, yeah, I like it. Oh, I should have thought of this yep. sooner. Hassan is the type of guy who would exchange chocolate coins for a single chocolate coin of greater value. Well, nah. that could work. What if you had three thin chocolate coins and you, and you exchanged it for one big thick one? Maybe. Yeah, if you had a chocolate out. dime, mm. then you would want to exchange it for a chocolate penny. Like a or whole chocolate. bunch of chocolate quarters versus the chocolate dollar. It's like, well, I guess I need to see it to know which one's more valuable, right? Yeah, because the dollar could be really, like, thin. Hmm. Or thick, it depends. Um, Destiny, why is your chat so insanely retarded? Oh, no. Hey, look. Uh, they're, they're from Twitch, or at least they were from Twitch. You gotta give them space, alright? You need time. Did they say the R word uncensored? Probably. Probably. My god. Um, I haven't seen this movie yet. Definitely need to. Ciao. Yeah. I mean, I guess I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but I probably would recommend you go watch the movie before I'll break down. Um, because it's, yeah. Yeah, it's something to experience, you know? Hey, Vringy, I remember you talking about All Star Superman. What are your thoughts and do you recommend it? I haven't read it yet, but I will. All right. All Star Superman? What yeah, it's like that? one of the often recommended um, stories, like of Superman. So oh, like an extended, like comic book thing, extended universe. Yeah, yeah, thing? like a, a paperback. Oh, okay. Uh, Ali scene in Celebrity Versus shot like The Mood for Love, a movie about heartbreak. 
Yeah, the um the slow sort of phasing motions, if you guys remember at certain points in the background people were moving as though they were in like a blurry slow motion. Uh they do that a bunch in the mood for love. And then the Marshall Club self-taught YouTubers did the choreography and appear as the butt plug guys. Oh, that's cool. Good for them. <laughs> Gus. Dude, I, I love when movies do in camera effects, like they manipulate the, the shutter speed and the frame rate and stuff in creative ways. And they actually are thoughtful about the lenses that they use, yeah. depending on what shot they're trying to film. Like the, the wrong way of getting carried away with that is like the fucking what's his name Zack Snyder with Justice League he used those retarded uh, lenses on Army of the Dead for you oh dear ridiculously <laughs> shallow How depth dare of you he's I obviously he just, just smothered Vaseline on the lens and started filming yeah <laughs> yeah took um, some chapstick and just rubbed around the edges Gus Fringy crossover episode when I don't know if that's ever happening. <laughs> what, whether or not we'll get Giancarlo Esposito onto yeah. the stream? I, I mean, I'll, I'll email him. Um, <laughs> hey, buddy. You come it'll on? happen. It's mm -hmm. only a matter of time. Also, hi, Destiny. Also, hi, Rex. Hello. I'm catching up on the stream, but seeing as all you, you all like the movie, I once again highly recommend Doom Patrol. Similar wackiness, similar hard hitting themes, similar character based storytelling, similar marketing. Well, fair enough. I usually hear good things about Doom Patrol. I tend to hear good things. You know what else is everything everywhere all at once? Grandma after a night with rags. Oh. Oh my goodness, that's not true <laughs> at all. No. That's a lie. Uh, Ringy, we require more of your opinions on Ken. Oh, this sucks. B. Oh, uh, I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. Me neither. Uh, also, I'll be right back. Getty's Lou. Mm -hmm. Ooh, moment. Hey, but they said they love your streams. Ah, uh, thanks. Yeah, don't worry. You're getting First your Kenobi coverage. Right now. Yeah, yeah. We, we haven't actually seen them yet, so you guys gotta wait, alright? Alright? Adored this movie. Can't make it for the stream, but I'm really glad you're giving it recognition. Much love, everyone. Yeah, well, thank you. And, uh, I, I yeah, I, I think the movie's awesome. I'm glad to give it some appreciation. Uh, everyone from ER to Joseph Anderson to Vorsch say that Outer Wild is a masterpiece. The writing and impact are on par with Soma, and the other parts of the game are even better. It's easily among the best games ever. Not playing it is Hassan levels of intelligence. Oh. <laughs> okay, that's the way to put it. <laughs> uh, the DLC is also an unofficial Halo crossover. Play it, Schlorms. I will. I will play it. I will do it at some point. Mm. We'll do it. Uh, would you say that this movie is contrivance proof given that every contrivance is just a statistical probability um, I wouldn't justify all of it that way like so the example of someone being like oh how convenient that there's a universe where she knows kung fu and she can draw from it it'd be like well no there's gonna be a universe where she knows kung fu that she can draw from however Something like him grabbing the sign and putting it under his back so he doesn't get his back broken. I'd be like, yeah, that was that was pretty convenient. Because if she'd lifted him up in any other part of the room, uh, he might not have been able to reach for something that could have rescued his back from that. That's just a standard good old-fashioned uh, convenience. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put those both in the same category, if that makes sense. Um... Video game controller jumps up and down excitedly. Oh, it's cute little little sentient controller. Fun. Um, the channel I finished a video game did a five-hour breakdown of every Lord of the Rings video game ever made. He'd make a good EFAB guest for any video game chats. Yeah, fair enough. That'd be interesting to look at. Wonder if it includes all the uh, the ones we. Well, I've ended up playing on uh, good old Super Chat catch up. The new. Uh, Fringy, you may want to look into the popularity of certain letters and names. For example, K used to be popular for a while, but in recent years it's been declining, likely due to corporate prevalence. Interesting. Hmm. Didn't know that. Um, fact, Jerry. In the Two Mouseketeers episode from 1952, Tom Good... Tom Good decapitated? Tom got decapitated. 
Because Jerry and that gray little shit did not leave the dinner table alone. Oh, there's a lot of anger toward Jerry, I see. I can understand that. I, I'm not I'm not saying it's impossible. Just... You know, Tom does some stuff. That's, that's kind of rude, right? Yeah. Sounds so convinced. <laughs> <laughs> Rewatched again last night, and it really is a movie that rewards return viewing. Love how creative and original it is while fitting everything together so well with a core story and theme. Definitely good rat. Hi, Rags. He would, he would say hi, he's just away for a moment. Uh, shut up, Fed, you don't matter. Taxation is theft. And then punches Deirdre. But then look what happens. It all gets worse. Uh, Mola, thank you for all you do. Your content inspired me to embrace my call to writing. Hey. The things you've done helped me get through deployments in Afghanistan, in closing, is an EFAP on The Last Kingdom possible? Um, is The Last Kingdom that Matt Damon movie? Uh, I don't know. Oh wait, it's like a show. A series, 2015 to 22. Uh, I am You're not. thinking of The Last Duel, right? Uh, well, I, I, they said The Last Kingdom, and The Last Kingdom seems to be a TV show. Um, oh. It was five yeah. seasons long? I don't know. I don't think I've even heard of this. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I've, I've not seen it, and I have no uh, likelihood of seeing it right now, I guess. So, possibly not. But hey, it's good to hear that um, our, uh, our stuff can, can help you out in whatever it is you're up to. And hell yeah, embrace your call to writing. Get some stories going, my dude. Do it. Um, not by killing what we hate, but saving what we love. Ryan Johnson was the blueprint. Get wrecked, Snyderoids. Also, high rags again. Movie is cool. Movie is cool. Uh, glad to hear what an EFAP episode is like when y'all like and enjoy a movie for a change. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah. We, well, we've had a couple of these. Uh, yep. They've existed in the past. We've done, we've done positive coverage, haven't we, rags? This happened before. Hello. Um, you, what have we done before? I just got <laughs> I'll, just, uh, just let me know. <laughs> uh, I'll just read out the two that were missed. Hi, Rags. Hi. And hi, Rags again. Hello. Oh, hi there. Um, but yeah, if you if you wanted more positive coverage from us, we did the three long streams on Arcane. We we liked that show quite a bit. Um, I think there's some other ones in there too. You'll you'll find them. Uh, I know next to nothing about Everything Everywhere All at Once, and I'm glad you guys recommended watching it. Oh yeah, all of you should go check it out. It might be something you love, might not, but hey, worth the gamble. Uh, if you bring yourselves to cover She-Hulk, that might be a great opportunity to invite Rakita Law on. He'd be a fun guest, and he's open to coming on. Glad you covered this movie, it's great. Hi, Fringy. Hey. That could work. The only problem is it requires us to watch it. Which is, you know, that's an obstacle. Because if there, I, I gotta say, I gotta doubt there's gonna be anything worthwhile to talk about in terms of law in that film, uh, show. I wonder even how much time they'll even spend in a courtroom, like, at any time. I don't know, but, um, definitely gonna, oh yeah, we did a Train to Busan EFAP, that was pretty positive. Attorney at Law is, like, part of the title, right? So I guess that's yeah. a major, like, function of the show is, like, she's in a courtroom. Presumably, like a quarter Harvey of the time, at Bird least. Man. Um. Yeah. We'll we'll see. We'll get him on for something at some point. Anyway, it's um, it's happening. It's gonna happen. Why didn't Mister Boss point a gun at Jobu and end it? Mister Boss. Who that? Don't know. Are you talking about Gong Gong? Because um. The thing is, guns don't really work on Jobu. They don't seem to work because they've basically got godlike powers. Yeah. Um, he points guns at uh, Joy, because if he kills the Joys in the universe, then Jobu can't access the universe through that Joy. I think that's how that works, if that's the question or anything. Um, now that you've finished Everything Everywhere all at once, watch Death of Dick Long, you massive. The script is hot fuzz, tight and funny. Daniel Scheinart is good tism. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever heard of this. Death of Dick Long? Is you guys heard of that? Erectile dysfunction? No. Oh no. Drama crime movie from twenty nineteen. 
I have not heard of it. Neither have I. I don't think I recognize any of the actors in it either. Well, uh, maybe, maybe at some point. Uh, cool to see you Dumbo's watched and liked everything everywhere all at once. Haven't seen this episode yet, but I've never expected Destiny to be on, probably for an hour. Play DDLC. Well, he came on for four hours, I think. Which, um... Good on him. You know, it's still quite a lot of time for the normal person, you know? Like, uh, you know, we can't appreciate John for doing it anymore. He's just not normal. He's weird. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's hard for normal people to do that. True. Yep. <laughs> Um, the hell is the point of a back pocket if not for a wallet? What the fuck, man? Well, I mean, first of all, you don't have to use your back pockets. Nobody's forcing you. <laughs> Secondly, um, what do I store in my back pockets? Probably just notes or anything thin and papery if, uh, if I have that. But even then, I've never been that comfortable putting stuff in my back pockets. Always front pockets. I seldom, yeah, seldom putting anything in my back pocket. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with that, that's the end of the super chats, which is which well, is, alrighty, oh boy. Essentially, the end of the stream. So thank you all so very, very much for joining us. Now, absolutely, I must, I must reveal what's happening over the next few weeks. Okay. Oh, God, so don't panic, Evap. But you're not don't gonna catch panic. us live together for about. Two weeks, I think, from now. What? One, two, maybe, oh no, three weeks. Damn. Yeah, so three weeks. However, wow. you will catch plenty of stuff regarding us in that timeline. For example, I did mention it at some point, maybe the last stream, but we've got a whole EFAB ready to go. It's been recorded. It was fun. We had guests, and that's going to premiere next Saturday on Moolah as the replacement EFAB. Because myself and Fringly Dingles have real life things that are getting in the way of something for now. The following week will likely, I'm pretty sure this is the case, will likely be a meme fap that we'll be re hopefully recording on Wednesday. And then that'll come out the following week, like I said. And then the week after that, we shall be back in whatever capacity it may be. Um, funnily enough, by the time we hit that, how many episodes of Kenobi will be done by then? As in, like, out? Is that... Four? Uh, like four, I think. Yeah. There's only six, right? Yes. Right. Well, uh, obviously, we are, we are watching the Kenobi episodes tomorrow. They're being recorded, and then uh, they shall be worked on. But they're not going to be like the Boba Fett episodes. These things are long, so they will come out as soon as they're completed, as opposed to, um, you know, like just expeditiously at all costs or anything. Um, but we're looking forward to, to getting that out to you folks. And, um,. Yeah, that's that's about that. You'll be getting uh, one catch up per week as well. Just they'll just be coming out whether or not because we're actually caught up again. We are we are legit. Like that that's 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 how it's happening now. It's amazing, and I'm sure we'll keep this so up exciting. right up until the Definitely. anniversary stream, and then it'll fall apart again. Yep. It'll be great. Mm -hmm. Um, nice. Good night, you massives. My PC died sadly. Oh no, well, that's not good. Get it repaired. Yeah, get a new one. Replace it. Mola recorded his Iron Man 3 Unbridled Praise? No. Oh, no, 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 no. It was funny, I was on a stream, uh, it was real BBC, and there was this, like, sort of vague sentiment of, you know what, Iron Man 3? Pretty great compared to what we, uh, what we get now. And I was just like, mm, mm. And then, like, there was another, was like, yeah, you know, there was this scene, there was this scene, and there was uh, a guest called uh, Clifton Duncan who was there, and he was, he was just like, mm, no, I hate Iron Man 3. I fucking hate that movie. And I was like, yes! <laughs> like, yes, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, not even in the face of Phase 4 do you get complimented. Uh, you disgusting, culturally different freaks. Anyway, love you. Bola heart. Also, check out if you can add more emotes to YouTube chat, just in case. You know what? I shall. That's something that I've been in, been intending to, to sort out, but uh, also drunk EFAP when? Probably when a bunch of things are sorted out IRL on both myself and Fringy's sides, we will be able to do some more gaming ones, because we've got done the catching up, and we're hoping to get some meme faps done, and so it'll leave us with EFAP movie recordings and maybe EFAP gaming streams, of which we'll likely invite you, John, if you wish to come. Oh, for sure, man. We I really appreciate you having me on for this. I mean, oh, I know I kind yeah. of uh, suck and like formulating <laughs> my ideas sometimes, and like there's a million other people who are very much more well versed in like film criticism that you could have on. But I appreciate you having me on for a film like this, and thank you, Chat, for for indulging me. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, we always appreciate you coming on, man, giving us your time. Those that that was mm-hmm. eight hours of your day we just stole from you. Snatched Abs- it up. Absolutely. Happy to do it. This is great. So yeah, that is the schedule for what you can expect coming soon. This is all, this will obviously be up on Moolah tomorrow. And um, yeah, everything else all follows. I'm working on stuff. I assume Fringy Rags, you're both working on stuff. Is there anything else you guys uh-huh. want to say working, about working. regarding those things? No. no. Well, in that case, uh, John, do you want to? Do you want? Is there anything you want to say that may have changed since last week about places people can find you? And what work you 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 diddly doing? Sure, man. Thank you. Uh, I I'm John Graham on YouTube, and uh, I make uh, Master Chief sucks a Halo and R B and the Chief, and I got a new Master Chief sucks a Halo coming out. I think I'm going to premiere it tomorrow. Actually, I got uh, Master Chief sucks a Halo Infinite Part One and Two. One part one is the multiplayer. Part two is the campaign, and I'm gonna make a day of it tomorrow and and premiere both of them publicly back to back, like probably ten fifteen minutes apart from one another. So, yeah, I guess you can tune in for that if you're interested. And yeah, oh Thank yeah. You. Um, do you? Uh, is there any kind of like? I don't know if you do. Do you do you do anything on Twitch, or have you not gone into it at all? No, I used to do the restream thing where I would broadcast to YouTube and Twitch at the same time, but uh, then I just did YouTube and then I just stopped because uh, I wasn't getting uh, any joy out of streaming <laughs> at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll pick it up again at some point, but uh, I'm just well, not feeling it at the moment. If ever you do, don't worry about um, asking for like if you want any guests or people to keep you company. We would. Well, I was going to mm-hmm. say we would happily do it, but I can't speak for the other two, but I would certainly. Well, Absolutely. I mean, I'll. Well, I guess. <laughs> well, I guess so. But yeah, uh, you know. I really you... appreciate you saying that. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That means a lot. For sure. Uh, we just gonna love you, massives. But for the love of God, update your Moolah playlist, lol. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna do it all in one big day planning thing soon. Not yet, but soon. Uh, also, John is literally the best guest. Hey, high praise. There you go. Oh my! Uh, thank you so much. Um, and on that note, that's about it. I don't know. Unless there's anything else you, any of you wanted to say about absolutely anything at all. I'm good. I got. I got. I think we got it all. Mm-hmm. Everything. Everywhere. Yeah. Um, what a oh, great way to, to end as well. Mola, you gray. It won't let me say it anymore. It won't let you say gay anymore. Oh. It's okay. That you can call me gray. gray. I'll accept very gray. gray. Um, very gray. Alrighty then. Yeah, thank you all so much for keeping us company. Thank you for the kind donations. And we will see you in one way or another soon enough. So, we'll see you there, I guess. Goodbye. See you later. And good night. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye.